Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yang berbahagia, Associate Professor Dr. Zambri bin Jamaluddin, Dean of Fakulti Kejuteraan Pembuatan, on behalf of Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and International, University Technical Malaysia, Melaka. Yang berusaha, Professor Dr. Esah binti Hamzah, Chairperson of IMMMLC 2019. Yang berusaha, Associate Professor Dr. Jariah binti Muhammad Joy, Chairperson of MLC 2019. Judges, respected guests, participants, university representative, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to thank everyone in this auditorium for allocating time, a part of your busy schedule to attend MLC 2019. My name is Mohamad Shahrizan bin Osman and on behalf of MLC 2019 committee, we would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. This year, we are pleased to have 20 participants from 20 different universities across Malaysia for taking part in the semi-final of the competition whereby top 5 will proceed to the final competition that will be held on 30th April 2019. Respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, in order to bless this ceremony, we would like to call upon Dr. Mama Eddie Rosie bin Abdul Manaf for the du'a recitation. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Kita mulakan dengan Al-Fatihah Al-Fatihah Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafi Ambiya wa al-Mursalim Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Dengan nama Allah yang maha pengasih lagi maha penyayang Segala puji hanya bagi Allah Tuhan sekalian alam Selawat dan salam atas Rasul Junjungan Nabi Muhammad SAW Ya Allah, pada hari yang penuh keberkatan ini Kami menadah tangan Sambil menafaskan kesyukuran atas segala nikmat Rahmat, inayat dan pertolongan Nikmat iman, nikmat kesejahteraan Nikmat keamanan dan kemakmuran Ya Allah, perbaikilah urusan dunia dan agama kami Bersih dan sucikanlah pekerjaan kami Berilah cahaya petunjukmu kepada hamba-hambamu di dunia ini Berilah kami ilham untuk mendapat jalanmu yang lurus Peliharalah kami daripada segala kejahatan dan keburukan Ya Allah, yang maha berkuasa, yang maha mulia, yang maha bijaksana Kami berdoa dan bermohon Bekakanlah hati kami dengan pancaran iman Sanubari kami dengan penuh yakin dan kepercayaan Fikiran kami dengan ilmu pengetahuan Jiwa dan rohani kami Patuh dan taat kepada Al-Quran Dan hadis Nabi akhir zaman Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Kami memohon agar engkau jadikanlah majlis ini Sebagai majlis yang engkau berkati dan redai Semoga melalui majlis ini Menjadi wadah yang dapat mengeratkan perpaduan antara kami dalam menghargai nikmat keamanan dan kemakmuran Demi agama dan negara yang kami cintai Ya Allah, kabulkanlah doa kami Ya Rabbal Alamin Thank you Dr. Edi Without further ado I would like to invite Yang Berusaha, Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Jaria Binti Muhammad Joy, Chairperson of MLC 2019 for the welcoming speech. Please welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Thank you, see. First of all, I would like to Welcome everyone to UTEM and to MLC Semifinal 2019. I hope everyone have had a great uh, trip and will have an enjoyable trip today, uh, exposure today. Okay, uh, on behalf of uh, UTEM, uh, I appreciate the honor uh, from uh, IMM in order for us to, uh, to run this uh, event for the 8th 
material lecture competition since it has been uh, initiated by IMM in 2012. Okay. So, uh, in Melaka, we always start a ceremony with a pantun. So, I have a one special pantun for you all. Kapal dagang dari seberang, sarat muatan, kayu jati. Dari jauh tuan-puan datang, kami di UTEM setia menanti. Okay, so uh, today uh, we almost uh, very excited to look upon the 20 presentation by all representatives from 20 universities, uh, IPTAs and IPTs in Malaysia. So uh, I wish everyone uh, all the very best to give your best presentation so that we can find uh, five finalists to the final competition which is going to be held in, 20, uh, in 30th April. So at the end, we will have the very best speaker to represent Malaysia in the Youth World, Co World Lecture Competition in London. And I also thank uh, the honor, uh, the invited, the acceptance of invitation for our uh, general judges, moderators from universities and industries to support us with this event. And also, I would also welcome all university representatives that giving a kind support and uh, to your students as well as to the event and also to parents. Uh, I welcome parents just now that supportive, very supportive from UNITEN, representative from UNITEN. Uh, from UNITEN. Uh, so we will have a very good event uh, today and at the end, I would like to appreciate the support that I received from our faculty, our dean, faculty of manufacturing engineering, our team members, uh, each everyone that have been able to support us and to make this success event and also to our sponsors, BKSH uh, Technology Sendirian Berhad, Taat Pistari Sendirian Berhad, HML Auto Industry Sendirian Berhad, and Zita Scientific Sendirian Berhad, and also Center for Graduate Studies, which is the building that we are in now. Last, I wish all the 20 young semi-finalists a very enjoyable and all the best for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for the speech. Now, we would like to invite Yang Berbahagia, Associate Professor Dr. Zambari bin Jamaluddin, Dean of Faculty Kejuteraan Pembuatan on behalf of Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International University Technical Malaysia, Melaka, for the officiation speech of MLC 2019. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and a very good morning uh, to all. Uh, <coughs> firstly, uh, thank you uh, Mr. Chairperson, uh, Honorable uh, Bagi Prof. Dr. Isha Binti Hamza, uh, Chairperson of IMM, MLC 2019, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Jaria uh, Binti Bamajoy, uh, Chairperson of MLC uh, 2019, uh, Respected Judges, if I could uh, pronounce uh, here, Professor Dr. Chee Usna, uh, Dr. Kwan Sing Hao, uh, Mr. Kang Kim Ang, and also uh, Mr. Saludin Adnan from MIEM. Uh, guests guest and also uh, our uh, participants uh, for this uh, morning uh, competition. Uh, on behalf of the uh, University Technica Malaysia Malaka, uh, I would like to uh, uh, extend uh, our gratitude and thanks to the Institute of uh, Materials Malaysia, MMM, for giving us the honor uh, to host this uh, material competition for the year 2019, uh, following uh, the host by the uh, University of Technology Malaysia uh, last year. So, uh, material lecture competition, MLC, is a yearly event organized by the Institute of Materials Malaysia and Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, uh, United Kingdom. And this year, for the first time, uh, the event is held in the World Heritage City of uh, Malacca. So welcome to Malacca, uh, to all the uh, uh, 
uh, to those who are from uh, outside of Malacca. So it's, uh, I hope you got the chance uh, to, uh, to spend some time uh, uh, venturing into uh, our historical city uh, after this event, of course. Uh, this national work competition is intended to, enha to enhance awareness among young material scientists and engineers in Malaysia on the importance of material engineering and sustainability in the advancement of technology and humankind. So it started as an idea by IMM to organize a competition uh, that provides a platform for, for material scientists and engineers in Malaysia uh, to communicate and share their knowledge on areas related to material engineering uh, to audience with diversified backgrounds. I believe uh, this competition will also provide an opportunity to young scientists and researchers to sharpen their communication skill. As you know that uh, nowadays, uh, aside from the uh, academic uh, backgrounds, uh, one of the most important things that uh, potential employers look at is uh, communication skills and uh, your general skill basically. So MLC 2019 is, uh, is, uh, needs a lot of hard work. So this is the uh, outcome of, uh, of uh, the hard work of our uh, committed uh, organizing committees. And for that, I would like to thank all the uh, organizing committees of, M of MLSC in 2019, chaired by PM Dr. Jaria. Uh, and also would, would like to congratulate uh, all the participants uh, for, uh, for your uh, presence uh, this morning. And uh, lastly, I would like to uh, extend uh, our gratitude and appreciation, uh, of course, uh, to IMM, IOM3, the sponsors, uh, uh, which are DKSH Technology, as uh, you uh, Tan Istaris in Yamrahat, HML02 in Dasuis in Yamrahat, and Zeta Scientific in Yamrahat. And without your commitment and your support, uh, uh, this event won't be a, a success. Thank you very much. And the judges, of course, uh, the university representative, and all the participants. Uh, all the best, all the participants. Uh, enjoy uh, the morning sessions uh, till, uh, till this evening, of course. Uh, and uh, have a very good competition. And uh, with that, uh, with the uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, I would like to appreciate and open uh, this uh, MLC competition 2019. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yang Babahia Doctor, for the speech. Sadly enough, we have now come to the end of our opening ceremony. But before we end, let us hope that this year's MLC will be successful and most remembered one. I now once again would like to invite Yang Babahia Associate Professor Dr. Zamri Benjalan Jamaluddin, followed by Yang Babahia Professor Dr. Esa Binti Hamza, together with Yang Babahia Associate Professor Dr. Jaria, respect the judges, participants, university representative, distinguished guests, and all organizing community members of MLC 2019 for the photo session followed with some refreshment. Please be informed that we will continue our first session of competition after the refreshment at 9.45 in this auditorium. Thank you very much. You may now adjourn. Assalamualaikum okay. But before we end, let us hope that this year's MLC will be successful and most remembered one. I now once again would like to invite Yang Babahia Associate Professor Dr. Zamri Benjalan Jamaluddin, followed by Yang Babahia Professor Dr. Esa Binti Hamza, together with Yang Babahia Associate Professor Dr. Jaria, respect the judges, participants, university representative, distinguished guests, and all organizing community members of MLC 2019 for the photo session followed with some refreshment. Please be informed that we will continue our first session of competition after the refreshment at 9.45 in this auditorium. Thank you very much. You may now adjourn. Assalamualaikum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The first session of our competition will start very, very soon. All the contestants, respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, you are invited to be seated. Before we start, please ensure your electronic devices is switched off or turned to silent mode throughout the event. Thank you for your kind attention.
we are waiting for all the contestants to be here, all the 20 contestants. Once again, the first session of our competition will start very, very soon. I need all the contestants to be at your seated. Please be seated. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. In the name of, of, of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Welcome to the first session of the MLC 2019. My name is Muhammad Sharizan bin Osman and on behalf of MLC 2019 Organizing Committee, we would like to extend a very welcome to all of you. As you may know, this year, for 2019, we are pleased to have 20 participants from 20 different universities across Malaysia for taking part in the semi-final of the competition, whereby only top 5 will proceed to the final competition that will be held on 30th April 2019. And for this year, we have invited 4 professionals to be our panel of judges for semi-final and with that say, allow me to introduce them. It is my pleasure to introduce our first jury and also our moderator for today, Professor Dr. Cik Husna Binti Azhari. She is Professor and Director of College Permata Insan University Sain Islam Malaysia. Professor Dr. Cik Husna Azhari received both her degrees from Brunel University, United Kingdom, a BTEC in 1979 and a PhD in 1985. She served as an academic for 37 years at University Kebangsaan Malaysia and spent her last year there, 2017, as an adjunct professor. She is currently a professor and a director of College Permata Insan at University Sain Islam Malaysia. Her last academic post was a DAAD visiting professor at University of Okay, how to pronounce? Oh, thank you. Germany. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Professor Dr. Cik Usna is a UK Chartered Engineer and is a Fellow of the IOM3 UK and IFM Malaysia. All right. Our next jury is uh, Associate Professor Dr. Kwan Seng Hao. Okay. Please. Okay, Professor Dr. Kwan Seng, Associate Professor Dr. Kwan Seng Hao is from University Tun Abdul Razak. He is graduated with a Bachelor Engineer, Master of Engineering and PhD in 2013 from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He has worked in the Canadian mining industry as a plant process engineer in base metals processing with NISTA, correct me as I'm wrong, correct, correct thank you, uh, as well as consultant with Extrata. In 2013, he obtained a faculty position in the Department of Metallurgical and Mining Engineering at Catholic University of North Chile. He taught course in transport phenomena phenomena, analysis of mineral processing and flotation as well as solid liquid separation. After two years, he moved back to Malaysia and secured a position in the Faculty of Engineering and Science, Utah, and has continued teaching there until today. Today, is member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineering, MyMeki, and a Chartered Engineer registered with Engineering Council, UK. Wow. All right. 
to our next jury is Mr. Kang Kim Ang, Managing Director of Cultural Group of Companies. Right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Mr. Kang obtained his diploma in materials engineer from Tonku Abdul Rahman Ta College and master science in corrosion science and engineer from University of Manchester United Kingdom. He is a corrosion specialist and cathodic protection specialist accredited NICE USA and IMM. He is chartered engineer registered with Engineering Council UK. He has over 27 years in corrosion control cathodic protection and pipeline integrity inspection by MTM technology, heavy duty coatings, passive fire protection and corrosion inspection in the oil and gas, marine petrochemical construction and industrial sectors. He is also an as invited trainer for Petronas Skip Group, 15 for level 3 cathodic protection and currently involved in NACE Cathodic Protection Certification for CP1 and CP2 since 2014. He is in the Industrial Advisory Panel for UTAR for the past three years. Currently, Mr. Kang is the Managing Director of Cultural Group of Companies. Wow. Right. And last but not least, Mr. Salahuddin Adnan, Project Director of Mudahan Berjaya Engineer Sendirian Berhad. Right. Salo, Mr. Saludin Adnan, our project director of Mudahan Berjaya Engineering Sinan Berhad and resident engineer mechanical and electrical at Prima Melaka Tengah Dua. He obtained his degree in mechanical engineering from University Putra Malaysia. He has over 15 years experience, served as the project engineer, senior project engineer and resident engineer in various government agency and government link company handling mechanical and electrical project. He is also a member of the Institution of Engineering Malaysia, MIEM. He is also a member of Board, Board Engineers Malaysia, BEM, and Malaysian Water Association. Mr. Saludin knowledge and experience make him being respected in identifying mechanical and electrical issues and troubleshooting and also project management. Before we proceed with our competition, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to highlight our ground rules for the competition. Presentation time for each participant is 15 minutes, followed by Q&A session. There will be only one question per participant for each judge. The judging criteria penalties are similar to those set by Young World Lecture Competition organized by IOM3 UK. Mark will be deducted for lecture time as follows. For presentation below 13 minutes or exceeding 17 minutes, 5 marks will be deducted. While for presentation below 12 minutes or exceeding 19 minutes, 10 marks will be deducted. So, everybody ready? Okay, now without further ado, let's welcome our first contestant for today, from International Islamic University Malay Malaysia IIUM, Ms. Nuraisha Binti Ahmad Sharim. Mrs. Nuraisha graduated in Bachelor of Materials Engineering, honours from International Islamic University Malaysia. Currently, she is a research assistant who is responsible working on the preparation and characterization of biopolymer based on tropical fruit seed starch. Her research papers related to starch have been published in Scopus Index publication. Mrs. Nuraisha, the floor is yours now. Judges, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Here we can see obviously this is mango. 
or we incentive name, we call it Mangifera Indica. So now, I would like to ask the audience, who never eat this mango? Raise your hand. <laughs> I changed my question, okay? Who doesn't like mango? Oh, shame. <laughs> With that, people, this yellowish mango is actually very delicious and tasty, right? So with this delicious one, we can also include into the dish. So in this world map, shows North America, the Mexican has used the mango to turn it to the salsa. In South America, Brazil, this mango is included in the stick. And in Asia, where India has included the mango in the curry. In China, it has turned into pudding. Thailand, mango sticky rice. We can also obtain this dessert in Malaysia. In Indonesia, mango smoothie. And in Malaysia, where we can also obtain this mango smoothie in Malacca, goes viral every year. With that, ladies and gentlemen, all of these desserts are used one part of the fruit, which is the flesh. But another part of the fruit called seeds. What if I say that these seeds can be turned into something useful like plastic, which is bottle mm -hmm. and packaging? So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the fascinating discovery about Mangifera Indica. My name is Nur Aisha Mithi Ahmad Sharim, and I am from International Islamic University, Malaysia. To start with, like I mentioned earlier about the plastics. Nowadays, the plastics are derived from the synthetic polymer from petroleum sources. So all of these materials that have been commonly used called polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, polypropylene, and polystyrene. With that, we commonly use this type of plastic products in our daily life. And based on that, here are the statistics that shows almost 50% or majority of the plastic products are made for packaging. So here, ladies and gentlemen, in this presentation, I will emphasize on the usage of the plastics for packaging purpose. So here, who in the audience have this plastic bottle? No <laughs> Maybe you could hold this plastic bottle and I will explain to you the advantages. So here, the first advantage of the plastic bottle. It is lightweight. You can carry it easily everywhere. Secondly, it is low cost of production and we can buy this at a cheap price, which is one ringgit. It's very cheap. And next is the durability. Even if you drop this plastic bottle to the floor, does it break? Sir, does it break? No. No, no it doesn't break. So that explains the durability. And next, the versatility. Like this example, it is transparent. We can see thoroughly the drink, the drink or the water in the bottle. And it is chemically inert, where the water in the bottle, we can drink it safely. And last but not least, it is resistant towards corrosion. So all of these advantages, with this simplest example, that gives the reason of this plastic become the main interest in our daily life. With that, here, one question. The plastics that we use, do we dispose it or not? Okay, so please, ladies and gentlemen, I need your help to answer with me together, yes or no, okay? So the first one is the plastic bottle. Do you dispose it after usage? Yes. Yeah. Yes, good. And next is the plastic bag, maybe on the, behind, on the yes. back? Yes or no? Yes. yes. And the plastic food container, front one. Yes? No? Okay. Yes. And the plastic straw. So everyone, is it yes or no? Yes. yes. Good, correct. Thank you so much. So, all of these disposed plastics, do you ever question where does this disposed go? I know that majority of you already know. It ended up in the landfill. So this has caused an issue, which is the plastic pollution problem. And yes, this is the problem. So it's no secret, the plastic is hurting the environment. 300 million tons of plastic and 
majority of that is single-use plastic like this. You use it once, and then you throw it away. It stays in nature hundreds of years. In forests, in oceans, causing harm to everyone. Okay? So ladies and gentlemen, why? It caused harm. It's caused of these non-degradable properties where the plastic bag take at least 50 years to decompose, whereas for the plastic bottle, may not be degraded even after 100 years. That is the main issue of the plastic nowadays. So Malaysia has been rated as one of the world's worst plastic pollutants. Not only that, huge amount of mismanaged plastics have drawn to the ocean, which cause a very serious threat to the marine wildlife. Okay? So the endangered species like sea turtle, which is evidenced by this video, the plastic straw has been stuck in the nose. Okay. Sorry. And next is the seagulls and the whale shark, which mistake the plastics for food. So if we do do something about this, all of these species will become extinct later on. So what we need to do is that we need to beat this plastic pollution. I know that everybody have heard this song, the Michael Jackson song. It would sound like, just beat it, beat, beat. <laughs> Here, the government has taken an initiative to introduce the plastic bag charge called how much? 20 cents. 20 cents each, of course. Maybe for you it is a small amount of money, but have you questioned yourself why are you wasting your 20 cents each time you buy this plastic bag? But you can save this money to get a huge amount so that you can buy yourself something valuable. Cool. For ladies, you can self-reward for dating handbag, high-end makeup product, right? So why are you wasting that money? Because this plastic bag, you can only use once. But that thing you buy, you can use many years. Okay? Not only the plastic bag, straw. You can see that many restaurants have been in this plastic straw, okay? So please, do not request the plastic straw. Just go strawless and you can enjoy your drink peacefully. Besides this, for our principle, refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Okay? By all of this initiative by the government, the academic institution also implied all of this. Specifically, in my university, zero single-use plastic campaign have been organized. With that, starting to preserve the environment in our campus, we can get to preserve the environment later on in the bigger picture. All of this, ladies and gentlemen, depending on the human behavior. Are you agree with me? Yes. Yes. Good. So this statement, everybody agree. This human behavior is very difficult to change. What to do to reduce this plastic pollution problem? By introducing the bioplastics. These bioplastics are degradable and it derives from natural resources like protein, lipid, and starch. Among those starch that have been commercialized, corn starch, potato starch, tapioca starch, and cassava starch. Okay? So specifically, you can see cassava starch plastic. We often see, even when you buy something at the mining mall, you can have this biodegradable plastic. Here is the proof that the cassava starch is dissolved in the hot water, which means it is almost completely dissolved within a minute. So imagine that this plastic, when you dispose it to the landfill, it may take up less than five years to degrade, unlike, unlike the conventional plastic. <coughs> but all of these stores of starch are basically affect the food chain, which is the moral issues. What are the other solution? Utilizing waste. Among all of these ways, ladies and gentlemen, the research has been done by using banana peel, jackfruit, and durian seed with the avocado seed. But all of this also has certain disadvantages, like low starch content, the seeds are very limited, and 
the raw materials is costly for the avocado seed. Okay, so now recalling back earlier about this mangifera indica or mango. Remember the seeds? It is waste. So this waste can be converted into plastic. So to obtain the mango seed starch is by preparing the seeds and you can get the high starch content. And after that, how to produce the film is by incorporating these non-toxic chemicals like glycerol and citric acid, and you can process it solution testing. With that, you can heat it up to gel light, and you can pour it into a mold, and last but not least, you can get the film. So technically, here, the comparison of the mango and gesture seed plastics, which shows that mango seed has higher tensile strength and stiffness, but lower flexibility compared to the jackfruit seed. This can be supported with these morphological properties. We can see that the white region in the structure, which indicated by the arrow here, the lesser the white arrow gives a higher tensile strength and stiffness, and good film. Critically here is the test, which is solubural degradation. The, the film was prepared by wrapping the plastic net and bury it in the soil, in the pot, and expose it to natural environment. So every seven years, I'm sorry, every seven days, this film was buried out and measured the weight loss. So here are the weight loss percentage, where you can see that this film weight loss continuously increase until 21 days. This can be supported with this visual changes of the film. So here we can see that every seven days, the film change, unlike this plastic net, which shows that the film is degraded, but the plastic net not. You can see the changes. So with that, here is the last day of the soil burial, which is at day 22. Not only soil and water that affect the degradation, but worm-like creature, everybody, here, feed the starch as their source of food. Eventually, this can also be supported with the morphological structure where the microorganism called fungi also feed the starch as their source of food. Hence, for this mango seed starch filler is degradable in soil, hence can be replaced the conventional plastic in the form of filler later on. To summarize, so this mango seed starch filler is one of the alternative to produce the plastic nowadays. With that, you can see we can get a greener environment, cleaner beach, so that we can live peacefully for our future generation. And so on and so forth, you can see in the future later on, not only the film or the plastics can be degradable, but it may also be edible. You can eat it directly with no harm and sick. Ladies and gentlemen, so here is the end. Thank you so much for your attention. Assalamualaikum. Philippines, mostly third world countries. 
So how much do you think um, your Jack Paul and Mount Paul will contribute to elevate this prof? Well, thank you for the question. So here, Mount Paul and Jack Paul. <laughs> the Mount Paul itself, okay, uh, for my knowledge, I see that the Mount Paul is the character to make the film. So how that I can contribute this Mount Paul is that when I commercialize this, maybe and not only in Malaysia, it can be also being exported to the other country, or uh, if I better need this method. So all of the other country, like the third world, third Asian country, they can also produce this mapol because the mapol is available <coughs> in their country also. Dr. Kwan, you are next. Sure. Uh, thanks. thanks very much for a uh, very informative presentation. Mm -hmm. I just have one question. Uh, have you looked at the cost and the feasibility of producing plastic from uh, mango polymers compared to conventional plastic? Mm -hmm. And because uh, you're extracting from the seed, right? So you need a lot of seeds to ex extract uh, enough uh, material to make plastic. Is it feasible? How much does it cost compared to conventional plastics? Yes. Mm -hmm. So comparing that cost analysis, we need the technical value, right? We need the value, the exact value of that thing. And then this mark wall is only the filler. So it I can say that it is cheaper than the cost production of the commission plastic as well. Because we just only use the seeds, we discard it as waste, and many people are demanding on that mango. So we have the raw materials. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nuraisha from IIUM. Now we proceed to our next presenter from our home, UTEM, Ms. Nurul Amira Azmi. Ms. Nurul Amira was born in Turanganu. On 30th September 1996, she is the youngest child with one older brother. She went to Sekolah Tun Fatima SDF and Pusat Asasi Science University of Malaya. She has a great interest in the traditional dance and flute. Currently, she is a final year student of Bachelor of Manufacturing Engineering in University Technical Malaysia, Malacca. The floor is yours now, Miss. Next is, after, after it uh, formed flock, the 
the water will go to the clarifier and it will be clarified. All the sludges will be flushed down by the pulsator and it will trap at the sludge blanket. After that, it will go to the filter and the water is filtered. And um, after, at the filter, we will induce um, chlorine again as post-chlorination. And lastly, the water will be stored at the buffer tank before being supplied to all of us. Okay, at the buffer tank, to control the um, pH, we will add lime again. And at the end of the water treatment, we will add fluoride. Okay, this is where we want to focus, the fluoride addition. Okay, so next, water fluoridation is where we incorporate sodium hexafluorosilicate powder into our um, drinking water, the water that we use, domestic water. Okay, so... Um, that is the fluoride metering pump. One, okay. And the water fluoridation is one of the components in water treatment process. It, it is indicated by the journals, by Zipporah, Stephen, Stephen, and Emily. And also the sodium um, hexafluorosilicate is introduced into the treated water. Okay, next is the chemical equation. What, where the sodium hexafluorosilicate powder is added into the uh, our domestic water, it will um, it will um, react with the water um, as stated at the chemical equation which the sodium has a sulfuricate will add with water and will produce silicon dioxide, disodium, hydrogen and fluoride and when um, fluoride is added into the water it will become fluoride ions because water is also an ions um, H plus and OH minus so the fluoride ions will combine with um, H Hydrogen ion will become hydrofluoric acid. So, a uh, hydrofluoric acid is an extremely corrosive acid, but um, it is uh, it is located uh, in the first row of group 17 in the periodic table of elements. Next, this is from uh, SAJ Ranhill. Um, SAJ is Syarikat Air Johor. So, uh, it stated that fluoride content shall be a minimum of 98% dry basic which correspond to approximately 59.4% fluoride ions. Okay. Next is, okay, this is the schematic diagram of the fluoride entering pumps, as we see earlier, the green one. Okay. So, this is the motto and, and so on, and at the end there, is the check valve. This is where we want to um, concentrate, is the check valve where it has direct contact with the sodium uh, hexafluorosilicate powder solution into the so the check valve has um, one, one of the types of the check valve is a disc valve and this valve is made up of 316L stainless steel and it also must withstand pressure up to 400 gallon per hour or it is equivalent uh, to 1514 litre of water per day okay, no, I mean per hour <laughs> okay. so uh, next is it has direct contact with um, sodium hexafluorosilicate solution but as you can see the other picture here, I indicated the outer and the inner, which means um, it is uh, assembled as the outer has less um, direct contact with sodium hexafluorosilicate hexa solution and the inner part has more uh, time contact with the solution. Okay. And then this is, um, I just want to go through this simply, this of manufacturing. It is uh, from the, how we manufacture stainless steel. Firstly, we will put it into the electric arc furnace, uh, then oxygen decarburization, and then it will go to the continuous casting. Finally, it's go to hot rolling and cold finishing. However, austenitic stainless steel is not heat treatable. The austenite is very tough, ductile, and quite strong as anneal, and can develop high strength only by cold work. So it, it doesn't need uh, the heat treatment. Okay. Um, the manufacturing of the stainless steel is based on the its standards and of the, the standard are um, S5524 slash 5507 which um, include the steel corrosion heat resistant and so on and then, and then ASTM A240 or ASME ASA240 and also QQS766 okay next is the composition comparison um, here I would like to compare where um, the carbon steel and also stainless steel. Carbon steel is divided into four, which are the mild steel, medium carbon steel, high carbon steel, and ultra ultra high carbon steel. 
and still still that I want to focus over here is the difference between AISI 316 and AISI 216L. So the difference that is, um, I know some some of you know, but if you don't know, I will explain that the main difference is the L, right? Yeah, that one, the the 316 doesn't have L and 316L. What is L? Okay, the difference. For L is the carbon, carbon content. The AI3, AI SI 316L has lower carbon content um, rather than 316. Okay, <coughs> okay so um, basically, why I want to uh, highlight about carbon steel and stainless steel is the difference in elements uh, in the in these two elements. Okay, for the carbon steel and stainless steel, the difference is the chromium. Because stainless steel needs approximate at least 10.5% of chromium in order for it to become stainless. So, what is the what is the function of chromium? It is to stabilize the austenitic structure and also providing preservation to stainless steel. What is preservation? Preservation is like this, okay? If you can see, this is the passivum, and this is the carbon steel, and on the top of carbon steel, when it is um, contact with oxygen and uh, water, it will um, pro produce rust. But for the stainless steel, um, the chromium will form passivum when it reacts with oxygen. The passivum is chromium oxide. Chromium dioxide. Okay. Um, okay, the difference between 316 and 316L, as I indicated in earlier, is about the carbon. The 316 has low, uh, higher carbon, while the 316L has lower carbon content. It is to reduce um, the susceptibility to intergranular corrosion because carbon is um, carbon will precipitate at the intergranular structure of the um, stainless steel. Thus, it will produce corrosion when it reacts with chromium because it will produce chromium carbide, and chromium carbide can be dis dissolved into other solution, and thus it will um, easily rupture. Okay, this is uh, my sample. So um, these samples are already corroded, and as you can see, this is sample X and this is sample Y. But the difference between sample X and the sample Y is the corrosion, um, corrosion, um, corrosion. Okay, this one has less corrosion, and this one has more corrosion that has been um, corroded. Okay, next uh, I will continue with the why corrosion happens. Okay, so. Um, how do I investigate the corrosion? Is by X, uh, X-ray diffraction and microscopic analysis. Okay, this is the X-ray view machine, and this is the optical microscope and also scanning electron microscope. I use these three to investigate about the corrosion. And firstly, is the SEM analysis. SEM analysis, I will uh, I conduct this analysis without any grinding, without any polishing. It is also, it is basically the surface morphology. So. This is sample X outer, and this is sample Y out. Uh, y outer. Outer region is over here. Okay. It has less contact with the fluoride solution. Uh, as you can see, it is uh, there. There it is pits and some corroded structure. Next is the SRD. Uh, SRD. This is the result from SRD that I get. I have four sample. Sample X the outer and sample Y and sample X inner, also sample Y outer and sample Y inner. Okay, the difference is when we check the um, presence of element is where the sample X outer has chromium, while other other sample doesn't have chromium. chromium. Okay. Um, this is the composition comparison of the XRD before. So, Look at the X outer. It has everything, like everything, and some certain certain composition is missing. X inner, Y outer, and Y inner. Okay. Next is optical microscopy analysis. So for sample X outer region, I will um, I will focus on the grain boundary carbides. This is the grain boundary, and it has carbides incorporated to it. And also sample Y, sample Y. It is like we have. We um, have a layer of a layer that uh, combat uh, corrosion. But if we if we look at the inner region, there is massive carb 
carbide, also as sample Y, because the inner region has no time contact with um, fluoride solution. Okay, and then so from the optical microscope analysis, I will I will say that what are the important of preservation? Why the preservation is uh, how to make a uh, metal is uh, uh, I mean still 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 unreactive. So passive layer is a layer that make um, still still resist corrosion. Okay. And how is the preservation conducted? Is by treating a metal with a mild oxidant to remove surface iron. Okay. And then look at this. This is the chromium oxide layer. And when it is destroyed by machining, the chromium oxide will form the layer again. That is the importance of having chromium in the synthesis. This is the chemical question. Okay. So the conclusion I would like to suggest over here is that the manufacturing of every, every material should be according to its specification. If, this, if stainless steel needs chromium, then um, put chromium to it. it um, as I stated earlier, it is at least 10.5% of chromium is needed into the stainless steel in order for a steel to become stainless. Okay? Um, but uh, for the water fluoridation process, we come back earlier, if the stainless steel is corroded, all the corrosion uh, deposit might go into the solution of the fluoride and the fluoride, solu fluoride solution is incorporated in our drinking water and we use it in our everyday life. So if, if what do you think if the fluoride addition is exceeding the standard that is um, indicated by WHO, we will um, consume more fluoride than we should and it will give us, gives us um, terrible um, terrible illness such as the something some gastrointestinal uh, illness and also um, sometimes the fluoride also can be reduced because it does uh, because of the rupture of the this valve okay so if it is reduced then it is it will not um, it will not satisfy the uh, main point of adding fluoride into the water which will reduce dental caries among children and it is in a, indicated by um, the journal I, I read and I, I put it from uh, the previous slide that 24 countries is using fluoride addition in order to resist uh, dental caries among children and it will also um, help our osteoporosis problem. So, um, lastly, I would say that do not take granted of the manufacturing process and parameters because small changes in manufacturing parameters will affect the lifespan of a product. If a product um, needs, uh, we, we, will, we want the product to have a long lifespan, right? But if the product has no, a shorter lifespan than, it, uh, than we want, so we need to um, provide more, more uh, maintenance costs. In order for, for us to change the this file again. Okay? So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So since it's a corrosion problem, we'll have to hand over to Mr. Ka. <laughs> No, I won't, I won't ask you the uh, corrosion question. It's more that uh, you were speaking about how to, to ensure that the, the uh, parts that you get meet your requirement. But how do you think that you could do that? Because it's in the process, main manufacturing process. And now in the world when we buy, we always buy cheaper. Uh, even expensive one, we may not get. So how do you ensure that you, you get what you actually require? Okay, uh, to answer that question, it, um, I think that is two steps. Firstly, is, um, our, our responsibility is to buy something and check the material first before you use it. But mm, no one will do it. No one will do it. Right? The, uh, most of the company will buy the cheaper version and use it. And suddenly, we will um, counter problems. But uh, for me, it is... Uh, come to the manufacturing um, company for the first for the first problem is come from the manufacturing company. So anyone in um, anyone we um, working at the manufacturing company should adhere to the standard of manufa uh, stainless steel manufacturing itself. Uh, 
I hand over to Engineer Sarah for the next question. That's your microphone. No question. I think Dr. Kwan should be the honest then. Eh? If you looked at the effect of the corrosion over extended amount of time, what is the time frame that, that you subjected the sample to? Okay, for the time frame of this um, experiment is uh, three months, uh, but I haven't looked at the effect of, um, after three months because this is subjected to our domestic usage of water. If the this work is placed more than three months, then we, uh, it might it might um, introduce uh, another problem into our usage. But the um, problem that um, the problem that we encounter is the maintenance cost. Uh, it is it is from the um, point of uh, company. The maintenance cost is increase keep on increasing if they use um, sample that is. Uh, not adhering to the standard of the Okay, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you very much, Ms. Nurul Amira. Now, we proceed to the next contestant from University of Nottingham, Malaysia, Mr. Chow Yuan Leong. He will present tuning suit into carbon nanotube. Uh, currently, he is a final year mechanical engineering student uh, in University of Nottingham, Malaysia. He has interned in the solar energy EPCC company as well as participating in num a numerous group design and project. His hobbies are watching documentary shows as well as learning new recipes from cooking ch channel. Wow, okay. The best suka masak. Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, selamat pagi. Uh, okay. Selamat pagi dan selamat sejahtera. Uh, good morning to the fellow judges and fellow audiences and fellow lecturers. My name is Kelvin or Chai Leong, and today I'm going to present to you about tuning soup to carbon nanotube, or more specifically, how can you turn, how can you use hydrocarbon flame to produce carbon nanotubes? So, in the presentation, I'll give you a bit of objective. So, the objective of my lecture today is to brief you guys about the history of carbon nanotube dysfunction as well as its formation, followed by why flame in using carbon in generating carbon nanotube. And then finally, uh, what is or what are the potential future research areas and applications that we can do for carbon nanotube under hydrocarbon flame synthesis? So, what is or what are carbon nanotubes? Carbon nanotubes are essentially imagine carbon nan imagine a sheet of graphene, two one D layer of graphene, sorry, one D layer, one dimensional layer of graphene being folded into a tubular shape and structure that is carbon nanotube. So, what carbon nanotube has that other materials don't have? First, it has excellent mechanical properties, followed by uh, easily mass-produced material. So basically, carbon nanotube can be generated very easily um, using conventional means. Third, it has it is a superior thermal conductor material, and then finally, it has an exception, exceptional performance for electrical conductivity. So, in carbon nanotube, due to its various high application or advanced application, it can be used for several things. I shall show you two of it. The first one is that it can improve LED brightness. So, if you line carbon nanotube, because what happens is that carbon nanotube has an optical imagery structure that allows it to refract light easily and also to improve the conductivity as well. So, when you line carbon nanotube over it, sorry. Mm. Yeah, that's the pointer. Mm. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, if you line the carbon, if you line the carbon dioxide over the LNG structure here, right, you will improve the LNG brightness. So second is excellent heat sink. So due to carbon nanotube structure, if you were to incorporate carbon nanotube onto a layer, not only you're able to increase the surface area of the carbon nanotube, but due to its directional growth of carbon nanotube, as you can see over here, it can transmit the heat very easily, which is essential for various applications like heat sink. So the, the, the discovery of carbon nanotube was done by Sumio Ijima over here in the 1990s. It was accumulation of decades of research on the different types of carbon allotropes like the buckyball, graphene, and he accidentally discovered carbon nanotube using this method, which is known as the laser ablation. So what you have is essentially high energy laser heating the graphite to vaporize the graphite into carbon molecules that will be collected at a catalyst that will form carbon nanotube itself. So due to the high temperature and high energy, the carbon is able to break free from its original bronze and coalesce into a higher energy, coalesce into carbon nanotube shape, which requires a higher energy state. So other scientists discovered various methods such as the electric arc discharge, which requires the usage of electric plasma. Rather than laser, you use electric plasma to vaporize the carbon source over here to form carbon nanotube around the surrounding of this container. Mind you that both of the methods that I showed you previously have to be done and conducted under a vacuum nature. Followed by chemical vapor deposition. Scientists eventually realized there's other methods to it. This is the one of the latest one, which is chemical vapor deposition. What you have is that you have a catalyst here with a substrate and also a carbon source over here. So what happened is that the carbon source will be entering the will be entering the chamber at high temperature under pyrolyzed condition, and then this chamber will be filled with inert gases such as such as acid uh, hydrogen and argon to prevent contamination of the carbon nanotubes form. That way, the carbon nanotube, the vaporized carbon, will be landed itself onto the uh, catalyst and then react itself and to form carbon nanotube from there. But there are several issues with the current processes in generating carbon nanotubes. One of which is that it is highly energy intensive. Both all the methods that I have shown to you before in generating carbon nanotubes, they, are, they require a lot of energy. Then, not only that, in the laser ablation and electric methods, it has low quality yield, which is kind of a bit bad because when you have high energy intensive and a low quality yield, economically, it does not translate economically. Third, it requires extensive apparatus. Imagine you have uh, apparatus this side of a stage just to generate carbon nanotube, which consumes space. And then finally, you have an additional factor of either vacuum condition or inner gas condition, which means that you need to have additional apparatus, skin type, uh, oh no, skin type uh, uh, basically uh, chamber type areas. So these are, the, these are the things that we face with the carbon nanotube generation. However, latest research has shown that the presence of oxygen and hydrogen in a chamber when carbon nanotube is generating does not inhibit or promote carbon nanotube generation. So, oxygen air contains both hydrogen and oxygen, which brings us to the fact that maybe perhaps we can generate carbon nanotubes in air condition, at room condition. Therefore, that's, that's why I introduce you to flame and suits. So, what does flame has? Flame is basically what flame is produced by the burning of hydrocarbon under air condition, under the room, in the presence of air and also uh, air and things like that. So, with soot into the equation, if you were to tune the properties of the flame, and also, oh sorry, if you were to tune the properties of the flame, you might be able to generate carbon nanotube. So, what do you need in what do you need to generate carbon nanotube? First. You need carbon precursors like uh, carbon uh, carbon uh, monoxide and also polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Those are carbon precursors needed to generate carbon nanotubes. Second, you need high temperature to basically break, break out the carbon bonds before and uh, break out the carbon bond at a higher energy state before it is coalesced into carbon nanotube. Third, you need a transition method catalyst for the carbon nanotube to form. And then four, you need the laminar flame. So the laminar flame will help in generating a carbon nanotube easily. 
easily in the sense that like it's uh, uniform in growth. It's not it's not uh, varying from one place to another on the catalytic surface. So in a flame, what you have in a flame is basically a flame can be divided into three zones. The first is the molecular zone over here, which breaks down the carbon from the fuel itself. This is then followed by the growth area, whereby you can see the carbon coagulating into polyaromatic hydrocarbon and also carbon monoxide, followed by oxidation. So this is the part whereby your carbon, the burnt carbon, turns into soup. But we don't need this part. This part can be not. In flame, in generating hydrocarbon, in generating carbon dioxide from flame, we need this area, the growth section. So under this growth section, we are able to create, we are able to get the necessary high carbon precursors needed to form carbon nanotube with the presence of the catalyst in it. So, how does the carbon nanotube form? So basically, under a hydrocarbon synthesis of under a flame synthesis of, uh, of a carbon nanotube, what you have is basically imagine a catalyst on the substrate over here. So. Basically, this is the catalyst and this is the substrate. The substrate is basically the place where the carbon nanotube will form. So what you have is basically an agglomeration or basic or a coagulation of carbon precursors like polyaromatic hydrocarbon, carbon monoxide, along the side of the surface catalyst, along the side of the catalyst over here. So the side of the catalyst over here would then the the carbon would then coagulate and under high temperature carbon would able to be undergoing self-assembly such that it will grow carbon nanotube on top of the catalyst surface itself. So basically what happens is that to summarize, the catalyst followed by the coagulation or the accumulation of carbon precursors around the catalyst and then the carbon grow under self-assembly at high temperature. Due to the catalyst size also affects the carbon nanotube formation as well. So you can easily decide what type of carbon nanotube you want to form. Either you want to do single wall, multi wall, or even nano iron or carbon fibers, depending on the shape of the catalyst itself, the shape of the catalyst particle itself. So, to give you a demonstration of how it can work, basically, so just now we mentioned about uh, hydrocarbon, uh, we mentioned about generating carbon nanotube requires a huge amount of space and material and apparatus, right? What I have essentially here is a burner. A burner that can generate carbon nanotube based on the research done by previous experiment. So what this burner has is that unlike a Bunsen burner where you just mix the air and the flame without measuring it, this is basically a full flow diffusion burner which allows for the meeting of gas and the fuel, uh, sorry, the meeting of fuel and the air over here. This will result in the formation of carbon nanotube. This will result in the flame needed to generate carbon nanotube. Basically, it is here. Yeah. So you can see the flame over here, right? It can be generated from the... Uh, the flame is basically symmetrical, and also it provides an area of the carbon nanotube growth, which is basically the whole flow diffusion, which you can see over here, basically. Um, you can take a look at the This is basically the burner. Yeah, you take a look of it. So as you can see, imagine if you can able to generate carbon nanotube from such a small apparatus like this. It could be scalable, it could be it is low cost, it can promote so much things for our country and for our other nations when apparatus is quite expensive. We can use this apparatus to generate carbon nanotube easily. So what are the advantages of flame synthesis using carbon nanotube? First, Using flame synthesis for carbon nanotube generation, you'll be providing an in-situ growth of carbon nanotube on an active reaction site. So the catalyst will be placed over the flame under the growth area that I showed you just now for the carbon to be deposited onto the catalyst. Then after that, next, it has a potential area to control the CNT growth. Remember the slide just now I showed you that the particles, the catalyst size influence the carbon nanotube uh, shape and type. You can control that by changing the catalyst. Then you can control the direction of the carbon nanotube form by changing the fuel type. You basically you can change either to methane or ethylene or any type of fuel, and then you can control the growth of carbon nanotube to a certain extent. Third, it is cheap and easy to replicate, it is scalable in nature. 
basically in other words, due to its shape uh, structure of that kind of stuff, this one this one costs about like three hundred ringgit. So imagine if we were to do any mass production of it, right? We are able to produce carbon negative in a scalable manner. And then finally, it is a safer environment setup and does not require any additional restriction. Remember previously, just now, in the carbon type and the carbon negative formation require inert gas and vacuum condition. If you can engineer carbon negative under a room condition like this, this would be beneficial and also this would be time saving and cheap in cost. Um, so, along the way, when I did the research of carbon nanotube material formation under flame condition, I realized several key issues that we need to address. First, there is there are no patterns, uh, there have been no discovery of patterns or relationship in the formation of carbon nanotube under flame synthesis yet. Basically what happened is that the parameters involved in past research are fixed in nature. Basically, you need to have a certain flow rate in order to achieve the carbon nanotube formation. But no details were given as to why the flow rate needs to be there or why the dimension needs to be there. Which leads us to a second question, which is both flame and soot formation involve fluid mechanics. Undeniably, this involves something, this, uh, the understanding of flame and the understanding of flame and soot formation is based on existing experiments on carbon on, on, on uh, fluid mechanics of the dynamics of the flame. If we were to merge both the material sciences of generating carbon nanotubes and the nature and the understanding of flame synthesis, uh, oh, sorry, of, of flame and soot formation, we are able to merge both fields in order to create carbon nanotubes, which could be highly crucial for a new research area that we can explore. So, in conclusion, we have discovered in context and details as to what is carbon nanotube and the formation, the type of formation of it as well as the application of carbon nanotube. How can flame and soot be modified to form carbon nanotube to our own advantage at a cheap nature? And finally, the potential areas and application of research that we can do with flame synthesis of carbon nanotube or using soot with carbon nanotube. With that, I'd like to thank you fellow audience and judges for this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chuck. That's Mr. Chow, right? Uh, yes. What an exciting presentation. Maybe I will have to copy your idea, right? You have a lot of uh, potential applications, so I will have to start the question. Sure. All right. Um, how do you think this research is going to benefit our country? First of all, our country is a developed country and we need new science and new technology to motivate our young generation to understand more about new materials and carbon nanotube. If we were to be able to create carbon nanotube from a cheap, from a cheap yet high quality in manner, not only we can save costs, we can save time and space needed to procure those items for our university, and fellow university students are able to understand the types of flame or the research needed, to, uh, the flame as well as the soot formation needed to form carbon nanotube. Basically, instead of giving them the fish, why not we teach them how to make the fish? Our flame synthesis will be able to let fellow uh, researchers to understand the carbon nanotube formation easily uh, by understanding the type of flame involved, the paralysis of the carbon, the breakdown of carbon structure from the flame, and then the position on the carbon catal on the catalyst needed to form carbon nanotube. So basically, fellow researchers can understand carbon nanotube easily, it's cheap, and some more uh, is wrapping the world throughout our country, basically. So I think it's beneficial for our country based, uh, based, uh, based on this statement. Okay. Uh, sure. uh, can you go back to the uh, carbon nanotube formation and the slide? Sure. Yeah, this one? Yes, uh, can, you, can you explain a little bit about how the carbon nanotube come into the shape that it, it does based on the agglomeration? Basically, what happened is that the carbon would be coalescing around the catalyst. It just is the catalyst act as a reaction site for the carbon to self-assemble because of the high temp because it's under high temperature, right? It breaks down the carbon molecule already. So at high energy state, if they want to go down to a low another lower energy state, right? The next best option was is definitely next best option for carbon is carbon nanotube. So they undergo self-assembly because the flame has already break down the carbon, give it its high energy state. 
and with the catalyst, right, it will promote the growth of the carbon nanotube by self assembly. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. You're, you're only allowed two questions. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> like to ask. Thank you very much, Mr. Chow. Now we proceed to our next contestant, Mr. Lam Jia Yong from University Putra, Malaysia. Mr. Lam Jiayong is in his second year of PhD in Medical Microbiology at University Putra, Malaysia. His doctoral research focuses on the development of biosensors to improve the current diagnosis for laptop, laptospirosis, a disease of global importance. He also holds a master's degree from National Chiao Tung University, Taiwan. Okay, Mr. Lam, all the best. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, do you all know what is this that you're looking at? It kind of looks like a toilet brush? Or maybe a bottle brush? Well, but it's, well, sorry to break it to you, it's not. This is optical fiber. The main protagonist in my research, and this is what that is going to get me my PhD degree, hopefully in the next two years. My name is Jayong and I'm from University of Putra, Malaysia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have gone through the 90s, I'm, I'm sure that you have seen this. This is what we have to get through in order to connect to the internet back, back then. So, do you remember the iconic sound it makes? That sound? Well, brings back memories, is it? And do you remember back then when we could not make a phone call while connected to the internet? I mean, it's so frustrating, right? So those days, we were powered by the old school copper cable. Well, look at me right now. Look how far we've come to. Today, we have fast internet with the likes of Maxis Fiber Internet, Unified Time Fiber Internet, connecting each of us 24-7 right now. All this thanks to fiber optic, or also known as optical fiber. So, what is exactly optical fiber? Well, they are transparent, flexible fiber made of silica. A material you can easily find anywhere, and it's one of the most abundant material in Earth, on Earth. How big is it? I would say slightly thicker than a human hair. So, it was originally intended and has been widely used in the fields of communications. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a map of the undersea optical fiber around the world, connecting us right now. It's beautiful, right? Fascinating. So in fiber optics communication, our data, our information are being encoded in pulses of light and traveling across the center of the fiber from one end to another. Now, in other words, all our WhatsApp messages, videos, Images, voices are encoded into these pulses of light and then re-encoded into what we see on our screen. But enough about communications. I'm not here to tell you what has already been known. What if I tell you optical fiber can be used for disease diagnosis? Mind blown, right? So here are the different variants of optical fiber that has been developed into a biosensor. Now a biosensor as the name itself means an analytical device used to detect or sense the presence of biological molecules in a sample. So we have here we have the decladded optical fiber, the U-shaped probe optical fiber, and tapered optical fiber, the best among them. But before we want to apply these optical fibers as a biosensor, we have to stick to immobilize biological recognition elements on the surface of the fiber. For example, if we stick enzyme on the surface, it's going to capture the specific substrate molecule. If we immobilize DNA capture probe on the fiber, it's going to capture only the complementary target DNA. 
The same goes for antibody. It's going to capture and bind to the specific antigen. So the uprise of optical fiber has led us to develop new diagnostic methods for infectious diseases. One of it, leptospirosis. So perhaps not many of you have heard of leptospirosis, am I right? But what about a much more common term? In Malaysia, we usually call it as red urine disease. Penyakit kencing tikus. So this disease is an emerging and often neglected infectious disease. Annually, it causes about, there are about 1 million cases worldwide, causing about 60,000 deaths annually. But how about in our dear Malaysia? Well, I gotta say it's pretty alarming as well, looking at this trend here. Because this disease affects countries in the tropical regions the most. So Malaysia is one of the countries in the tropical region. If we take a look at this graph here, we see that at, in 2014 and 2015, we see an increase in the incidence of this disease. Now, do you know why is that? Do you remember back then in 2014 and 2015, we have major floods happening across Malaysia? Now, this disease is the worst during natural disaster. But why? Why is it the worst during natural disaster? Let us take a look how it this disease is spread. It is caused by the bacteria, leptospira bacteria. So hence the name of the disease, leptospirosis. It is usually carried by rodents, usually rats. Now when rats urinate, that bacteria is going to be excreted out from their urine. This bacteria containing urine can contaminate our water, our soil, and our food. So humans are usually infected with this disease through the contact with the contaminated water or urine into our eyes during water activities or swallowing the contaminated water and food when we are picnicking and exposure of any open wounds to the contaminated water and soil so now you see why is it that we have seen an increased incidence especially during natural disasters such as flood now the symptoms of leptospirosis are such as fever, headache, jaundice rash, muscle pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. This set of symptoms, you might think that, where have I seen that this set of symptoms? It sounds so familiar. The same set of symptoms we see in diseases such as dengue, malaria. You see, dengue is caused by a virus. Malaria is caused by a parasite. Leptospirosis caused by a bacteria. Three different kinds of germs requiring three different kinds of treatment strategies. So the problem here is that when the doctor, based on this set of symptoms, diagnosed you as dengue and gave you medication for dengue, but in fact, you are infected with leptospirosis. Now that, that, that medication for dengue will not work for you because it will not kill the bacteria, it only kills the virus. So now it's scary, right? And this is why overlapping symptoms of leptospirosis as well as misdiagnosis are the two great challenges in diagnosis of this disease. But to make matter worse, leptospirosis is usually found co-infected with other diseases, making the diagnostic even more challenging and even more daunting. So how do we go about this? How do we achieve a better diagnostic? The key here lies with DNA biosensor. Each of these three germs, no matter dengue, malaria, or leptospirosis, each of the pathogens has their own unique DNA sequences. And DNA biosensor is able to tell the difference. So this prompted me to look into the possibility of combining the optical fiber technology and the DNA biosensor approach to develop a novel DNA biosensor that can only detect leptospira DNA. But aren't you all curious why optical fiber can be used for disease analysis? Well, let's take a look at how optical fiber works. You see, light travels along the center of the fiber from one end to another through the total internal reflection principle. But take a closer look here. You see, light does not abruptly or immediately decay to zero at the interface where reflection occurs. But instead, a portion of the light enters into this region here in the cladding of the fiber. 
So just now I mentioned that tapered optic fiber has the best biosensing potential among them all. So as we can see just now, light will penetrate into the cladding, but in untapered fiber, it will not interact with the external surrounding. But with the tapering process, it's going to make this region here thinner. That way, the penetrated light will be able to interact with the external surrounding here, and it's very sensitive to any changes in the refractive index. So that is why it makes this a very suitable candidate for developing a biosensor. So the idea here is to develop a tapered optical fiber biosensor that, so that we can stick the DNA capture probe on the surface and it will only recognize the Leptospira bacteria DNA. And on the bottom panel here, you'll see the system set up where we have a light source. So light will travel through the tapered optical fiber and then analyzed by the optical spectrum analyzer. But how do we stick this DNA capture probe on the fiber? Well, this process is called a surface functionalization. And this it will be done by the chemical treatment, stepwise chemical treatment with various kinds of chemicals. Now think of it this way. This is just like the burger we eat. The fiber, bare fiber itself, is the bottom layer bun of the burger. And then we will treat the fiber with sodium hydroxide, the patty of the burger. Synthesization by Atus, the cheese of the burger. Crosslink by glutaraldehyde, which is any source of vegetable that we are going to put into our burger. And finally, at this stage, the fiber is ready to be bound with the DNA probe, the top bun of the burger. So in a burger, usually the bait is us, human. But what about this? What's the bait? Our target DNA sample, which is our Leptospira DNA samples. So ladies and gentlemen, if I take a look at these two graphs here, I know that this one has the presence of target DNA. This one does not. Now the difference you see here, the difference here is the wavelength shift. Here, it is tested on the target Leptospira DNA samples. Here, it is tested on the non-matching DNA samples. Now you see, in the case of non-matching, before and after the addition of DNA, the spectrum is the same because that target DNA does not bind to the DNA capture probe. So the refractive index is still the same. But in the matching DNA, our target DNA will bind to the DNA capture probe, changing the refractive index near the surface of the fiber. So that's why we see the significant wavelength shift. Now, in my work, I have tested this biosensor on various strains of Leptospira bacteria. There are, in Malaysia, there are various strains of Leptospira. So all of them gave significant wavelength shift, as indicated by this green box here. But not the other two non-Leptospira bacteria, Clostridium difficile and E. coli. These are two bacteria causing gastrointestinal disease, different bacteria. So this indicates that this biosensor is highly specific for Leptospira bacterial DNA. Meanwhile, for sensitivity, this biosensor also demonstrated high sensitivity from 0.1 nanogram per microliter of Leptospira DNA to 0.001 nanogram per microliter. Now to make things easier to imagine, detecting 0.1 nanogram per microliter is like detecting a grain of rice in a fish tank. 0.01 nanogram per microliter is a grain of rice in a bathtub. 0.001 nanogram per microliter is a grain of rice in a water tanker truck. So now that we have developed a new, a sensitive and a specific DNA biosensor for leptospirosis, the question is, do we stop here? No, because this piece of technology has a great potential to be developed even further into a much more powerful biosensor. For example, if we can couple it with nanomaterials or DNA amplification technique, that way we can achieve an even better sensitivity. Now, just now I mentioned it's detecting a grain of rice in a water tanker truck. We are hopeful that one day we can detect a grain of rice in a swimming pool. So, not just that. This piece of technology can also be applied on other diseases where diagnostic challenges are important. So, all we have to do is just change the DNA capture probe from Leptospira capturing DNA probe to your pathogen of interest. For example, if you want to detect HIV, 
you can just design a DNA capture probe for HIV. That way, it will be only specific to HIV. So ladies and gentlemen, we are hopeful that this piece of technology can revolutionize the field of biomedical diagnostic one day, leading to the advancement of technology and humankind. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Optical fiber. Uh, we shall start with Mr. Kuff. Interesting. It's another typical example where, where cough syrup becomes Coca-Cola. Yes. Uh, the fiber optics has turned in such a usage. Now, the, uh, the testing that you've done, is it what you have able to detect those viruses? Is it in terms of just qualitatively or now we are able to go on quantitative? Well, we can say that it's quantitatively because we did test it on sorry, uh, on various concentrations of DNA. So from here we can know what is it, the concentrations of DNA that we are looking for. But actually the main essence of DNA biosensor is to detect whether yes or no. Thank you very much for the question. What an interesting question that is. So actually, it's the same technology that we use in fiber optics. So. Not much, nothing much is so sophisticated. We still have the light source, we still have the optical spectral analyzer. But the only thing that we exploit here is change the geometry of the optical fiber and exploit that phenomenon where the light penetrates into the cladding and ex interact with the external environment to turn that into a DNA biosensor. So actually nothing much new, we just look in a different perspective. Okay. All right, with that, thank you very much. Hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. Thank you very much, Mr. Lam. Uh, now, please allow me to invite, oh, he's already here, from Ta, uh, from Tunku Abdul Rahman University College, Mr. Leong Kok Lun. Uh, he is currently doing his master research study at Tunku Abdul Rahman University College under the supervision of Dr. Ho Mo Yen, Nicole and Dr. Li Xiao Yin. His research involved in developing ternary graphene-based non-enzymatic glucose biosensors. Uh, you are the speaker now, sir, please. Very uh, good morning to our um, judges, fellow uh, participants and audience. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Kok Lun from KHUC uh, and the title of my research will be a graphene-based ternary electrode for non enzymatic glucose sensing. So ac according to the American Heart Association recommendation for the uh, sugar intake, children between, uh, sorry, I mean, children below 2 years old are not allowed to take any sugar, while children between 2 to 8 are only allowed to take below or less than 6 per day and adult women with a mouth uh, same as children between 2 to 18 and adult male are uh, only allowed to take below or equal to 9 teaspoons per day. However, we as daily consumer without any diabetes, do we really know or do we really care how much sugar we intake per day? Do anyone of you really take your time at the end of your day to sit down and count how much sugar you take? I'm sure to, to everyone could not do so, right? So, Sugar being one of the main ingredients can be found from a wide variety of foods ranging from ketchup to yogurts and even to our daily oatmeal breakfast and sugar can be found particularly high in Coca-Cola and fruit juice. So without any help conscious on our uh, glucose intake or sugar intake, this is the reason why uh, the diabetes cases are on the rise annually. So from the uh, in statistic provided by the Inter International Diabetes Federation IDF, around 387 million people are living with diabetes and 46.3% are undiagnosed cases. So this means that 1 in 12 people in the worldwide population will be suffering from diabetes and 1 
And, and one in nine ringgit will be spent on diabetes on either the diabetes monitoring tools and other uh, diabetes related cases. And 21 million of kids will be suffering from birth defect. So by 2035, diabetes cases will be expected to be around 592 million. And the severity of diabetes will generally be separated into two categories. The first category will be a high blood sugar level or the scientific terms as hyperglycemia. So the health uh, effects will include loss of eye, uh, loss of eyesight, kidney failure, high blood pressure, stroke, blood defects and amputation. While on the other end of diabetes will be known as hypoglycemia or very low blood sugar level. And the health effects will be a dizziness, shaking, seizure, brain damage, and even death. So, um, for the diabetes patient, they have to constantly uh, monitor their blood glucose level to ensure that it is within the healthy range. So, throughout the decades, the only method for this type of patients to monitor, monitor their blood glucose level is through invasive method. So, and well, and this method will involve the finger pricking through needle. Piercing and the draw blood will be applied into a disposable test strip. The test strip will then be inserted into a glucometer or the glucose monitoring device, and from there the result will be displayed. However, the method for this type of invasive uh, method is that uh, the, it will generally cause discomfort or pain to the patients. So, when pains will be involved, and children will be more re reluctant to conduct this type of test. And it is proved to be problematic for the uh, diabetes patient to heal from injury they obtain from their fingertips. And besides the restrictions of this type of enzyme is that the operating temperature for this type of sensor is below 44 Celsius and the pH for is between 2 to 8. And with the biological nature of the enzyme, this type of sensor will have a short shelf life. And other complications will include the complicated manufacturing uh, procedures such as enzyme purification and immobilizations. And as I mentioned earlier, the invasive method of finger pricking. So the objective of my research is to develop a non-invasive sensor without sacrificing any accuracy and efficiency. And the contribution if my research program is successful. The, uh, I will focus more on an environment-friendly method which utilizes a uh, mild organic uh, acid and a low processing temperature of uh, below 200 Celsius and a simple synthesis of the nanocomposite for the sensor which, uh, is, uh, which using an uh, easy setup only requiring an autoclave and a furnace and of course low cost. The second contribution will be to develop a more reliable and non-invasive sensor and the, finally, uh, the final contribution will be with using graphene as one of the main ingredients, uh, I'll be able to fulfill the aim set by the National Graphene Action Plan 2020, which was launched back in 2014, with the aim in enabling a local graphene ecosystem to accelerate the downstream adaptation. And this action plan is capable of generating around 20 billion of gross national income, or GNI, and around 9,000 jobs in 2020. Through the awareness uh, building, project execution, scale support and coordination and monitoring. So introduction for uh, my research, which is a non enzymic sensor. This type of sensor will generally exploit the electrochemical method which directly oxidizes glucose instead of enzyme detection. So this means that uh, the presence of enzyme can be completely eliminated. And this type of sensor will realize mostly on two factors. The first factor will be on efficiency. Uh, efficient electron transfer rate which is obtained by using graphene and the second uh, factor will be on excellent catalytic material which is achieved by using uh, nano powder methoxide. However, this type of sensor is not as common or not very available, available as its counterpart, the uh, enzymatic sensor. And the advantages for this our sensor is that with the elimination of the enzyme, it is no longer surrounding dependence and it is easier to manufacture because uh, by eliminating the enzyme immobilization or the enzyme purification, hence it will lead to a lower cost and higher detection limit, a longer shelf life and a better sensitivity uh, by depending or using the method or mechanism of direct glucose oxidation. So these are the invasive uh, examples of non-invasive DOIs and first of all, we can look at uh, the contact lens that was developed by Booker and Novartik uh, 
which utilizing tears as their medium for the glucose monitoring. And the second will be on the wearable wristband, which utilizing sweat as the medium. And finally, will be the glucose sensing tattoo printed on a uh, platform, which obviously using uh, saliva. And it should be pointed out that this type of uh, psychological or biological fluid can, although can, they can be obtained readily and non-invasively, but their glucose level is, is much uh, lower than blood. So this is why a more reliable and more accurate sensor is needed. So the mechanism for this type of sensor is that uh, below is an example of the glucose oxidation mechanism by the uh, oxide in the sodium hydroxide solution. So the first step will generally involve the oxide reacting with the hydroxide ion to produce the, uh, the compound. Then in, five, in step 2, the metal 3 plus ion will oxidize glucose to become glucose lactone and the M3 plus itself will reduce to M2 plus. And then finally the glucose lactone will hydro, uh, undergo hydrolysis to become gluconic acid. And factors to be considered for uh, material selection in my research is the cost, stability, electrical conductivity, and easy availability. And it should be pointed out that uh, in my research, uh, I try to avoid any uh, use of pressure metals such as uh, gold, platinum, iridium, because first of all, it is expensive. And second, it may suffer from performance drop if it is exposed to chloride salt solution. And the final uh, note is that it will also suffer from surface poisoning by interference agent such as ascorbic acid, dopamine, lactic acid, and even uric acid. So this is a, a simple table compiling all the uh, material and com comparison I made. So I can see the main using graphene. Uh, graphite is still cheaper than uh, other precious metals. So as I mentioned that uh, the main ingredient I'm using will be on a uh, graphene sheet. So graphene is actually an uh, ingredient uh, or the end product obtained from graphite uh, through exfoliation. And then the properties of graphene will include high, highly conductive, uh, paper like tin or one atom, one atom thickness, chemical stability, inertness, uh, high surface area, and the abundance. The second material we'll be focusing will be on uh, transitions metal oxide. Because it, it is highly believed that this type of metal will able to enhance the performance uh, through synergy effects or effects arises that outperform during engine usages. And besides, this type of metal is believed to uh, possess the ability to display various oxidation states that will aid in a redox reaction, which is oxidation and reduction that occur simultaneously during electrochemical uh, chemical reactions. So exam below is an example of uh, the standard reduction potential value. As you can see, CO2 plus uh, reduces to CO2. Uh, I mean, CO3 plus reduces to CO2 plus will occur at around positive 2.4 voltage, while CO2 plus to CO plus will be around positive 0 0.153 voltage. So this is the uh, scanning electron microscope uh, of my uh, research. And the bigger sheet will resemble a graphene sheet. So the smaller particles that are uh, decorated on top of the graphene sheet will be uh, one of uh, my the ingredients used, metoxide A and metoxide B. So the, uh, my research will be on the composite, on the full name will be uh, known as ternary metal oxide composite. And the very definition of composite will be the combination of two or more individual uh, elements. And we will be focusing more on the ternary rather than binary, because uh, it is believed that uh, ternary will be able to further improve the efficiency of the sensor based on the synergy catalytic uh, reaction and more flexible rules in tailoring properties for different uh, needs, but in complementing this advantage of each individual component and finally possible to create uh, new properties that a binary cannot achieve. So for the method uh, methodology or hydrothermal, uh, this synthesis method will be done in a slightly enclosed system or container which is known as a uh, autoclave. So the growth of the nano composite will depend on a slow yet highly pressurized surroundings, uh, similar as a non abrupt slow pressure cooker, as you can see from here. So the advantages for this uh, synthesis method will be, uh, first of course, environmental friendly due to the choice of our chemical is a mild organic, and the simple process and setup is generally uh, require only the uh, autoclave and a furnace. The low process temperature of below 200 and finally, the high yield. So, uh, to wrap up my uh, research, 
with graphene being used as one of the main ingredients, we will be able to fulfill uh, the aim set by the National Graphene Action Plan 2020. And the second uh, conclusion will be to emphasize on the more environmental friendliness and a simple thing, on the simple safe method. And finally, a uh, reliable sensor based on the non invasive monitoring method. So uh, this is a link and reference. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will ask the second question. So, Dr. Kwan will start. Have you looked at the repetitive measures of the experiment? What is the idea of the standard error? And if there is any problems of reproducibility in your work? You mean uh, the result, is it? Yes, correct. Yes, currently, uh, because my research is conducting, uh, not yet finished, or conducting halfway, yeah, we are not yet uh, I encountered this reproducibility problem. But as I've uh, done a few tests, the we uh, we I'm using a few different electrode on uh, the sensor. The but the result produced is quite familiar, uh, similar. Any ideal percent of standard error? Uh, standard error have not yet obtained okay, yet because I have not yet finalized. Okay, thank you. Can we go back to your slide on the material selection? Material selection. I think you said the choice, um, when you compare the cost between uh, graphite uh, uh -huh. yeah, and the other um, uh, metals. So, okay, that's the starting theory, right, graphite? Yeah, yeah, this is the starting theory. But you still have to convert that to graphene. Yeah. So have you considered the cost of actually the conversion of um, graphite to graphene? That might not be so, you know, cost uh, efficient. Because, um, as far as I know, by converting uh, graphite to graphene and to finding the product I want, it really not require too much uh, step, which only uh, using only one chemical, uh, and then put inside the autoclave and the uh, furnace. And the temperature will be around 200, uh, below 200. So I don't think the cost will be uh, much, uh, increase much significant high. Yes, but... Uh Okay, am I allowed this question? You said we cannot, yeah, we cannot have repeat questions. So you are saved. <laughs> you are saved. <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you very much. So, our contestant, you are very safe this year because only two questions allowed. <laughs> All right. So now. Uh, please allow me to in yes. invite Ms. Chiranan Kutswan Nupai Rode. If I'm no, sorry, Nupai Road. All right. So she's from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Okay. You All right. Before you can start your presentation, let me introduce you a bit. Ms. Chiranan Kutswan obtained her. Bachelor Engineering in Mechanical Engineering from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Currently, she is pursuing her study in Masters of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the same university. She is actively involved in collaborated work with Kyushu University, Japan on giant training in advanced material research funded by Fundamental Research Grant Scheme. Okay, you may start now. A very good morning to the esteemed judges, fellow participants, and everyone who is present today. Uh, I am Chirana Kutsuwan, and today I'm going to share and unveil the beauty things, the beauties, uh, the beauty of small things that actually give a big difference, particularly in the pool of materials. So let me take you to my 15-minute journey on the green refinement hardening while little things matter. So we sometimes underestimate the influence of small things. But today, I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you how this little minute things can actually give a big impact in our life. Okay. Uh, in material, grain size replace a great deal. So we know that when the, solid, when the metal solidifies from the molten state, uh, there are millions of tiny crystals start to grow and these crystals form the grains in solid metals 
and each grade is distinct metal with its own orientation. So green refinement hardening is a technique to increase uh, the strength of the material by changing the average size into the smaller size, which is per can produce more green boundaries. The green boundaries is actually the interface between the two grains and it acts as a blockage to the dislocation motions. And um, so we, you need more stress, uh, more stress to move the dislocation and thus making the material more stronger. So let me in simplify it. Uh, try to put yourself on a highway and uh, the worst nightmare for each, each driver is the traffic jam. And you need to uh, imagine that there are so many tools like KL and this uh, for my for my case is the grain boundaries and you need uh, and this somehow triggers a certain amount of stress among the driver making the drivers stronger angry right okay uh, ladies and gentlemen this is the famous material tetrahedron which correlates the material's performance processing properties and structures so we know that if you want to enhance the performance of the materials we can play around with the mechanical properties by manipulating the microstructures of the materials. And in order to change microstructures of materials, sorry, microstructure, microstructure of material, we have to improve the processing technique. And this is where the new methods comes in, uh, known as the sewer plastic deformation. So sewer plastic deformation, as known as SPD, is a effective metal forming process in which a giant plastic strain uh, is imposed on the material to produce an ultrafine grain metals that can actually improve the mechanical properties of the materials. And the materials that uh, uh, the materials that the SPD process makes materials have a grain size between uh, 50 to 1,000 nanometer. It's very small. And the beauty of SPD technique is that the high strain is a on the material without changing the um, dimensions on the workpiece. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, when you talk about the fine grain, you cannot avoid uh, formulating them for, with whole patch relations. So, as we can see from these equations, if you uh, if the strength of the the materials is increased, is because by the grain diameter is reduced, but to what size? To reduce to what size? So it can be described from this graph, according to whole pack stretching limit graph, at the early stage, the if the grain size is getting smaller, the strength is increased. But once the grain size reaches about 10 nanometer, the, the graph become reversed. The grain boundary start to slide and uh, the grain body start to slide and the materials start to soften instead of further strengthening. So our aim is to reduce the size of the grain into the optimal size, which is to the peak of the yield strength. All right, uh, I'm gonna introduce to you a few sewer plastic deformation technique. Firstly, is the equal channel angular pressing, which is a billet is pressed through the 90 degree channel uh, the high pressure sliding, as, you sh as shown here, the plunger has two grooves on the upper and the lower. So the, the, the a lot will apply on this plunger, and the plunger will push from one side to another side to introduce the shear strain on the materials. And this is accumulative roll bonding, where the two sheets of the same materials will be stacked, rolled, heated and bone together and this material is cut into half and the two halves is stack again and it's the the process is repeated for several times. And this is the high pressure torsions where I'm doing which is the technique that I use for my research. Alright? So HPT is a promising technique where it can produce uh out of our grains and with better mechanical properties compared to the other technique. Not only that, HPT is also able to uh, apply to many materials, including the breather materials and the composite. 
or I'm going to show you how this works. All right. Uh, uh, this this is the material. It's a very small material, 30 millimeter material. It is then placed between the anvils, upper anvil and lower anvil, and ready to be sprayed. Uh, the lower, the upper anvil will be uh, pressed down with a large compressive stress, and the lower anvil will rotate it. Will be rotated to uh, create the torsional forces to the material. And for your information, these HPT machines weigh 500 tons. So you can imagine it's like 500 cars compressing on your material in order to produce out of fine grains. All right, this is the past report of HPT. Uh, um, so, as you can see here, most of the past researchers, they use small samples, uh, small samples from, from many, from different materials, uh, as big as 10 millimeter, and the result showing that the hardness increasing and the grain refining occur. But uh, we have took up the challenge so in my research, I'm using 30 millimeter uh, sample, sample, which is bigger than the previous studies, and we opt for aluminum alloy 6061, which, uh, which mainly used in automotive industry due to its excellent mechanical properties, including the good workability, lightweight, and most importantly, high resistance to corrosions and high thermal conductivity. All right, uh, this is the analyze, uh, analysis that we use for to, to check the performance of the sample after the HPT process. So uh, firstly is the optical microscopy and transmission ethermoscopy to observe the evolution of microstructures, uh, the weakest microhardness to investigate the hardness of material and the tensile test to investigate the tensile strength of the material. All right, as for the result, so as you can see here, all the sample before the HPD have to solution treated first to dissolve all the alloy elements in the, in the solid solution in aluminum. And after that, as you can see here, before the HPT, the microstructures involved are about 75 to 80 microns. But and can be clearly viewed under the typical optical microscopy. But after that, after HPT, we have no choice to it, utilize the transmission, uh, transmission electron microscopy to observe the new sizes after HPT. And we use uh, pressure 4 gigapascal with a fixed speed of 0 0.2 revolution per minute with only one turn of HPT. And as you can see here, the size have been reduced from 79.6 micron to 800 nanometer at the center of this and 200 nanometer at the edge of this. Okay. So as for the hardness, as you can see here, the weakest micro hardness increased from the 60 to 172 HV before it reached the saturation level and yeah, it's it's very big change, okay. And next is the tensile result, which uh, conducted in the same specimen with three location, which is at four millimeter, eight millimeter, and twelve millimeter. All right. So we can see that from the solution treated, which is the before HPT uh, sample, the the, we managed to increase the yield strength by 220%, the tensile strength increased by 200%, and the fracture strength increased by 275% by only one turn. So, it's, how cool is that? But within a few minutes of HPT process, we actually managed to uh, increase, uh, obtain these um, outstanding mechanical properties. And okay, for my, uh, for most SPD enthusiasts, we, uh, for most SPD enthusiasts, we like, we, we are um, mainly focused on applying this technique to 
uh, for for industry that involve lightweight and uh, strong applications. So for my case, uh, I'm going to use for uh, automotive industry. So let us, let us look to the car piston. So car piston has to be strong and lightweight so that it can uh, has to be strong enough to actually transfer force and has to be lightweight to in reduce the weight of the counterbalance and also reduce the engine because less force acting on the engine plus less weight acting on the transmission and less initial to overcome. So in conclusion, as the measures show, uh, the silver plastic deformations, mainly high pressure torsions can actually increase the strength of their materials by uh, by gray refinement hardening which can improve the material mechanical properties and it has exhibited the high strength and it increased the hardness. For the piston engine, uh, it can, by, by HPT process, it can uh, produce strong and light piston speed which can lead to high crank speed, lightweight engine, high compression ratio and low fuel consumption. So, uh, as for that, we are focusing. HPT is still ongoing and developing to actually uh, to actually produce a real application like this. So we hope that one day that HPT can be uh, commercialized and uh, for mass production. So uh, for that, thank you. Uh, so well, I want to emphasize this. Sometimes the smallest thing in life can actually give a biggest meaning in uh, can give a biggest meaning and impacts our life. Thank you. So we hope this is not a question, this is a comment. So we hope that your material will be used for the third Malaysian car project. Thank you. Right. So, so Mr. Kang, will you do the honor? Uh, you see, because the experimental that you are dealing with very small pipe, yeah. what you see the main hurdles in order to have mass production uh, in, in this development? Actually, this is space study, so we are uh, using the uh, Malaysian Institute of Technology Thank you very much, Ms. Chiranan.
All right. Now we proceed to our seventh uh, contestant, Mr. Brian Moichi Ho from Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation. He will present a silicon based quantum dot as qubit. Uh, he's currently pursuing his study in master program in this university in research of quantum dot. Quantum dot. You may start your presentation now, sir. Okay. Good day, everyone. Most of us have been utilizing computers lately, but specifically for research purposes, as it is one of the most economical way in developing a product. But, however, the computer of today will take few hours or even days before we can actually get out an output. And this can be solved using the computer of tomorrow, which is to be in today's presentation, a silicon-based quantum dot as a qubit. Now, there are many ways of which a quantum computer can make, but specifically, we will focus on a silicon-based type. And this is because it will be one of the easiest methods that can be used. Now, a quantum dot is actually made by materials available to us in states such as the conductor, the semiconductor, and the insulator. Now, the differences between these three states can be observed by its energy band diagram, which as what we can see here is that it is categorized under three categories such as the valence band, the conduction band, and also as the Fermi level. Now, the special part about conductor is that for the valence band and the conduction band, they are both interconnected with each other, allowing electrons to jump through freely even with the smallest amount of energy excited to it. But as for sem semiconductor and insulator, there is a difference as there is a gap introduced between the valence band and the conduction band. Henceforth, a slightly amount of energy is not enough. Thus, there will be a region which they will have to bridge before the electron is allowed to be excited. Now, as of this, we have three categories here. And in this presentation, our main focus is going to be towards the conduction band, as it will be much simpler in understanding how quantum dot actually works. So, if that's the case, let us actually see what materials are we going to use in making ourselves a quantum dot. Which for conductor we will be using aluminium, whereas as for semiconductor, we will be using silicon, and as for our insulator, we will be using silicon oxide. So now we actually know that what materials will be used, but why these materials is because of our current technology. We are basically using a standard metal oxide semiconductor, which is made out of silicon, ohmic contacts, which form the source and the drain. We have the silicon oxide and as well as the aluminium gate. Now, how does this classical transistor actually work? It is basically by when voltage is being applied to the aluminium gate, as what you can see here, is that when voltage applies, the electron is stopped underneath the metal oxide. Sorry, underneath the aluminium gate. And if we observe the conduction band, we can see from initially it was having a bump in the middle, and now there is no bump. So this allows electrons to flow by, and current is capable of being flowing. But what happens when the electricity is being removed from the aluminium gate? We can see that the bump form is reformed, and electron is not being able to flow. So, what is the main problem here is that for a quantum computer to come up, we have to use quantum dots. And quantum dots here is made out of a structure somewhat like this, which the problem appears as people like us today, we demand for a computer which requires more power. And as more power is demanded, the size of a computer could not be increased, as who wants a phone who wants a computer weighing 5 kilos? Nobody wants that anymore these days. So what we do is that we reduce the size of the channel of the transistor. And by doing so, there will be leakage coming out from the source and the drain. And this leakage will lead to electrons being attracted beneath the gate, forming a bridge by itself without applying any source towards the aluminium gate. And this is basically like a faulty switch where it doesn't want it to happen, it happens. Now, 
Some say these phones, cleaners may happen at 5 nanometer size. Some say at 2 nanometer or even 1 nanometer. The future is still not in our hands of predicting when the size is going to be our limit. But all we know that as of today, we are at 7 nanometer size and we know that the aim is near. And when it happens, we have a solution ongoing to counter up this problem. So, the main difference between a classical transistor and a quantum dot will be of the number of gates. As you can see that, for a classical transistor, we only have a single aluminium gate. Whereas, for a quantum dot, we have three aluminium gates. And as you can see here, because of the gate difference, we have a difference in this conduction band. Now, that is why we actually have to look on the conduction band side as it will improve our understanding. So, since we know that a quantum dot the differences will be only of the aluminium gates, now let us actually observe how do we actually create our quantum dot. Now, it, is, it consumes only five standard fabrication process, which we can observe by step one, we get ourselves a silicon wafer, which will form the base of where everything will be stacked on. And then we proceed to step two, which is doping ourselves with two N plus orbit contacts, which forms the source and the drain. Once that is complete, we proceed to step three, which is by forming the silicon oxide, which is to insulate the silicon wafer and the orbit contacts for our next step, step four, the placement of the aluminium gate. Now, this aluminium gate is placed by electron beam lithography through evaporation of aluminium. Now, since we have three aluminium gates, as what we saw initially, the first gate will be placed on and oxidized, followed by the second gate and also oxidized, and the third gate and oxidized. Now, all of these three gates are basically separated from each other. They are not interlinked. Thus, therefore, why we actually place it and we oxidize it. So once all the placement is done, we proceed on to step 5, which is the final step, the baking. At this baking stage, is basically the annealing stage where we bake this product in formation of all the materials to bond to each other and as well to limit out the current discharge between the silicon-silicon interface. So if you actually slice out this product, what we actually see inside is how much is how we actually bake it. Where we have the silicon, the silicon oxide, the ohmic contacts, the aluminium, and the aluminium oxide. So how does this product actually work? Now, it works fairly the same as how a classical transistor is, where it is doped with electrons, and if you supply voltage towards all the gate, we can see that a bridge is formed, similar as how initially it was. But there is a difference in terms of the electrons arrangement. It is no longer a straight line from all across the ray. And this is because of the formation of the gate, which separates them out in terms of region. So, if you look at the con if you want to look at it, what electrons are formed beneath G3 is basically the dot. It's where the dot is going to be. Whereas G2 will be the electrons reservoirs. So if you want to look at the conduction band, how it actually is, it will be somewhat like this, having two bumps, two mountain peaks. And if you want to fill this electro this conduction band with electrons, what we will see is somewhat like this. But as this is a quantum dot, this is the initial state of what it actually is to be. We would like to take it to a step further into forming a qubit. So how do we actually attain a qubit? Is by adjusting the voltage at G3 until the last electron is achieved. Now, from there on, once the electron is achieved at beneath G3, that is what we call a qubit, as we are capable of controlling its spin, the spin state of spin up and spin down. So, having a single qubit won't actually mean anything to us, so we'll take it a step further and make it two qubits in a single transistor, where we actually speed up even more the gates. From three gates, now we have five gates. And that is how we get ourselves a quantum bit. So, to understand how a quantum bit works, let's go back towards how a classical bit actually works. A classical bit is basically in computers which are forming being used today. It's either in a one or a zero. It can be both state at the same time. Computer of today runs in a series operation, 
where it does one thing, it completes, it stops, it follows up with the next thing, and it starts again. But for a quantum bit, it's slightly different. Because of laws of physics, it harnesses the superpositioning theory, allowing it to be one and zero at the same time, which means that it runs in parallel as compared to how a classical bit operates. So, if that's the case, if you want to have a computer with quantum bits, it would basically make computers of today look slower as it runs in series. Who likes to go faster here? Who likes to have a better computer and a super price? Let's see some hands. Yes, gamers. <laughs> okay. So, with computers running at qubits, let's say we were to simulate 250 molecules, say medication purpose. The time taken for a classical computer would take up to 120 hours. Whereas, for a quantum computer, it may take only up to 5 hours. And this time for a quantum computer is very subjected to a number of qubits. The more qubits you have, the faster it becomes. And this will basically impact us on terms of medication-wise, where you can create medicine specifically for individuals rather than a bunch of lots and everybody gets it. Apart from that, quantum computer will also impact us on cyber security. As, again, quantum computer is empowered by quantum dots, which enhance the power of superpositing state as it can be 1 and 0 at the same time. Henceforth, if you want to hack a computer, you have to hack on quantum physics first. And this will also benefit us in terms of the economy, where we can actually simulate the economy in wondering whether will the project be actually beneficial or not based on current data. But this is all just small talk. So let us actually observe the actual real thing which is happening to us. This is one thing I researched on Google. Just the title, and we have this time frame here. Now, we can see that as time goes on, more and more data in form of information are onto the server in Google. And more and more users like us are being used, are using a search engine. And as the time goes on, the time frame actually gets longer. As you can see, 0 0.63 seconds today. Tomorrow, maybe a second. And maybe 10 years later, 5 seconds. And to solve this data searching, Google is actually one of our players who is actually investing in quantum computer. Thank you. My name is Mike. Uh, thanks very much. A uh, very uh, captivating uh, performance. Uh, almost cinema, like the cinema already. The font is coming out. <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, I just want to know. It's. I mean, topic is interesting, but uh, what have you done on your personal effort in developing this technology? What are the tests that you've done? Whether it's programming or if it's actually a physical experiment. What have you actually conducted to this end? Okay. For my part of the project, is basically this is just an introduction. For my part, it's much more deeper towards solving the mystery of quantum dots. We, from the graph which you initially saw, here, they are apparently, it's not like this. They are actually another two more bumps on the top here. And that what is the mystery of why is it actually happening there. There is an unintentional dot which disrupts the system at the moment. But it doesn't disrupt until you cannot use it, it's just that Maybe out of 100%, 2% is error. That is my part. Your presentation is like um, the stuff that you know Hollywood science fiction yeah, is made yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. You're going to make faster and it be done in the blinking of an eye. After this, you know, old people like me cannot use the computers because before I could blink an eye, and all the information will be out. So have you considered the, um, the, the, the interaction, you know, the cybernetics of all these um, youngies who's going to interact with this computer? Okay. What, what is the limit of the, uh, how do you say, it, speed of um, uh, processing data? Well, that question has a very interesting answer, actually. There is no limit to how you use it. <laughs> if you actually want it to be slower, 
I believe that you won't get yourself a quantum computer. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Brian. Right. I'm sure Miss Sarah Sija Aril Falakan is now ready. She is from University of Science Malaysia. Uh, Miss Sarah Sija received her Bachelor of Applied Science. Geoscience with honors from University of Malaysia Kelantan in 2016. Her final year undergraduate project was spent on the study of distribution of toxic elements around Kampung Damar Kuala Krai Kelantan, which has triggered her curiosity on environmental related issues. She is currently pursuing Master in Material Engineering at USM as she found her interest on this uh, field. Now, the stage is yours. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So, my topic for today is about nanoparticles modify electrode for heavy metal sensor. My name is Sarah Sijari Valgan from University of Science Malaysia. So, before I look into this topic, let us go into the outline first. This is, I'll brief you regarding the big picture and then related to my project and then to the future studies. Sungai King King. Who knows about this? Yeah. Raise up your hand. So, can you please share with me what do you know about this? Uh, so, there was a spillage, chemical spillage, mm -hmm. and then the government said that it was methane poisoning. Uh -huh. When methane poisoning, don't do those kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So, basically, it is chemical poisoning that the government is trying to cover up. Yeah. Okay. So, the methane poisoning is for the atmosphere, am I right? Uh, no marks for that. <laughs> so, yes, it is due to the chemical waste that was dumped in this river. So, what kind of chemical waste is it? It consists of heavy metal used to dissolve the metal at a scrapyard. So, now we know the seriousness of this heavy metal contamination in rivers and in the environment especially because it has caused thousands of people seeking for treatment in hospitals. Here. Next, do you know how safe is our food? How safe is it? Because rivers are being contaminated by industrial activities. Let me um, just give an introduction on it. Um, not all the rivers are contaminated, but some of the rivers, some of the rivers does contain heavy metal pollution due to the industrial activity that's going on in Malaysia. But the seriousness is in, most serious issue is in India, Bangladesh, and also China. This issue, this issue is very serious because it caused a lot of health issues. So let, let's look into the statistics. In a way, how much heavy metals are, you, are we consuming? Let's say we, we go for this tuna fish. This amount of heavy metals that we are getting in, accumulated in our body. So it already exceeds the permissible limit set by the authorities. <laughs> Seriousness of heavy metals. What is it going to cost? We are going to, uh, the problem with this heavy metal is that what it, it's, we, are take, we are taking, consume this heavy metals, the problem is that once it accumulates in our body, there's no way for it to, to be removed by human waste. So it's going to accumulate in the human organs causing various health issues such as lung cancer, kidney diseases, bronchitis, dermatitis, and there are many more. So, limitation of the current technology to detect these heavy metals. Currently, they are using inductive coupled plasma and also atomic absorption spectroscopy widely to detect the heavy metals in the environment. But the problem with this too is that it is, we have to bring back the samples back to the laboratory, we have to dilute the samples prior to analysis. This is not only tedious, but it's also time consuming. So, we, from UMC, University of Science Malaysia, we are doing some preliminary studies on simple detection kit by using electrochemical techniques. Why is this, why is this better compared to the previous techniques that was used? Because most importantly, this is can be used for in situ measurements. That means it is not time consuming, it won't be tedious, there won't be any sample prepared.
preparation for it. We can do it on site. And this is the typical electrochemical cell setup where it has reference electrode, working electrode, and a counter electrode. And reference electrode, it works to measure the potential of the working electrode. And then the counter electrode works to allow the currents to flow between the working electrode and the counter electrode. And it is connected to the potential start and then to the computer to display the curve. The choice of material for working electrodes. From these three electrodes, the working electrode is of high importance because that is where the redox reaction is going to take place. We are talking about electrochemistry. So that it involves <coughs> reduction and oxidation process. So currently, previously, mercury-based electrode was used. But the problem with this mercury-based electrode is that they are highly toxic. So in order to substitute that, bismuth-based electrode was used. Bulk bismuth was used. But bulk bismuth, bus, bulk bismuth, they have small surface area. Talking about surface area, I will give a simple example. Let's say we have a 10, gra 10 gram of cubic sugar and fine sugars, 10 gram as well. Which one is going to dissolve in water first? Anyone? Which one is going to dissolve in water? Why is it? Yes, smaller surface. That means more surface you get to contact with the water molecules. That is why small surface area is of high importance because it's going to give high sensitivity because more heavy metals are going to accumulate on the electro surface. More redox fractions are going to take place. But there is one problem with nanoparticles. It tends to agglomerate to each other. So in order to combat that issue, we are, we are introducing three amino profile triethoxidate, actase, to act as the linker between the substrate electrode and the bismuth nanoparticles, mm -hmm. thus producing bismuth nanoparticles at this functionalized green printed electron. This is the schematic diagram of screen printed electron that uh, I've shown to the judges. And also, it is just a small chip. This is um, compared to the previously shown electrochemical setup, which has three electrodes. All the three electrodes are contained in this single chip. Here you can see the counter electrode, reference electrode, and the working electrode in the middle. So how we design this is that from the working electrode, from the working electrode, we deposit the aptis first, and then the bismuth nanoparticles. Here is the structure of a taste. Cylind will, the cylind group will be attached to the carbon electrode. The carbon here, the working electrode is made up of carbon. And then the amine group is where the bismuth nanoparticles is going to bind. So the working from this principle, how is it works? Once it is connected to the potential side and then to the workstation, it produces a curve, um, current versus potential. From here, we can determine the unique metal and the metal concentration from the peak current and also the peak potential. This is an example of individual detection. There is another one for simultaneous detection. Exactly what is happening in the working electron. Let's find out. So there are two steps occurs. One is the pre-concentration step and the other one is the striving step. In the pre-concentration step, we are supplying negative potential to it. When negative potential is supplied, cathodic reaction is going to take place where the metal ions are reduced to become metal and it is just deposited on the working electron. Next, striping step, oxidation is going to take place whereby we, are, we supply the positive potential. The accumulated metals are going to undergo oxidation and they are they release electron to become ions back. So the, from the electron, the metal ions will be spread off. Thus producing the graph as shown here. The current is actually measured after the striping because at oxidation, uh, oxidation occurs up on the striping step. So the technical information of the sensor. Here, the bismuth nanoparticles are synthesized with different hydrothermal reaction period 
And from here we can see that six, seven, and eight hours are used for further investigation because it has produced bismuth nanoparticles. And from the image here, you can see that it has produced nanoflakes. And the part, when the particle size was calculated, it showed that at seven hours it produces the smallest particle size, like the thickness. So the functionalization of the electron with that phase. When this was studied by using cyclic voltammetry, it was found that at 5% attest, comparing this with the bare SPE, screen printer electron, it has produced highest current, which shows the conductivity of, of the modified electron as 5% attest is higher compared to the 7 and 9. And this is even supported with effective surface area calculated, which shows that as 5% attest, it has high surface area. And this is an image of, of the SEM for 5% FTS. Next, the bismuth nanoparticles is modified with screen printed electron. And from here, the, when the cyclic voltammetry test was done, it shows that at 6, 7, and 8 hours, the 8 hours produced bismuth nanoparticles has highest conductivity compared to 6 and 7. But when the effective surface area was calculated, it showed that at 7 percent, sorry, at 7 hours produced bismuth nanoparticles, it has high surface area. For, in order for us to produce the, elect, to produce the sensor, the effective surface area is of high importance because it is going to give the sensitivity. So, the, in this case, the seven percent produced, sorry, the, the bismuth nanoparticles produced at seven hours are considered for the uh, modification of the electron. Next, the sensitivity and the detection limit was calculated by using random subject equation. And from here we can see that it has produced high sensitivity compared to the previous study done. And the limit of detection, detect, detection for this work below the permissible limit set by the Environmental Protection Agency. It shows that it has good, uh, good limit of detection. The selectivity test was done, and by here, multi-element standard solution was used to check whether lead and cadmium, are only lead and cadmium can be detected or not. And from here, we can see that only two peaks are produced for Cadmium and lead, which shows it has, it has good specificity. The working, the modified electron has good specificity towards lead and cadmium. And as a conclusion, a good sensor of bismuth nanoparticles deposited on Aptis functionalized screen printer electron was produced with good sensitivity and selectivity, with limit or detection of 2.3 and 4.1 for lead parts per billion for lead and cadmium, respectively. And for future studies, the mechanism of Aptis as a linker on bismuth nanoparticles are not widely been studied yet. Previously, they have studied for gold nanoparticles, but for bismuth nanoparticles, to the best of my, my knowledge, the, the, it was not established yet. So the studies on this needed to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, very informative as well. Um, have Have you looked at? I mean, can you elaborate on the details of the modification you did on the sensor? Modification. Um, okay. At first, on the working electrode, what we did is that uh, we actually, because it has contained the counter electrode and also the reference electrode. At first. We have to uh, cover that surface of the reference electrode and counter electrode, and then we soak it in aptase concentration, a different amount of aptase. I have a slide here. Different amounts of aptase. Um, after the country. So, um, uh, 
different amount of additives, and from there, we, we did cyclic voltammetry test um, to determine which additive concentration is optimum to produce uh, the modified electrode. And then after that, we use the 5% aptase to modify it with bismuth nanoparticles um, with different reaction period. The, the bismuth nanoparticles was produced by hydrothermal reaction period at different hours. So we determined which bismuth nanoparticles to be used. And we, and we found the optimum was seven, per, 7 hours. And we deposit it, the bismuth nanoparticles on top of 5% aptase, 7 hours groups. And then yeah. Very good. Uh, any questions? How is uh, sensor can be implemented as an in situ permanent early warning system? Early warning system. Early warning system. Uh, the pollution of the river. Elemental pollution. Okay. As I said earlier, preliminary studies are being conducted in this as well. If on this, because this is a very recent um, finding in, in University Science Malaysia, and um, they are still, because what I have presented here today is just a progress of it. They are still uh, testing needed to be done for application in real water samples and reproduci reproducibility of the electrode and also the stability of the electrode. So, um, in order for in situ monitoring, it can be used by online application as well. There are uh, researches done on it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sarah Sija Arifa Lakan. Now, I uh, will proceed to the junior of Ms. Sarah Sija from UMK, uh, Ms. Siti Hajar Zaid Amri. Miss Siti Hajar Binti Zain Amri was born in Seremban on uh, 1997. She received her early education at Sekolah Pasan Taman Sri Pagi then continued to Sri Putri Science School, Kuala Lumpur for secondary education. She is Dean Lee student at, of Faculty Bioengineering and Technology for every semester. Congratulations. She is an active student in university and has joined a few debate competitions such as Debat Belia 2018 held in UKM and also Debat A-Star in University of Malaya. And now, all the best. Thank you. All right, thank you to the MC. Okay, good afternoon. I bet to the judges, VIPs and our fellow friends, members of the club. Okay, since I'm the second last to present for this morning session, I bet everyone here is hungry already and sleepy. Some of them were sleeping at the back there, I saw that. <laughs> but please bear with me for the next 15 minutes because I'm going to give a lecture on two-step solvent evaporation, a cost-effective preparation of polyperiodosomes in biomaterials technology. Before I proceed, my name is Siti Hajar Mbiti Zaid Amri. I am from Faculty of Bioengineering and Technology, University of Malaysia, Kelantan. So, before I go further in this today's lecture, let's go through one by one on the lecture outline. For the first thing, I will explain to you what is holopolidosomes, and next I will talk about preparation methods on how to prepare the holopolidosomes. Next, I will go in details on preparation of polyhydroxybutyrate as the polymer, and then I will talk about results and findings, as well as contribution to disciplines, or we can call it application of the holopolidosomes, and the next I will conclude everything in the summary part. And then let's go through the first uh, phase, the first chapter of this lecture, which is what is microcapsule? Before I explain to you what is holocrodosomes, let's take a look at what is microcapsules. So uh, anyone here know what is microcapsules? I, I'm pretty sure everyone's here had taken the capsule before, but just imagine a capsule that you've taken before in much smaller in size. How, what small, how small it is. We're talking about micro scale size, which basically the micro capsules range size is from 0 0.2 micrometer up to 5,000 micrometer. So micro capsule is basically a sphere with a core materials inside and and the core materials inside is being enclosed by the 
essential materials at the outer layer. So encapsulation can be in form of this one or it can be also in form of this one or what we call as holocolidosomes. So what are the difference between the holocolidosomes and the one that I shown before? It is uh, it differs between the shell materials because in holocolidosomes the shell materials is actually made up from the colloidal particles. So basically the colloidal particles made up as the shell materials it includes the coal materials inside where the coal materials inside usually we're using active ingredients for delivery for purposes for encapsulation purposes so i'm just explaining on holocolidosomes now let's take a look at preparation methods there are several ways on how we can prepare the holocolidosomes so in my lecture for today i will talk on the first part first uh part which is uh, Pickering emulsion method. Pickering emulsion method is a method where the emulsion is stabilized by solid particles. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at this diagram. It is quite complicated, can't you see? Isn't it? It's quite complicated, isn't it? it yes, it consists of many steps here. So, in, I bet in your mind, say like, oh my god, this is so hard to difficult. What a difficult way to produce a holocolidism. So let's take a look at this upper part of this diagram. It is actually to prepare the solid particles where the solid particles is synthesized. And after we synthesize the solid particles, we redisperse it in water to create the water phase, mix it with oil phase, homogenize it at a high speed rate, and then undergo the rotary evaporator. Only then we can obtain our holocolidism. Let's go to the second method, which is layer by layer. So layer by layer is quite complicated way on preparing the holocolidosomes. Layer by layer, in general, is involving the absorption of anionic and cationic polyelectrolyte deposited on a top template. So after the layer template, a solid microparticles is used to reinforce the layer template. And then after that, more layering is done to bind and hold the solid microparticles together. And then after that, at the end of the process, we have to remove the template, either by calcination or dissolution in organic solvent. Why do we have to remove the template? So that we can remove the core of the colloidosomes, make it a holocolidosome. Because that's what we all talking about, about holocolidosomes. So, I've done talk about two methods before, which is pickering emulsion and also the layer by layer methods. So now let's take a look at the drawbacks of these two methods, which is the first method is pickering emulsion. As I shown before the diagram, it's obvious, pretty obvious that we can conclude it has many steps involved to produce the holocolidosomes. As many steps involved, it is a time-consuming method. Same goes as well as layer by layer, where the time consume it consume time because it has too many steps also, and it is quite complicated because we have more layering done to hold and bind the solid microparticles, and then it is wasteful of materials. Why I say so? Because at the end of the process, we have to remove the template, and then it is a wasteful of materials. So how to encounter these problems? So we people want it to be fast. Want to one have to be fast things, we want cheap things, we want a simpler things. So let me introduce you to the next one, which is two steps, solvent evaporation method. This is the highlight of my, my lectures for today, which is, can you differentiate this method, this diagram, between the diagram, this one, and the previous one? This, is, this one shows a simpler diagram, isn't it? Yeah. So, let me... Uh, introduce to you the two steps of an evaporation method. The first step is we prepare water phase and oil phase, homogenize it using a homogenizer at a high speed rate, and then we create an emulsion. However, the way we introduce the oil phase into the water phase is by feeding process. What is by feeding process? Feeding process is basically we injecting the oil phase into the water phase by using the syringe pump. For what? To get a fixed rate of injection and then after we homogenize it we get emulsions we undergo rotary evaporator and boom we got the holocolidosomes this method is simple fast cheap and boom the results are right there and then so <laughs> so let's go in details on the preparation of polyhydroxybutyrate as the polymer to uh, produce holocolidosomes 
regular nozzles for your two-stop solvent evaporation method. The first thing is we prepare the oil phase where we dissolve the polyhydroxybutyrate into the chloroform solution and then we prepare the water phase where we're using polyvinyl alcohol, we dissolve it in water, we homogenize it at high speed rate by feeding process which is we inject oil phase into the water phase by syringe pump, we create it in emulsion and then the emulsions we undergo the rotary evaporator to eliminate the oil phase solvent and then we obtain the holocolidosomes. The holocolidosomes we obtain, we did the characterization task which is by using optical microscope and also by scanning electron microscope. But in this lecture, I will focus more on scanning electron microscope. Why? Because scanning electron microscope give, offers a better resolution in terms of morphology. Now let's take a look at the results. This one, the first set is PHP PVA at 1.2 with percent of PVA concentration. Please note that all these results we varies the concentration surfactant. Concentration of surfactant. In this case, it is PVA concentration. As we take a look at B, uh, we can see in the morphology surface, it it offers high porosity. So let's take a look at the second set, which is PHP PVA at slightly lower, which is 0.5% of PVA concentration. And then we take a look at D, it offers less porosity compared to the first one. When uh, so the higher concentration of surfactant actually offers higher porosity in terms of the morphology. Now let's take a look at the third set, which is the third set. We're using the different biomaterials where we use the polycat prolactin. Polycat prolactin, PVA at 1.28% of PVA concentration. Basically, the third one is we compare it to the first one, which is at the same concentration of surfactant. What we can observe is at F, it is actually we can reproduce a smooth surface of colloidosomes. Where we can see it is smooth surface and compared to this, it has lower porosity compared to the first one, which is where we're using the PHB PVA. So, now, let's take a look. How does the colloidosome form? How is this form? So, uh, I I explained just now about two sub solvent evaporation method. So what happened during uh, the solvent evaporation method is I explained just now about the bifeeding process. During the bifeeding process, it's actually the one that we fed first, that we've been fed first, the injected first, it will become a small emulsion particles as it evaporates. And then the letter, we injected the letter one that been fed, it does not have much, uh, much time to evaporate. So it will become a larger emulsion size. So what happened, what actually happened is a small particle, no, the small uh, emulsion, I'm sorry, the small emulsion size will adhere to the large emulsion size where because due to the hydrophobicity because we homogenize it and then we count emulsion. So basically the small one will adhere to the large one due to the hydrophobic CT. And then after we undergo the rotary evaporator to remove the solvent here, and then we will get the holocolidosome. This is the basically the uh, how colloidosome is supposed to be. So I bet everyone's here wondering what is the application? Why do we need to uh, prepare the holocolidosome? So, in the beginning of the lecture, I said something about microcapsules and encapsulation. So basically, the first contribution, the first application of this holocolidosomes is the delivery of active ingredients. However, to emphasize the delivery of active ingredients, basically, holocolidosomes give us properties of control release. We can control the release of bioactive molecules or the active ingredients inside the core of materials. So it can be used in medical uh, field, which is for drug delivery system. It can be used in fragrances, cosmeceutical, and also the agriculture field. And the second one is tissue engineering for scaffolding. What is scaffolding? What it does? And why do we need scaffolds? Scaffolds is basically uh, it minus our extracellular matrix and then it helps in regeneration of tissue. It helps in the growth of tissue. So, the main criteria
criteria of this scaffold is it needs to be highly porous. So, so the, when we talk about highly porous, now let's take a look. This one, we have a smooth surface of uh, holocolidosomes. This one and this one, we can use both of this morphology for the delivery of active ingredients where we can encapsulate the active ingredients inside and then for the tissue engineering part, we can use this one, which is, it offers highly porous uh, structure where we can use for tissue engineering, substituting the scaffold. So that's the application, basically the application of this colonosomes. Now, we have come to the end of my lecture. So uh, let me conclude. Everything is the summary part, which is in conclusion. To start with preparation method is actually actually a cost effective, less time consuming, and it is applicable for larger scale. Because when we talk about larger scale, we need it to be a cheaper things and it's simple to produce. And then different morphology in terms of porosity of colodosomes, it offers different types of application. So it doesn't matter if it is a highly porous or less porous, basically both of it can be used but for different types of applications. And then the third one is holocalidosomes can be developed more, especially for biomedical application, which is for the tissue engineering part and also for drug delivery system, where we can deliver the uh, drugs into the targeted area, and then we can control the release of the drug. I think that's all for me with that, I thank you. Um, I will start with Dr. Kwan, then I will ask the last question. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Very charismatic performance. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, how did you arrive at the solvent flow rate of the syringe pump? Because as far as I know, uh, the, solvent, the flow rate will change the size of the droplet, uh, how big the emulsion is, how effective is the hollow drop. So how did you actually calculate the solvent flow rate? So, uh, so, we're using the syringe pump. Basically, a syringe pump is a device where we can alter the, we can fix, we, we, where we can fix the injection rate. So basically, we just insert how much we want to inject into the water phase, and then the syringe pump, because the syringe pump is a device, it is an electronic device. So uh, basically, we can alter by using the device syringe pump. So we can uh, fix the rate of the uh, injection. By using the change power, we're not using manually, we're using actually a device, so we can alter the rate. Uh, uh, I will allow him to break one rule. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because I, I worked with a syringe pump before. Uh, sometimes if you if you change the rate, you might not get the results that you want. You might not actually get any hollow drops. Sometimes you go too fast or too slow. So how do you come at the right range? So that you get what you want, which is a hollow drop. Okay, thank you. So uh, you're asking, how do we know how much we using, right? How much the rate? Basically, this is a preliminary study, so we don't have the optimum uh, condition yet on how do we prepare. So basically, it's a try and error first until we get the optimum rate that we injecting our uh, orifice. Then we can come out to the hollow colonosome. So basically. This one, these studies need to be further so we can know uh, the exactly optimum rate so we get the perfect hologram because of that. I will Thank consider you. that a comment, not a question. Otherwise, I will have a chance. Ask a <laughs> okay, let's go back to your micrographs. Oh, They're right. very interesting. Ah, the, yeah, no. the one? Yeah. Um, yeah, this one. All right. All right. So, uh, between D and F, yeah, it's in the yeah. Are they the same magnification? I uh, know it's not the same. So, what is the size of that? I don't know what. Like the uh, we don't measure the size of the PCL because uh, my study is based on the PHBPPA. But then this one is uh, basically uh, if we can if you know the compare this one from C. Oh, okay. So basically from C and my e, it has 20 micron um, scale, but if we can take a look at this 20 micrometer scale, it's actually we have a smaller particles here. But then when we take a look at 20 micrometer scale at this speed, 
uh, what's the difference between when it's in the bird nest thing? Bird nest thing? This one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. yeah I've already asked two questions. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat okay. the question, please? It's all right. I'm not allowed to ask double questions, so you're very lucky. And I also answered the question for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Siti Haja. Very interesting uh, presentation. And now we have come to the last presenter for the first session. Uh, I would like to call uh, all the way from UNICEL, Miss Sarmila Narayan Saminaidu. Uh, she is from Malacca and now currently pursuing her final year degree in mechanical engineering at University Selangor. Her lifetime goal is to be a professional engineer, inshallah. For her, MLC 2019 is a great platform to enhance her knowledge in advanced materials and improve her presentation skills. So all the best. The floor is yours now. A very good afternoon to honorable judges and your audience. Fiber mm -hmm. nanohybrid improving damage properties. This A very good afternoon to honorable judges and dear audience. Fiber nanohybrid, improving damage properties. This will be my presentation title for today. And I'm Sharmila, daughter of Narayan Saminaidu, and currently I'm pursuing my final year degree in mechanical engineering at University Selangor. <laughs> Ideas. ideas about what I'm going to present today. Okay, I think all of you can see, can clearly see what the image is. The ship, this is a real incident happened in Washington in 2016 where a ship is uh, hitting the dock, <coughs> hitting the dock, and after this incident, the ship is out of service for three months because they need higher time to repair it. But this is an incident, so we cannot predict what will be happen. But how about this one? We purposely create the damage on a material in order to make products. Maybe it is a, a cupboard. We have to fix the bolt and nuts to make a product. But at the same time, we are creating own damage on it. Okay, this will be the outline of the presentation. First of all, I would like to I introduce about my topic and then followed by problem statement, motivation of study, objective, methodology, results, and at last part, I will summarize all of this. Glass fiber. Glass fiber. The molecular structure is the net, uh, network of silicon and bonded with oxygen and sodium, which is a um, metal oxide. And what are the properties of glass fiber? It has a good tensile and compressive strength, good moisture res resistance also, and it is low cost. And what are the drawbacks of glass fiber? low impact strength and low strength to weight ratio. Kevlar fiber. Kevlar fiber is the bonding of hydrogen together with oxygen and the properties are it is high tensile strength and modulus, excellent strength to weight ratio and high impact resistance. All are the good properties of the Kevlar fiber but it is also have Poor compressive strength. Okay, silica nanoparticles. Silica nanoparticles is a 
three dimensional nanofillers. There are many more nanofillers such as carbon, uh, clay and many more. And silica nanoparticles often used in fiber composites, especially for glass, aramid and carbon fiber. Uh, actually, silica nanoparticles has high dispersion behavior and equalized with the size of the largest dimension less than 100 nanometer. The properties of silica nanoparticles are as following, such as increased strength, modulus, hardness and toughness. It can influence compressive strength and impact strength of polymer composites. Okay, I would like to explain further about my topic. This is the damage structure of the sheet. Okay, there are two approach methods which can be used to increase the damage resistance and damage tolerance. First of all, fiber hybridization. As I mentioned earlier, glass and Kevlar fiber has its own properties. But glass has no impact, no impact strength. So when we hybridize glass with Kevlar, we can increase the damage resistance and the damage tolerance. But <coughs> now we need to we, uh, we need to approach the method of matrix toughening, which is we have to mix epoxy with nano silica. Okay, fiber hybridization can expect it to produce a material which has a good impact resistance tolerance high strength and lightweight. But metric toughening is to produce a stiffer and tougher resist, resin system to provide a better lateral support to the fibers to enhance resistance to crack initiation and propagation. Okay, damage resistance. Just now I explained about the damage resistance. What is actually it is about? It is the ability of a material or structure to undergo an event without damage or amount of impact damage that is induced in a composite system. The damage resistance can be tested by drop weight impact test. And another one is damage tolerance, which is the ability of a material or structure to perform with a pre-existing amount of damage. And we want to test how long it can sustain in providing its functions. So this one can be tested by compression after impact, test, open hole tension test and open hole compression test. Okay, fiber nano hybrid, improving damage properties. Okay, what are the problem statement? Okay, glass fiber, the drawbacks are low impact strength and low strength to weight ratio. Kevlar fiber, it has a poor compressive strength. So when we hybridize glass fiber with Kevlar fiber, we can improve the compressive strength and also the impact strength. But it will reduce the compressive strength as well. So we need to further our st research in metric toughening where the silica nanoparticles will be embedded with uh, epoxy resin to increase strength, modulus, hardness and toughness. And it can influence compressive strength and impact strength of polymer composite. Okay, what is the motivation of the study? Actually, previously there are researchers done uh, about fiber hybridization and matrix toughening. But it, uh, the researchers are done separately. But this one is we are doing fiber hybridization and matrix toughening in one composite system in order to increase damage resistance and damage tolerance. So here I came up with the objective of my study is to investigate if any improvement in damage resistance and tolerance exists as a result of hybridizing, hybridizing high performance Kevlar fiber with glass fiber and also with the modification of epoxy resin by embedding silica nanoparticles. Okay, fabrication of composite laminates. How we want to uh, fabricate the composite laminates of glass fiber with Kevlar fiber? First one, nanoparticles mixing process. That means that we have to mix nanoparticles with the epoxy resin and then followed by...
followed by vacuum bagging process. Vacuum bagging process is the method to fabricate the composite laminates and then curing and post curing process in order to toughen the laminates and pre damage where we ourselves uh, will uh, create the damage on the composite laminates and last we will test <coughs> the investigation of damage properties uh, for damage resistant as I mentioned earlier we will carry out drop bed impact test and for damage tolerance uh, we will carry out compression after impact test open hole compression test and open hole tension test okay these are the uh, preliminary results for damage resistant as we can see uh, on the graph uh, when we hybridize kewa with glass fiber the impact strength increase with five weight percentage of uh, nano silica when we all already hybridize both it can uh, it can improve the impact strength but we add on the nano silica in the system it can increase more then peak load and initiation energy also increase and hybridization and silica nanoparticles improve impact strength to weight and total energy absorbed to weight ratio okay these are the sample of the test as we can see here the damage area and depth of penetration with the increment of ns addition confirm that the silica can improve the toughness properties thus increase the impact strength of the composite material and also the nano silica increased resistance of composite specimen toward penetration uh, as we can see that uh, we add more nano silica in the composite system the depth of penetration is reducing Okay, damage tolerance through open hole test. As we can see, the tensile strength is increasing from 12 to 74 percentage, and the residual tensile strength is increasing also from 41 to 104 percentage. So when holes are uh, holes reduce the tensile strength, strain and modulus by 37 to 50 percentage, and respectively, for the damage tolerance. 58 to 63 percentage higher than GFRP uh, means that glass fiber reinforcement polymer. The glass fiber is itself brittle fracture. KFRP is ductile fracture means that glass is brittle and Kevlar is ductile fracture. So failure characteristic change from fiber pullouts in GFRPs to fiber splitting in KFRPs. This is also the result for damage tolerance from open hole te test. As we can see, the stiffness to weight and strength to weight ratio increase with the increment of Kevlar fibers and silica nanoparticles content. The presence of Kevlar fibers and silica nanoparticles cause a higher st stiffness to weight ratio and strength to weight ratio compared to GFRP due to low density of KFRP. So the delamination area, the delamination area is the white color thing that we can see the uh, picture below. So the delamination area reduces with the higher amounts of silica nanoparticles. So the specimen fail due to fiber breakage or splitting near the whole edges. So the reason for this was the existence of silica nanoparticles improves the matrix toughness Therefore, failure behaviors change from matrix-dominated failures to fiber-dominated failures. So, as a summarization, hybrid composite has gained interest in research uh, and it is very beneficial to uh, many industries such as marine, aircraft uh, and more. So, we are expecting that more, research, more researches to be done in order to not only for industrial usage, but our own knowledge piece. That's all, thank you. Followed by Dr. Kang. Shamila. Can you please tell me how you make
should the jumping from two different middle may impact the existing uh, product. You apply this product is for uh, damage uh, product, right? So how you make sure the existing uh, product and the new product is the joint tip here can be joined uh, consistently? Okay, actually, uh, damage resistant is something, uh, uh, some, some, any product that will uh, face damage after it uh, face any incident such as hitting some products. But damage tolerance is, the, uh, the damage is already there, but we want to test how long it can sustain with the damage and it can fun uh, functionally, it can well function. The composite material has been become uh, one of the selection in the oil and gas industry, especially in the pipe uh, uh, strengthening and repair, uh, which is an um, institute side. Uh, but look at it, it's, uh, how do you see that this could be transferred into site application? Because what I see here is more of the uh, in-house manufacturing control. So what do you see the improvement or changes or modification that needed in order to be able to use it at site? Okay. Uh, from this study, uh, we only uh, focus on the Kevlar fiber, which is... Uh, uh, there are many types of Kevlar fibers and glass fiber, but uh, it depends on the application we use. So uh, for this one, uh, the glass fiber used is CWR200 and Kevlar49. So if we want to improve this hybridization process in site uh, like oil and gas, so we have to do more research on other types of Kevlar or glass fiber and other composites. Then only we can know what are the uh, properties that fit into the application in other things. Okay, you are very lucky because you are only allowed two questions. Anyway, all the best and I hope you'll be a petroleum engineer so that you can thrive on site. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Sarumila. With the presenter from uh, UNICEL, we conclude the first session of the competition. Um, after this, we will proceed. Uh, okay, we will have our lunch, which will which have been provided at FKP lobby for all the contestants. Uh, I shall we show you after this and others. We will go to banquet room for lunch. Alright, uh, so uh, please take note that we will continue our second session of the competition at 2.30 p.m. Alright, especially the last time presenter, please be ready before 2.30 p.m. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Respected guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the second session of the MLC 2019. In this morning, we have witnessed the very enthusiastic presentations coming from our first group of participants. Without further ado, let's sit back and enjoy the performance of the second group. We would like to welcome the first presenter of the second session, candidate from University of Technology Malaysia, Mr. Tan Yong Chi. Mr. Tan is currently pursuing his PhD study which focuses on the fabrication of nanofiber using electrospinning technique for skin tissue engineering. Tan holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from USM and a Master of Science in Chemistry from UTM. Tan has represented Malaysia in an international Chinese debate competition in Taiwan in 2014. Mr. Tan, the floor is yours. I still remember that when I was small, I started using plaster wherever I had a cut on my finger. The reason behind it is because the material they used to produce the plaster made the plaster very hard to remove and sticky. And most of the times, 
alpha cats during the removing process. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that many of us have this kind of experience before, right? So now, we are very lucky. We have a plaster that can be easily to be removed. But no matter how easy it is, the removing process creates a certain degree of new damage to the room. As a result, plaster is not suitable for patients who are suffering the aesthetic skin loss, such burn. Ladies and gentlemen, warning, the following diagram may make you feel uncomfortable. When we talk about burn, it is a kind of injury to the skin caused by heat, radiation, friction, or direct contact to chemical. Globally, it is one of the most serious health issues because it causes 180,000 deaths annually. Although now we have a treatment called skin grafting that can be used for a patient who is suffering from burns, the treatment still poses a lot of limitations, particularly the lack of suitable tissue supply. Ladies and gentlemen, I will discuss these problems in more details later. Additionally, the patient also faces a risk of bacterial infection during the treatment. As a result, my team think about why don't we prepare an artificial skin tissue scaffold with antibacterial property to solve the problem. And this is how this project come up. A very good afternoon to the distinguished judges and audience. I'm Tan Yong Chi from University Technology Malaysia, UTM. Today, I would like to present my lecture entitled Fermentation and Characterization of Electrospan, Polyvinyl Alcohol, Polycapolatone, Kytosan, Branded Nanofiber Scaffold for Skin Tissue Regeneration. The title seems very long and complicated, right? Yeah. In fact, it can be simplified into five important keywords. There is Electrospan, time for the word Electrospinning, the machine they are used to produce my product, Polyvinyl Alcohol, Polycapolatone, Kytosan are three different ingredients they are used in this project. And scaffold is my product, my material. First of all, let us begin our lecture today with electrospinning. Ladies and gentlemen, the word electrospinning is a combination of two ideas. Electro comes from the word electrostatic force. And spinning, spinning technique. A technique that we use to change the structure of material into fiber form. So how to combine these two ideas into one? And why we need electrospinning? I will answer those later. But before that, let you think about another question. Why we need spinning technique? In other words, why we need sorry, why we need to change the structure of material into fiber form? Can they make our life much better? I think we can find this answer by looking at this wonderful thing. Call the candy. It used to be my favorite before. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that the process of producing cotton candy actually involves spinning technique? First, we prepare a sugar solution, and then we transfer the solution into a spinning machine. So in that machine, the solution is injected to the surrounding, and once this tricky jack is solidified, they become the fiber structure of sugar, cotton candy. And this is how we produce cotton candy, and it's very interesting that your child will ask you to buy some cotton candy for them as snack but they will ask you to buy a pack of sugar. Why? You the same thing, right? This is because when we change the structure of material into fiber form, we actually enlarge the surface of the material, they eventually increase the interaction between the sugar and the tongue. That's why your child will feel that the sugar touch much more, sorry, much more delicious and fluffy. So in short, by changing the material into fiber form, Using spinning technique, we can increase the application of that material. So this benefit is applied in electro spinning as well. In electro spinning, due to the use of electrostatic force, we can create much smaller liquid jet that eventually produce fibers with diameter for in the range of micrometer and even nanometer. And ladies and gentlemen, the smaller the fiber, the larger the surface area, and we can further enhance the application of that material. Additionally, by manipulating the operational parameter of electrospinning, we can produce many kinds of fiber. You can produce smooth fiber, as shown in the green box, or you can produce red, uh, porous fiber, as shown in the red box. This property is vital importance in biomedical application because our body tissue is made up of different kind of fiber, uh, fiber structure. In the case of skin grafting, we prefer using smooth fiber 
because it's most similar to our extracellular matrix or our normal skin tissue they show in the blue box and this is the electrospan nanofiber mag they usually can attain for electrospeeding to that, the electrospan nanofiber mag can be widely used in many applications you can use it as a filter for air filtration or wastewater treatment you also can use it as a sensor for chemical detection but my group put more focus on the biomedical application we are going to use it as a scaffold for skin tissue regeneration so how it work? the idea of scaffold is quite similar to the plaster but the difference is that scaffold can degrade itself in other words, we no need to remove it after a treatment so, in order to achieve this property I used two biodegradable polymers polyvinyl alcohol, PVA and polycarbonylaton, PCR these two polymers are common polymers that are used in biomedical application and have been approved by U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA. We need PVA in this project because the hydrophilic polymer has anticipated to increase cell attachment and proliferation. Nonetheless, this kind of polymer usually are quite unstable when you contact to water. As a result, I bring PCL, a hydrophobic polymer, to solve the problem, meanwhile to increase the tensile strength. We choose electro speeding over the other technique to prepare our scaffold because, as I mentioned just now, the material mimic the extracellular matrix of our skin, so the cells will feel that they are at home and happy to grow. Additionally, the structure also can prevent bacterial penetration effectively due to the small pore. However, it cannot prevent bacteria growing on top of my scaffold. As a result, I bring Titosan, a natural antibacterial agent to inhibit the growth of bacteria. So what is Kytosan? Is it very toxic? If it can kill bacteria, can it kill us as well? The answer is not. Kytosan is one of the most abundant polysaccharides you can found in nature and can be synthesized safely from Cretosia size crab. And today, there's a lot of people using this bacteria as one of their supplements. So up to here, you may ask me a question. Yongqi, why you need to spend your time to prepare artificial skin tissue? In fact, we can get the grafting of tissue from nature, right? And the treatment is called skin grafting. Basically, the effort of skin grafting, depending on the bacteria we use to replace the excessive skin loss. After graft, the patient gets the grafting of tissue from his other part of his body. Isograft gave from a tweet. These two treatments is highly recommended because the genetically identical tissue reduce the risk of graft rejection. However, their supply is very limited. And not all the people could twist, right? May I know how many people have three brother and sister here? You see? Oh, one. So, no many, right? Or oh, two. Okay, so really no many, right? So, that's why... Three sisters, three sons, three daughters. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, never mind. So, later on, people think about why don't we get the grafting of tissue from... Uh, from other people, allograft, or gave from other species, genograft. Yes, these two treatments solve the problems of supply, but the genetically non identical tissue increase the risk of graft rejection. And no matter which kind of treatment you are choosing, the pause of risk of disease transmission because we are transferring cells and tissue from one organism to another. Additionally, they also pose a risk of post surgical enhancement in which the patient has to go through the secondary surgery after the treatment. And this increases the risk of scar formation and infection. So now, it's the more exciting part. I'm going to show you how I produce my scaffold. As I mentioned many times previously, I use electro spinning. It is a spinning technique that uses electrostatic force to produce continuous ultrafine fiber. It's a very simple technique. The, con the typical cell already consists of three major components. A feeding unit, I use shrimp pump in my lab, a high voltage supply, and a collector. So uh, the collector should be connected to the ground step for safety purpose. So similar to the conventional spinning technique, we also need to prepare polymer solution before electro spinning. And after that, I will fit in the solution here using a shrimp and use shrimp pump to control the feed brand. So this is my project. It seems very simple, right? Prepare the solution, get the fiber, study, and get my PhD. No. If you observe carefully, you'll find that the most challenging part in my project is that how to combine PVA, PCL, Kytosan in one solution. Since your relationship is like oil and water, then we don't want to use any extra chemical for it because it may increase the cost of production and cytotoxicity. 
As a result, I spent one semester to study many kinds of solvent system. They eventually I come a formulation, they combine everything into one homogeneously without using any surfactant or emulsifier. So now I'm going to show you how I prepare my solution. Okay, I fixed the concentration of PVA and PCL in 20% and 15% respectively. So due to the good formulation, they combine homogeneously with ratio one to one. And after that, I add in different amount of kaitosan, 1%, 2%, 3%, and 4%. We try to cut down the amount of ketosan used in this project because this material may increase solution viscosity. They eventually reduce the electro spinability. So after I get my product, I will immediately test their antibacterial property using this diffusion test. It is a very simple technique. We prepare the agar and then spray the bacteria and put the sample on top of it. So if the sample can grow the can inhibit the growth of bacteria, it will so Sorry, it will show an inhibitory zone here. So in this study, I tested two different bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, as errors and gram-negative bacteria, E. coli. So this is the result. As you can observe, although all my sample contain kytosan, but it doesn't guarantee that all of them can inhibit the growth of bacteria. My product only can inhibit the growth of bacteria when the concentration of kytosan reach 3%, that is here. So in following material characterization, I will only focus on this sample because I, we want our scaffold with antibacterial property. So this is a physical images of my product. I also produce PVA PCR fiber. So as you can observe, their fiber diameter is almost the same. It's around 150 nanometer. However, after adding the kytosan, because the solution viscosity increased, the fibers start to form branch after during the electro spinning. And we actually prefer this kind of structure because it is more similar to our extracellular metric on our, of our normal skin tissue. So this is my product and this is my hand. And beside it is the FDR, ATR spectrum of my sample, the break one. The break one. Okay, I compare those with PVA PCL spectrum. So FDR, FDR analysis is, is a technique that can be used to confirm that my product contains PVA and PCL. By comparing the peak they only achieve in the particular polymer, I can be very sure that my compound, my product contains PVA because of the orange bond here and PCL because of the carbonyl bond, carbonyl bond here. We also conduct mechanical study on my sample using the tensile tester as shown in the slide. So during the analysis, the machine will start pulling my sample upwards with a rate of 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter, sorry, 10 millimeter per minute. And my sample have a tensile strength around 2.5 MPa. They consider quite strong and forcible for scaffold, but we still think another approach to improve the tensile strength so that it can closer to our human hands. There is 4.5 MPa. So after adding the PCL into my scaffold, actually I cannot guarantee that it is still hydrophilic. So I conduct the contact angle analysis of my product. Since my product is not really a fractured membrane, so I need to pass them on the glass before the study. So this is what actually happened during the analysis. So you can observe the the product absorb water very quickly like and this means that my product is very hydrophilic so in terms of the biocompatible study the MTT assay proved that my product is not toxic to the cells because they show the simi almost similar OD value uh, with the control it means in which mean that the cells can grow very well with my sample and finally, the biocompatible, sorry, biodegradable study. My sample is biodegradable because it can degrade in PVA solution within seven days. In conclusion, initial spinning is a spinning technique that can be used to produce scaffold for skin tissue regeneration. Because this technique, the electrospan nanofiber max, mimic the extracellular metric of our skin and also can prevent bacterial penetration effectively. So in this lecture, we successfully produced a new scaffold containing PVA, PCL, kytosan. They're showing good excellence 
but biocompatibility, chemical and physical property through our skin tissue regeneration. So that's all my, pre my presentation. Thank you. Start with Dr. Kwan. I don't have any questions. Okay, um, um, Mr. Kang, and then I'll ask the question. Very interesting, biology. I asked for the next question. It is for regional region. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to, like, people can use it to grow a good tissue to be a stronger muscle? Uh, stronger tissue muscle. Can that be further developed into the area? That someone want to get a bigger muscle like me? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I think it's possible because actually we are producing something they can use to grow the cells. So I think if we can produce the scalpel, they are suitable for muscle cells. So it can help. It can help the person. Yeah, for that purpose. Hmm. Can you go back to the, um, the diagram of the nanofibrous tissue? The, 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 the micrographs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. So now we are looking at um, like a mass fibers, mm -hmm. which uh, we don't really care which which direction it's going or which orientation. Is it possible for you to control the electron spinning to produce the kind of uh, size of nanofiber, not nanofibers to require, as well as the orientation? Mm -hmm. Is it possible for you to break to you know the process parameters in your electron spinning mm -hmm. to produce uh, to, to decide the size. Now you've just produced yes, yes. Uh, You mm. have not decided, it's just that you know you put together everything and then out comes one four nine, one five, whatever, a size, and you just say Bismillah and you take it. Now I'm saying is it possible for you to get to, to decide, to determine so I want a size which is diameter of two hundred nanometers set because that's the best um, size for that particular scaffolding. And orientation in a okay, size way. and orientation. Yes, and this is a, actually a very big story. Oh. Because uh, the operation parameter of electron spinning consists of three parameters. Uh, solution parameters, processing parameter, and ambient parameters. So in order to control the size and orientation of electron spin nanofibers, usually we control the solution parameter. That is that electric constant of the solution and also solutions concentrations. So in terms of size, so if we increase the solution concentrations, it can increase the viscosity as well, and this will help us to get bigger fibers. And in terms of the dielectric constants, because if we use a very high dielectric constant fibers, the solution will like a lot of charge, so we can control the orientation more easily compared to the less dielectric constant solvents. Okay, so this is not a question, right? Okay. It's a comment. Mm. So you are saying the material properties rather than the process parameters. Okay, you don't have parameters. to answer that okay. because I'm only allowed two questions. <laughs> but I, I can answer. I can answer. <laughs> okay. uh, Prof. Assis is not fair okay. because you're only allowed two questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Tan, for such an enlightening presentation. Now let us proceed to the next presenter. We would like to call upon the candidate from University of Naga National, Mr. Sashindran Palani Vedu. Mr. Sashindran is currently pursuing his second year degree in mechanical engineering in Uni 10. He is a public speaker and is athletics as well. He is a person looking forward to make the world a better place to live by providing free education to the needy. Mr. Sashindran, let's share with us your work. Thank you. Thank you for the very generous introduction, uh, Master of Ceremony. So, hello everybody. Like I just found out, in Malacca, we always start something with a poem. But then from where I come from, we always start something with a story. So, I have a really like, uh, one interesting story to share with all of you. So, where's the picture? Okay. So now, just imagine yourselves to be the father of these three kids playing a game of Monopoly. 
So now you're excited rolling the dice. And the number comes out, six and three. You move your counter nine steps forward. And voila, you have to pay your son 10,000. Well, uh, let's say monopoly money. And now your son is really happy. But all of a sudden, you start sweating profusely. You feel a sharp pain at the left hand side of your chest. And the, and the last thing that you hear is your children screaming. And when you wake up, the only thing that you remember is your wife sobbing uncontrollably beside you. You turn to her and ask, what's wrong, honey? And she says, I'm sorry, darling, but the doctor just diagnosed you with heart failure. You need a new heart. And that's when you realize that your world has just crumbled into darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, well, my topic is pleading a second chance. I am Sashindran, a second year mechanical engineering student. Well, uh, you may ask me, oh, what actually have you done? Like any research project? Well, to be honest, I'm in the point of life where I just actually wake up in the middle of night still wondering why am I doing engineering? So this topic is basically just my passion. I have done no research about this, it's just my passion. So now moving on. Well, the demand for organ transplantation has rapidly increased over the past decade. Unfortunately, the, the inadequate supply of organs is not expected to uh, actually meet the demand, so which, has, which has resulted in a major organ shortage crisis. Now, as engineers, the only thing that I've learned is we do not believe things very easily. We are always motivated to believe with statistics. So now moving on to the statistics of this problem, there are at least 140,000 people out there are waiting for an organ transplant. And the worst part is only 35,000 actually successfully undergo uh, our organ transplantation. And the most devastating part is 20 people actually die every single day waiting for that one phone call that is able to change their lives. So now let's just do a quick math. 20 people a day, you times it by 7, you get 140 a week. 140, you times it by 4, you get 560 a month. 560 times it by 12, you got around 6,000 people dying every single day, just not getting a second chance. So the, so the question that, um, that, <coughs> that often pops up in my mind is, how do we put a stop to this problem? Is there actually no end to this problem? We are not. We might just have struck the pot of gold. Well, introducing to you this cute little machine here, a 3D printer. Now, judging by the faces of you, you might be still wondering, how exactly is this thing going to, you know, was it help me replace my organ? Is this going to print a new organ for me? Yeah, it is. How? Well, stay with me to find out. <coughs> well, this, well, this printing pro uh, process can actually be categorized into three steps. Uh, which is the pre-bio printing, the printing, and the post-bio printing process. So now this may actually seem as easy as A, B, C, but allow me to guide you as it is not easy as it looks like. So starting off, it is extremely important to obtain a biopsy of the organ. And most commonly, MRI scans or CT scans are conducted to obtain multiple 2D scans of the specific organ. And you combine all the the images together, you get a blueprint of the organ, like the blue one below there. And then after that, a microscopic anatomy is conducted to identify the specific tissues that are involved. For instance, in a heart, there are actually epithelial tissues, cardiac tissues, and connective tissues involved. So this helps us actually analyze the position and the specific angle that, uh, that the tissues are involved, so that they, uh, we are we are actually able to like print them uh, <coughs> print them accordingly. Now moving on to the printing process, like normal printers which require inks, 3D printers actually require bio-inks. Now the most interesting part is bio-inks do not have inks, but they have living cells themselves. These living cells are basically stem cells, which are actually put into a nutrient medium, cultured, and they are actually allowed to differentiate to form specific cells. For example, you take a sample of stem cells, and you put a one piece of epithelial cells inside, the whole jar becomes epithelial cells. This is the beauty of stem cells. They are able to differentiate into the type of cell that they are actually put into. So, uh, with this numerous cartridge of, of different types of cells, which are, are they actually inserted into a printer together uh, with, a, uh, with a water binding agent, such as a hydrogel or, or something like a colpol, <laughs> collagen polymer. <laughs> 
And actually, collagen polymer is like a water-soluble substance which helps the cells bind together to form the organ. And after that, you just upload the image into the printer and it starts printing. But it does not end there. It, and it, uh, <coughs> as it is, the last step is also extremely important as the post-bioprinting process actually determines the success rate. This is where the, the mechanical integrity and the function of, of the bio of the bioprinter material is actually tested. Okay, so how do we do it? We actually put it into the bioreactor machine there inside the fluid. So it's basically an artificial fluid containing iron 3, which actually mimics the blood of the body. Why iron 3? It's because our blood consists of hemoglobin, where a large part of it is, is actually about is iron 3. So it has, is actually put into a uh, bioreactor machine together with iron 3, and it's around, and it is actually allowed to uh, to like nature and vascularize for a period of time. So what do I mean by vascularize? Vascularize means the formation of, of uh, connective tissues and, and blood vessels around the organ. So this is what actually helps the organ survive later on. So now talking about bio inks, we have talked about like natural bio inks where stem cells. But unfortunately stem cells are very, very, very expensive. I've actually uh, googled up on a site called Cell Inc and a 30 milliliter of stem cells actually cost 600 US dollars. And we cannot be actually buying a couple of uh, what is it, cartridges of stem cells just to print one small organ. It's going to cost us a thousand of dollars. So there are actually artificial types of bio inks such as alginate and decellularized extracellular matrix. Well, alginate is something where we can reconstruct cartilage-based organs such as ears, nose, very simple and minute types. While decellularized extracellular matrix can be used to construct like tissue-based organs like the kidney, liver, heart and lungs. But it does not stop there too. There are many requirements to actually print an organ. And the first thing is the condition should be sterile. This is to, uh, this is to ensure that no infection takes place once the organ has been transplanted into the human body. If there is an infection, then there might be the, uh, uh, the need to use drugs such as, uh, <clears throat> such as immunosuppressants, and uh, which will also cause side effects such as uh, the, uh, the hand traveling, um, depression, concussions, and, and even in the worst cases, paralysis. And by, and by ensuring that the uh, condition is sterile, we can actually eliminate the usage of immunosuppressant drugs. Moving on, it should be in mild conditions, where the temperature should be controlled uh, to be around 27 degrees Celsius, slightly below the human body temperature, as as the organs actually uh, vascularize better in that temperature and conditions. And thirdly, we should also handle it in a very sensitive approach. A very slight agitation when the, when the organ is vascularizing could actually destroy the whole process. And the organ should not be exposed to light as light causes the cells to mutate very, uh, very aggressively. Always a presentation is not complete if we do not discuss the pros and cons. So there are a number of pros of this process, but let me just highlight a few three. Well, the success rate is extremely high is because this process actually extracts the patient's own cells instead of them obtaining from a different person who has a different body type, who has a different body size, a, a different DNA structure. So the, rejection, uh, so the rejection rate is extremely low in this process. Secondly, it is very efficient. It is because only one person is actually hospitalized. You do not need to have two persons hospitalized where in the conventional cases, you transfer one organ from here to another organ. This is basically, you just print your organ and just, just put it back inside the body of, of his. And this is just the replacing. Thirdly, uh, this also helps curb the moral issues. Like you know, when people actually deprive of, of something, they tend to resort to, uh, to illegal ways. So in this case, when people actually need organs, this is where you find kidnapping, human trafficking, and all these just to find new organs. So this is becoming a norm nowadays. So in order to curb this moral issue, I feel that 3D bioprinting serves as a much better way. In the world, there is nothing perfect. So there are actually drawbacks to this thing as well. So the first thing is, as I said, is is actually very. I mean, like it's extremely costly to to get a cartridge of uh, uh, what is it, a serum, stem cells, and and most importantly, a 3D bioprinter itself is so expensive. And secondly, it's also very complicated to produce an organ like the heart. 
In reality, the heart has not been 3D bio printed yet. The, uh, the only organs that have been 3D bio printed are the human kidney, um, the, uh, the ears, the nose, and, and the liver. It's because these are very simple and non-complex organs. However, in, in order to like, uh, to like print a very complicated organ like the heart, this involves a very tedious and, and uh, was meticulous process. It's, it's because the valve consists, I mean sorry, the, the heart consists of uh, various valves, chambers, and a different thickness of, of the muscle cells. So uh, this process, I think, is, is still being researched by the biomedical engineering, you know, like in maybe other countries, but not in Malaysia. So my conclusion is, this research, I mean, like, we are not Malaysians if we do not like point our fingers to the government for ideas. So, uh, so basically, I would like to suggest that the government should actually fund more universities in, in order to like obtain uh, better research so that, that uh, we can implement this technology in our general hospitals as well, providing a better, uh, like a better success rate for the people in, in order to obtain those organs. And, and I think that uh, this is also user friendly as you know that like, uh, the patients do not like have to keep on waiting on. If they have enough like funding and they have enough resources, and then it's actually easy for them to, uh, to obtain an, an organ for them, a uh, replacement. So with that, I would like to end my speech. Thank you. Can you, uh, is there any, uh, to this technology, is, is, this, is there any collaboration with other agency to make sure this uh, 3D printing is effective? Collaboration as in like in our country or in other countries? In and outside. So in and outside. Uh, well, I have done uh, like some research about this, and I find that uh, there are multiple, uh, was the private multinational companies out in US like Cell Inc, Cellulite, and all. They uh, they actually endorse this technique uh, or the private hospitals out there, where they actually sell their bio printers, uh, they actually sell the serum, they actually sell stem cells and all. But I feel that uh, this is more of a profit profit making organization than actually uh, trying to help the society. So that's why it's actually extremely. Or they're expensive because they are uh, or they, they're like a private company, they're not like a, a government based agency doing this. So there are collaborations out there, but it's just that they're more of like uh, with organization trying to make money instead of like, helping others. <laughs> now, uh, have you done any research on the market concern, especially from the medical uh, industry side? development of this uh, technology mm -hmm. from, from the medical point of view rather than the commercial point. So like the uh, uh, like the market uh, as in like are uh, people willing to pay uh, for uh, for the organs or the development of these organs from the uh, medical point of view mm -hmm. what are the uh, concerns that the medical industry has uh, in the usage of the negative yeah, yeah. Uh, impact of it? So uh, I have like spoke uh, to a few doctors about this, and their concern is, I mean, like the first question that they ask is, this is actually like, if let's say uh, you have the money to actually get a new organ, and you're already like 60 years old. So like, like it, it wouldn't be fair for like a young kid who is like four years old, and he has a hole in a heart, but he does not have the, uh, the money to, uh, to get a new organ, while you are 60 years old, you have already lived like half your life, and then you still want to get a new organ. So, like, they feel it's not fair, but uh, there was also a doctor that, uh, that told to me that if, if, let's say, you are trying to replace your, uh, your kidney, like, uh, if, like uh, uh, let's say your kidney has been 60 years old now, so trying to replace your kidney with a, uh, with a, uh, with a brand new kidney, yes, you have a brand new kidney, but there are some organs like your brain which cannot be replaced. So, in the end, you don't have to die one day. It's just that, the, it's just that uh, what is it, uh, once you replace the organ, you do not die without suffering. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. You, you just die without suffering. And in the end, the, uh, the kid actually dies with suffering. So everybody has to die one day, it's just a matter of like suffer or not suffering. I think it's fair, I'm six six right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I understand your parents are with you today. Yeah, my dad. Yeah. Happy birthday, dad. Yes. Oh. <laughs> 
I think we should give a round of applause for your father. Your father reminds me of myself. That's what I do as well for my children. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sashindran, for such an interesting and inspiring idea. So now let's move on to the next presenter. I'd like to call upon candidate from the University of Madaya, Mr. Ng Kok Bin. Mr. Ng Kok Bin received his bachelor degree in physics from the University of Malaya in 2017. He worked as research assistant in Photonics Research Center, University of Malaya during 2018. Now he is pursuing his PhD degree in physics under the Mybrin Scholarship. His research interests mainly focus on optical nonlinearities in materials. Mr. Ng, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to the open number of judges, organizers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is optical fiber, and I would say it is one of the most important discovery of the century. Optical fiber is in the backbone of our current unified internet system. And without optical fiber, your computer will not be able to connect to you know, Facebook, Google, or YouTube. And I believe the internet will not be as interesting as it is now. Okay. So my question is, what is an optical fiber? And what makes it so amazing? In general, optical fiber is like a highway. And light is the razor, sprinting through dusk optical highway while carrying our data, information, and messages to all over the world. So, as Einstein told us before that, nothing in this world can go faster than light. Okay? So, using light as the data carrier has provided us the high-speed internet today. Okay, so, just take a look at it on the screen. Imagine you are searching for something using internet. Your question will be, carried by light through an optical fiber and reach to the Google. So Google will then search for the answer and sense it back by another fiber. So in general, you will need two fibers in order to complete the process. However, definitely there is more than one person in this world who wants to connect to Google, right? So by the end of 2018, there is about 28 million of internet users in Malaysia. So if one person needs two fibers, are we going to have a total of 56 million of optical fiber planted underground in Malaysia just so that everyone can get up, can get to connect with Google? Right? Certainly not. Therefore, we will need something that can connect multiple users using only just one single optical fiber. Therefore, scientists have invented something called the planar lightwave circuit splitter, or in short, a PLC splitter. So this PLC splitter literally means it is to split light from one input channel into multiple output channels, while each channel is corresponding to an optical fiber. So although the name is called splitter, it actually can work the other way around, which is by combining multiple lights from multiple input channels into one single output channel. So the magic of this splitting and recombining of lights lies within the little box over here. So now, let's open up this box and have a look what's inside. Okay. When you open up the box, first, you will see a piece of glass, okay, with a thickness of about 4 millimeters. And if you look closer to it, you will observe a lot of narrow lines on top of it. So this line will then act like a track of a train, which will then help to direct the light to the place we want it to go. Okay, the animation here shows how light is being guided and split within a PLC splitter. As you can see, every time when the light encounters a junction, it will split from one into two. As a result, the light from one input channel has been split into eight different output channels. And using this PLC splitter, it can actually achieve up to a maximum of 64 total output channels. This means that in a housing area of about 200 households, you only need about three of these PLC splitter to actually split the internet for everyone. And the best part of the PLC splitter is that it, is, it also helps to ensure that every user at the output will get the same quality of the internet. So this is very important. Okay? Imagine if the splitting is not good, then some of you might get a better internet, while some of you might not. So I believe those of you will not be so happy with it. All right? so, now we have seen how is light being guided and split within a PLC splitter. But the question remains is, how do we ensure that 
the light will stay within the trap. Why don't the light just go to somewhere else, right? So to understand this, let's have a look on the basic principle of the reflection and refraction of light. Okay. Every time when the light strikes on the surface, it will undergo either reflection or refraction. And if you look from the side, you will find that reflection and refraction can actually happen at the same time. But if the light hits the surface at an angle greater than the critical angle, then all the lights will be totally reflected. So this is what we call a total internal reflection. So this kind of phenomenon will occur only when the lights travel from a denser medium towards a less dense medium. So now, imagine we have a design like this. We have a denser medium at the middle, surround it with a less dense medium, then we can actually have the light traps within the denser medium using the total internal reflection and have this move forward according to the direction of the traps. Okay. So with all this knowledge about the PLC splitter, how do we make them? In order to make PLC splitter, first you will need a substrate, which is usually a piece of glass. Then we will coat a layer of photoresist on top of this glass. So this photoresist is actually a special chemical solution which is sensitive to UV light. Okay, so we are going to turn this photoresist into our splitter later on by using something called the photo mask. Okay, so on this photo mask, we have pre patterned the design of the splitter that we wanted on top of it. Then when we shine UV light, some of the lights will be blocked by the photo mask while some of the light will just pass through it and reach to the photoresist. So the photoresist that exposed to the UV lights will get will become hardened. Okay, then after that we can remove the photo mask and of course we can remove the unexposed photoresist as well and left only the photoresist with the design of the splitter. Okay, so this kind of fabrication technique is a little bit complicated but it's very efficient even at the industrial level because you can fabricate multiple optical spark splitter at the same time as long as you have the correct design of the photo mask. However, the technique itself is still uh, suffering from some several challenges. Okay, first of all, it's the, it is a costly process. It's because the photo resist and the photo mask that we were using are both expensive material. And the next thing is that during the fabrication process, it is extremely sensitive to dust. It's because the splitter, the dimension of the splitter that we were talking about is just a few micrometer, which is much thinner than your hair. So every pinch of dust drop onto the device during the fabrication will greatly affect the quality of the fabrication. That's why the whole process needs to be done inside a clean room, which is a dust-free environment. And that clean room will cost you for more than 100,000 for the size of this room. All right. And as we all know, sign, glass is very fragile. It breaks easily. Since you are using glass as a substrate, okay, you need to be extra careful during or even after the fabrication. And lastly, the fabrication technique only allows us to fabricate a 2D PLC splitter. Okay, for a thickness of four millimeter, we actually can more than we actually can have more than hundreds of of the splitter. But due to the fabrication limitation, we only wish it us to fabricate the one level design with a maximum of sixty four output channels. So to overcome this problem, there is two things in mind. Okay, first to find a new material, which is tougher than glass. And secondly, to find a new fabrication technique, which allows us not only to fabricate a 2D PLC splitter, but one step further, a three-dimensional PLC splitter. With that in mind, my lecture today entitles Keeping Lights on Track via 3D Polymeric Microstructuring. Okay. The material that I'm going to use is a material called CR39. So it is actually a polymeric substrate and people have started to use this CR39 to replace glass in the manufacturing of the wall, eyeglass lenses. Okay, it is because CR39 it shares several similarities with the glass in such a way that they are both optically transparent and they have the same optical density, but CR39 is much more lighter and much more cheaper than a glass. And most importantly, this CR39 is a plastic so that it won't break as easy as glass. And on top of that, throughout our research, we find out that CR39 actually has some unique interaction with laser. And that's the reason why we have chosen it as a replacement to the glass to make the splitter. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to print the optical splitter inside the CR39 using a method called laser direct writing. 
So it literally means to directly write or directly draw the design, the paper design, inside the CL39. Okay, just like you write something on the paper using your pen, as simple as that. But before we talk about uh, how, do, how am I going to do the drawing, first, there are a few things about laser that you should know. Okay, the first thing is the power, the laser power. Laser pointer, which is, uh, I, I believe is the most common laser source, has a power of about 5 milliwatts. It's a very low power, but still high enough to cause some damage to your eye. And, but if the laser in our lab can actually go up to about 34 kilowatts, which is 7 million times stronger than a single laser pointer. And the next thing is the spot size. So every time when you shine the laser pointer, you will see a very bright spot. Okay, so that's the spot that we are talking about. The laser pointer it has a spot size of 2 mm, and actually for the same laser power, you can have the laser plate, the spot size as large as this, or you can actually concentrate all the power into a very small spot size of 2 micrometer. So at that focal point, the laser intensity can actually go up to extremely high, that in such a way that you're not only able to blind your eye immediately, you also can cause some burning to your skin, your clothes, or even paper. And yes, now I'm going to use this laser to do the drawing. Here's what we're going to do. First, we have our CL39 sample. So when the laser light touches the objective lens, it will be focused down to a very small spot size of 2 micrometer. And the high intensity laser will immediately create a damage spot inside the CL39. So that's the interesting part. The inter this kind of damage can actually can be created if and only if the laser has sufficient intensity. So that means that we can actually control the laser's intensity in such a way that it is highest at the focal spot and lower at the side. This, therefore, only the part of the CL39 which should have the highest intensity laser will get, will be heated out, melted, and reconstruct itself to form a high density region, while the rest of it will not be affected by the laser and stay in their original low density state. So now, what is a high density damage spot? Surrounded with a low density material. We call that to house light being guided and split inside a PLC splitter. We actually done the first step of the light guiding. So the next step is to design the track. Okay? So this step is very simple. I'm going to show with an animation over here. What you need to do is to place a CL39 onto a programmable translational stage, which essentially you can move the center around the objective lens. Okay, then you have the design ready. Okay, so this is what we have done in the lab. And we actually, um, see that this is a very simple design and we call it as a straight channel track. So this track has, is proven to be light guiding. And the next step that we are going to do is to use a 3D translation stage. We can move in a 3D manner, move our sample in a 3D manner to realize the 3D optical speaker like this. Okay, so the image over here shows the idea of the 3D optical splitter. Uh, imagine, if, so using this 3D optical splitter, you can imagine like, initially the, uh, the splitter is split from to left, the light is split to left and right, but now it can split to up and down. Okay, so the light from the one level, okay, from, one, from one level, it can actually split to four different levels. And imagine if each level having the same amount of maximum number of output channels like the original PLC speaker, we actually can have more than 256 channels at one single chip. This means that in, in the housing area of 200 people, we only need one of these to split the internet for everyone. And this is not the limit yet. Okay, the amount of the upper channel, the total number of upper channels is actually depending on the, the thickness of the sample as well as how many opportunities you want. Okay, you actually can design on, according to your wish. Right? So, using this laser directing, it actually offers several advantages in such a way that it allows us to fabricate a 3D optical splitter in an environmentally friendly manner. Because throughout the process, I'm not using any chemical solution. And that leads to the next point, which is a low-cost process. Okay, besides not using any chemical, Using laser dye writing, we also, because we are making the splitter inside the CL39, therefore, we, are not, we don't need to worry about the dust anymore, the dust from the environment in, anymore. And lastly, since we are using the, PL, uh, the CL39 as our substrate, okay, it is tougher than glass, so we will not need to worry about the breaking of glass anymore. 
Okay, so what more can we do? Okay, so 3D optical splitter in cell 39 actually is not meant for the splitting of lights in the internet system only. It actually can be applied in every system that uses lights as a data signal. Okay, for instance, your medical, your TV, television, military, or even your car. And optical splitter is just one of the many examples of the optical device that we have. Together with the laser direct writing technique, we actually can combine all the optical device, such as Peter and the others, into the CL39 to form a 3D optical, 3D photonics integrated circuit. Okay, just like the electronics counterpart. And now, in, in, so in the future, we might apply this kind of a 3D photonic integrated circuit into our handphone or computer to realize the lightweight, low cost, and the fastest processes of all time using light. Therefore, it's very important to keep your mind on track, and with that, I end my lecture today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's one, Uh Thanks very much. Uh, very enthusiastic. Thank you. Um, I just have one question. What, how do you increase the waveguide efficiency of your device? Okay, thank you for your question. So, in order to answer that question, first, uh, in terms of the waveguide efficiency, okay, it is controlled by the laser parameter. It's a, the laser parameter is very important. So for instance, the laser pulse wave, reputation rate, as well as the, the scanning speed, which is the speed you move the sample. Okay, so all these need to be optimized. And I'm on the way to where to find the optimized condition. <laughs> all right. But uh, through the literature, okay, all these conditions, have, uh, there, there's been literature talking about all this. How, how, how do we change the uh, laser parameter and uh, what is the effect? All right, thank you. Okay. So, um, I'm interested in the way you have made your material selection. Right? Let's go at the very beginning. When you have to choose between CR39, mm -hmm. which I think is a proprietary material, so you cannot disclose to us what it is, right? Uh, you don't have to tell us what okay, it is, okay. but it's a polymer. Right? Okay, it's a polymer, yeah. And uh, you have to decide between glass. Yeah. Okay, and you choose uh, CR39. And today we have had two, I think, uh, presenters uh, trying to solve the problem um, posed by uh, polymer waste. So what is the rationale of your... Do you think that's uh, all right? The, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? Thanks, thanks for the very challenging question. All right, so <clears throat> like this. CR39, as I mentioned just now, has been manufactured for the has been used for the manufacturing of our eyeglass lenses, right? So let's put it this, this way, okay? Throughout your lifetime, how many how many eyeglass lenses for those who are wearing very spec out? How many how many how many eyeglass lenses have you have been throwing away? Okay, I don't you don't know maybe one two at most five or ten. All right. So how many plastic straw and how many plastic bags you have been throwing away? All right, so I think I really have your answer, right? So, okay, I, I believe the threat is there. The threat is there, but the effect will be not so significant as compared to those polymer waste. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ng, for such an informative presentation. So now let us move forward to the next presenter. We would like to call upon the candidate from University Don Hussein on Malaysia, Ms. Siti Khadijah Dermawan. Ms. Siti Khadijah is a fourth year undergraduate student from Faculty of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, UTHM. Siti Khadijah is from Batu Pahat, Johor, and currently she is conducting her BSM or final year project under supervision of Associate Professor Dr. Hassan Zuhudi. She is a Malay debater and was a champion in Debat Piala Menteri Besar Johor 2016 and Debat TVET 2017. Miss Siti, please show us your work. Thank you very much, Siti MC. Have everyone in this lecture experienced the scratch on your skin and it's up here? Anyone? Yes. Just raise your hand. Of course, I swear, everyone has experienced this situation. This is because everyone has experienced this situation, especially during your childhood, your scratch here and there on your hand. So ladies and gentlemen, but this is not my topic for today. I'm 
just taking the concept of self-healing to the prevention of corruption. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning everyone. Oh, sorry, a good evening everyone. So, my name is Siti Harijah Binti Dermawan. You can call me Harija. I'm currently a fourth year student for my bachelor degree program from the Faculty of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, University Tourism on Malaysia, UTHM. So currently, I'm conducting a research under the supervision of Associate Professor Dr. Hassan Zudi bin Abdullah from Department of Mechanical Materials and Design Engineering, JKBR UTHM. So my topic for today, everyone, I've got a very exciting topic about the corrosion, which is the encapsulation of linseed oil as some healing agent in metal coating. So everyone, what is the problem actually? Actually, the presence of micro crack on the coated metal will lead to the corrosion that will bring failure or interruption of function on the component itself due to the environment, environmental impacts. Then, it will bring substantial financial losses, requires expensive effort to limit its impact. So anyone, can you guess how much corrosion costs us globally? Anyone want to answer my question? No, it's okay. Let me answer. It's about 2.5 trillion US dollar based on the study from the National Association of Corrosion Engineers 2018 in the World Corrosion Organization, everyone. So, it's a big and huge amount that we need to spend for the corrosion prevention. So, based on the bar chart, corrosion prevention method from China 2014, it has listed six common method used to prevent the corrosion, which is the first one resistant materials, the second one, rust preventing oil and greases, the third one, surface treatment, electrochemical protection, coating and corrosion inhibitors. And the most of the money was spent for the coating method, which is about contribute 66.15 percent. It is a big uh, topic to discuss about coating to prevent the corrosion. So ladies and gentlemen, my background of research which look like this triangle from the bottom part to the upper part. Ladies and gentlemen, corrosion is a big topic to discuss. So I'm focusing on the prevention of corrosion by coating the component by using self-healing agent inside by using encapsulation process of linseed oil to prevent the corrosion or limit the impacts. So this is how it looks. Linseed oil can be called as flaxseed. It can be obtained from the ripen seed by pressing or extracting process. So, my objective for today is to introduce you a very unique material that can heal the corrosion autonomically by using the self-healing agent linseed oil. So, why I'm choosing the linseed oil? The first one, this is because linseed oil has high drying ability which is the polysaturated iron fatty acid inside is more than 60%. Then, it is a non-toxic material from the natural resources that thermally stable and halal. So, the coating application is vital in the field of aerospace, automotive and pipeline for instance, due to the constantly environmental impacts put on the component and it makes the lifespan of the coating itself will be shorter than before if the corrosion had attacked the component. So ladies and gentlemen, actually, self-healing agent can be divided into two main groups, which is the first one is drying oil and the other one is non-drying oil. For drying oil, it has high constituent of polyunsaturated fatty acid, which is more than 60%. And because of that, it will promote to the drying oil to make it easy to dry, which is make it suitable to make a self-healing agent for, for corrosion prevention. And the example of drying oil is linseed oil, sunflower oil, and tongue oil. For non-drying oil, it has less than 60% constituent of polyunsaturated fatty acid that make it has no drying ability, which is not suitable for the prevention of corrosion if you need to use it. And the example of non-drying oil is palm oil, soybean oil, and olive oil. So ladies and gentlemen, actually, there are no type of, various type of microcapsule that have been identified by previous literature. This is six common type of microcapsule before, which is the first one, is simple microcapsule, which is a core material inside, covered by a sphere shell shape that covered the core material or self healing inside. The second one is metric microsphere, which contains several amount of microcapsule inside. The third one is irregular microcapsule, which is got its name from 
capsulism. Then, for multiple microcapsule, instead of one core material inside a microcapsule, there is more than one type of core material inside a microcapsule that covered by a shell. While for multiple microcapsule, it is vice versa from the multiple microcapsule, it is more than one core, more than one wall or shell that covered a core material inside the microcapsule. And the last one is the assembly of microcapsule, which is a combination type of several microcapsule in a microcapsule. So this and gentlemen looks the figure here, which is the micro encapsulation process by using in situ polymerization method. This is how the microcapsule were made. The first one, the micro encapsulation process start when the uroformaldehyde precondensate and copolymer in the water. Then the pre-crossing process will take place. After that, the emulsion of the linseed oil will be done by using 200 RPM, 300 RPM, or 400 RPM in my research. After that, the whole formation will take place is about reaction time 2 hours, 3 hours, and 4 hours to form a sphere microcapsule, which is the oil or natural oil act as the core, and the whole familiar will act as the shell. So, here I will show you the animation about the whole formation process of a microcapsule. The yellow one is the natural oil or as self feeding agent as the core material and the other one is uroformaldehyde act as the shell. And then uroformaldehyde start to attach with emulsified self feeding agent like this. After that the process continuing until the core material fully covered by the shell which is the uroformaldehyde here. Okay, this is called fully covered by shell to form a microcapsule. Just simple process by using in situ polymerization method. Then, after the microcapsule has been identified, we need to do some artificial scratch in order to rupture the microcapsule to make the self-healing coating function. So, so here, we can look that an artificial spread will be done in order to evaluate the self-healing function or performance, which is the microcapsule will be embedded in the self-healing coating that coated the mild steel as the substrate in my research. Okay then, this is the important part where we need to evaluate the heating mechanism of the microcapsule, either it's good or not. Okay, the first one. The microcapsule embedded in the epoxy matrix. And then the broken microcapsule will happen once the micro crack ruptured the microcapsule nearby. And then the self healing agent will flow out to the crack plane. And then the microcapsule inside will flow out the self healing agent because of that. The reaction between the self healing agent and the oxygen of atmospheric moisture will make the whole site for more film. The polymerization process will occur in this stage. So guys, we need to look at the microcapsule morphology, which is it's so cute, I think. The first one is a sphere microcapsule, and then the other one is a ruptured microcapsule to evaluate the surface roughness. So in this case, a rough outer surface is important to make uh, a good microcapsule. So, can anyone answer my question? Why a rough surface roughness is important to make it a good microcapsule? Anyone? Okay, it's okay. I will answer your. Uh, I will answer your question. It's okay. Okay, the answer is why we need to have rough outer surface actually to make it easy embedded in the epoxy matrix or any coating matrix that we use. Because of that, uh, the uh, addition between the microcapsule and the metric coatings is good to make it um, very well and very good to coat the uh, metal or any component. And then the self-healing performance of drying oil is the final stage to evaluate either the polymerization process is take place or not in this experiment. Okay, the first one, an artificial stress were done in onto the uh, surface coating. And fortunately, the self-healing process or polymerization had occurred where the crack had been healed 
uh, about five days after the crack uh, and artificial crack net done on the coated metal. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, in my research, I had applied the sustainability concept. Okay, the first one, for the social, it will improve the quality of life because it will reduce the affection or injury due to the corrosion like tetanus or what. And the second one, for our environment, it will reduce the pollution by using the organic material or vegetable oil, which is I'm focusing on the linseed oil. And the last one for our economy, it will minimize the cost, which is by using autonomic response. And in this case, which is we need just a low maintenance involved in case to reduce the cost for prevention of corrosion. So ladies and gentlemen, we had come to the last part or the uh, last stage for my presentation. This is why uh, we need to use a self-healing agent in our coating metric, which is metal coating are prone to suffer for micro damage in order to make it um, good, functioning, functioning very good. So why we need to use a very good coating to heal the damage by, in, by uh, adding the micro capsule that contains self-healing agent inside. So ladies and gentlemen, by using the lipstick oil, we can actually, in conclusion, by using the lipstick oil, the healing per uh, performance will be done and in order to make it good environment, we will get enhanced the corrosion prevention technology. The second one, minimize the failure of coating. And the last one, we reduce the cost of corrosion prevention by using organic material, which is amazing. The lipstick oil, where the lipstick oil is a good metal, is a good self healing agent that has high uh, constituent of polyunsaturated fatty acid. With that, thank you everyone and have a nice day. So, thank you. Prof Usta uh, and Dr. Kwan pushing the mic to me. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at that is corrosion. Uh, then I realized it's more of agriculture than corrosion. <laughs> <laughs> now the, the application of coating, one of the common things that we worry about is uh, with the new formulation that we have, that we tested the, the, uh, the durability on the life uh, service, the durability of this coating. Uh, together with any specific, more suitable uh, environment that the, the coating can be used on, or is it suitable for all together? Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, this uh, application can be done on the metal or component that is exposed to the um, normal environment, which is because we use uh, lucid oil, which is the component itself is oil, so like um, an automotive or aerospace it just in the air or in in the normal uh, environment not like a marine or what because in marine we have uh, quite extreme constant to uh, in the coating metric itself thank you another question <laughs> Is there any specific range of uh, crack size uh, that can uh, suitable to implement this healing agent? Okay, thank you for your question. Actually, the size of micro capsule is just around 1 micrometer to the 10 micrometer. Because for coating, normally we coat uh, a component about 30 to 60 thickness uh, of the coating itself. So for the micro crack, it just said that just a micro in size. So for the suitable size is about the micro capsule size or even more, about more than just a little bit, between 1 to 10 only. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miss Miss Khadija, for such an enthusiastic spirit. So now let us proceed to our next presenter. We would like to call upon a candidate from University Technology Patronas, Mr. Shine Ted Lin. 
Mr. Shine is a final year petroleum engineering student from Myanmar who likes to make complicated ideas easy for anyone to understand and communicate. He is always looking for opportunities to explore new ideas and the chance to conduct that exploration alongside with others who share the same excitement. Mr. Shine, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, MC. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is having a good day so far. Uh, my name is Shanka Lin. I'm from uh, University Technology Patronas. I'm doing petroleum engineering and I'm in a final year students. And I'm grateful to be here to talk about my topic. Uh, is the next song? Okay. Okay. Uh, talk about my topic. Uh, potential application of pectin extracted from citric peels as kinetic hydrate inhibitor. So don't get overwhelmed by the jargon. Uh, my topic is about uh, turning uh, citra fruit waste into something that can solve the flow assurance in the wine and gas industry. So without further ado, I would like to show you an interesting phenomenon. So this is flames coming out of ice. So it looks magical, isn't it? How is it even possible? So the scientists call this substance a nickname, the burning snowball. But in the oil and gas industry, we call it as gas hydrate. So let me tell you the most common gas hydrate, the methane gas hydrate form. So in order to form methane gas hydrate, we need methane and water in the system. If this system is bring into the zone where it is high pressure and relatively low temperature, the hydrate will start to form. You can imagine this better by looking at the molecular diagram around here. Here we have water molecule H2O, where the oxygen is represented by respia with two hydrogen atom, and the methane gas, CH4, where methane uh, carbon is green sphere with four hydrogen atoms. So under high pressure and low temperature, this hydrates, uh, the, the water molecule will start to form a crystalline lattice like this, and put the gas molecule inside and trap them. So when these crystals accumulate in the pipeline, it's going to cause flow assurance problem like pipeline clogging, and in the severe cases, we are going to even have pipeline bursting, a very hazardous situation that the company in a lot, uh, great loss in finance uh, and also uh, negative environmental impact as well. So, and then we are exploring more and more oil and gas from a very cold region like northern region and deep sea water region. So these problems are going to be more and more common. So how do we keep these hydrate formation at bay? In order to do so, first we have to understand how these hydrate form. So hydrate form in four steps. Imagine a pipeline, a flow line, where I have oil, oil and gas and water mixture is present at the condition favorable for hydrate formation. The first step, the water will get trapped in the oil and gas itself, and then it will start to develop a thin hydrate shell engulfing the gas molecule in it. These molecules will start to collide each other, cluster F, and finally clog in the pipeline. You can, it, it is represented by the curve down here where the pipeline is operating in the risky zone where hydrate formation is formed. So in oil and gas industry, we need a lot of pressure to transport fluid from one point to another. So we can definitely uh, reduce the pressure in the pipeline to, uh, most of the time. So in this case, we can try heating up the pipeline. Yes, it does work. If we heat the pipeline, the pipeline operating system will be shifted into the no rig zone. So, the, 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 so that the pipeline can operate in the hydrate free region. And it can be done by using a uh, power blanket like this. It is a solution, but it is not applicable when the pipeline are kilometers long or pipeline are under the water. So the industry came up with hydrate inhibitor to inhibit hydrates. So the first ever generation of hydrate inhibitor is called thermodynamic hydrate inhibitor. It's called THI. What we do here is we are going to inject chemical into the fluid mixture in the pipeline so that the hydrate equilibrium curve is shifted into the riskier zone, making more room for pipeline to operate in the no risk zone. We can achieve that by using methanol and glycol injection. What they do is they are going to decrease the activity of the water by forming hydrogen bomb so that they don't go and trap the gas molecule. And it is a time independent method because as long as these methoxide and glycol are present in the system, hydrate won't form. And also that's why they are effective and reliable method but they come with a lot of disadvantages. For instance, we have to use up to 60% of them in the pipeline. So 
the, the, the volume is very high, 60% 60 per, 60 of the pipeline will be occupied by them. And then the wastewater that came out of the system in the end is toxic and harmful to be dumped into the environment. So we need to treat a lot of uh, we need to treat a lot of procedures. So the operation costs are high. And for the operations that are offshore, we have to transport them. We have to make space for them on the rig. So that's a lot of logistic costs as well. So these problems lead to finding of different type of kind of hydrate inhibitor called kinetic hydrate inhibitor. In this case, we are going to use a little bit like lower dosage than the THI, which is lesser than 5 weight percent only, hence the costs are lower, and it shows that they are low in toxicity as well. Here we have a current one of the commercial KHI, polyvinyl carbolatin or PVGAP. What's important uh, is a, it's a synthetic polymer, and if a unit of the polymer look like this. On a molecular diagram, you can see how they perform the hydrogen inhibition. Here, the red molecule is the oxygen itself, and this oxygen is going to attract the polar hydrogen end of the water molecule, forming the hydrogen bond with them, and that's how it keeps the hydrate prevention. So here we have already have a commercial product that is applicable and useful for the industry. So is there even a room for us to come up with another type of PHI that can uh, do better performance than this? The answer is yes. Mainly due to the reason because these synthetic KHI are very expensive to make and the end water is true, is low in toxicity, but still biodegrade is sufficient. So here, in this case, we need a KHI that is cheaper and greener for the environment. That is something, a KHI that is easier to make, uh, show good inhibition performance, something natural based. And yes, we do have a potential candidate. It's called peptin a natural-based polymer we can find in the plants. In fact, there is some uh, researches done on peptin potential as a KHI, and uh, these researches are also recognized by the reputable reports and journal, showing, uh, and then showing the promising result of peptin. So what is this peptin anyway? So in peptin, we can see that peptin as a protopeptin in the plant cell. What it does is it keeps the plant cell hydrated and keep the cellulose network in shape. So we usually uh, produce this peptin from citra peel especially. And according to researchers, Malaysia has a lot of citra fruits that are rich in peptin. I'm sure everyone here has seen this fruit like pomelo, lime, uh, calamansi, which is limon kasturi, especially in the jams and drinks even in medicine and cosmetic. But what we don't see here is along the production process, the peels are wasted. So if we were to turn this uh, waste into something good for the oil and gas industry, it's gonna create a win-win situation. And in fact, the, the, the production of peptin from this citropy is very simple too. This is what I have done in my university lab. First, I wash the peel, make them into dry powder, mix with a hot acid and get the extract, and pull down the jelly, dry the jelly, and finally, I got the peptin powder. According to the experiment done using the calamansi peel, 5 grams of calamansi has 26% of peptin in it, so that's a lot. And um, on a molecular level, peptin will look like this. As you can see, it's a linear polymer change, and each unit is called alpha d as acid unit. What's, what's important about this uh, natural polymer is that it contains a lot of OH and O group which have the potential to act as a natural gas hydrate inhibitor. So then I took a Fourier transform, a Fourier transform in forest spectrography to tax the functional group in the peptin I extracted. So these are the results. According to the result, you can see that the presence of OH group and CO groups from the peptin is extracted from Pamelo uh, and the Lima Custury. So they definitely have the potential to become a KHI. And uh, this is how the inhibition mechanism of peptin. So each unit can be seen as a molecular diagram here where the uh, oxygen is represented as red sphere and the hydrogen are the white sphere. So the, these oxygen will attract the hydrogen ion of the water molecule 
and the hydrogen will attract the oxygen part of the water molecule, keeping them super busy so that they don't go and trap the gas molecule. And if you recall, the commercial PV cap only have one functional component, but in Pepsin, we could have up to five functional components which can perform, so it's already good on paper. Like the peptide has so much potential to become a HHI. So what about in the lab itself? So we take a test on this, and it found out that when we test this peptide solution in an isobaric condition and a hydrate forming uh, conditions, it shows that the peptide uh, could inhibit the hydrate formation. And we are studying by looking at this two parameter here. One is induction time, which is the time difference between the beginning of the experiment and the, uh, the time when we start to see the hydrogen formation itself. And the subcooling temperature, which is the temperature difference between the operating temperature and the hydrogen stability temperature. It's a temperature range we use to compare the performances of uh, different types of KHI. According to the result, it looks like this. This is the result from the study done in China in 2016, a very recent study. Here we have a sample result from the no KHI, meaning that this sample does not contain any hydrate inhibiting uh, agent in it. So when we bring them into the hydrate forming conditions, the, the blank sample without any KHI will give hydrate formation in less than five hours. However, when we use 0.25% of peptin only, it can delay the hydrate formation up to 50 hours here. And that's during the 10 degrees Celsius of cooling temperature range. If we are going to do it in 12.5 degrees Celsius of cooling, the 1% PV gap can only give a performance of about five hours of hydrate inhibitions, making the peptin 10 times better than the commercial one. So that is not the only uh, advantages we are getting from peptin. Since we are only going to use 0.25% of them, the weight, the dosage is reduced up to 66% with a better performance. And if we are look at, if we were to look at the economical value of it, peptin extraction, as I show you, is a very easy one, and it's uh, far cheaper than synthesizing the commercial KHI. And it is in a hypothetical situation where we are producing 500 or barrel water per day. If for those who are not from oil and gas industry, one barrel is equivalent to about 160 liters of water. So imagine we are making 500 barrel of water per day. Peptin, which costs only $12 per kg, which is half as cheap as the PV cap, could save up to 400k of UST per pound. And if it were to be in a year, it's going to save a lot of money and a million dollars. That's not the only advantage it has. According to the wastewater analysis, Peptin show 75% more biodegradability compared to the PV cap. So I hope everyone here noticed the potential of the, this Peptin as a natural KHI, which has good inhibitory bar moment, cheap values, and also high biodegradability. And I'm sure who knows, maybe uh, after one next time when you see the uh, citrus root, you may see. Maybe next time you see the citrus root, maybe you will see it as a million dollar solution. Okay, thank you all. Interesting, especially looking at the last million things. Now, <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, the efficiency of this when you, when you test it, what are the main concern of factors uh, to determine the efficiency? Or, or it doesn't affect by any of the other factors, like the, the physical factors, the production factors, temperature, flow rate, uh, all sorts of the, the factors. Thank you for the questions. So the main uh, defining parameter to test hydrate is the temperature and pressure. That's the main. Uh, so we test it in the very uh, high pressure and low temperature situation. But 
this is uh, more of a preliminary study, so we should conduct more study because in the wine gas flow line, there are a lot of chemical, other chemical present is present as well, right? So we have to test it uh, with different chemical organizations. And what if there are other types of uh, chemical injected? And so, so I think that would be the uh, plus criteria to consider when you are testing the KH performance. Pantene is an interesting uh, solution to this uh, hybrid inhibitor problem. Uh, what's your uh, is is your research commissioned by Petronas? Because what value will it be to Petronas? Oh, okay. yeah. Um, actually, my my. Uh, my research is for my FYP, so it comes from a university grant. But the impact on petroleum industry is that our national company, the petroleum, uh, Petronas, is operating in very cool regions like Canada, uh, Turkmenistan, and so on, so where these hybrid problems are common. So if we were to find come up with a solution that could save million dollars, I think it will help the company save a lot of money too. Yes, but Okay, you don't have to answer this question, Justin, <laughs> but will there be Palamansi in Turkmenistan? That means you have to look for other alternatives, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, we don't okay. have it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Shine, for such a composed presentation. Now, let us proceed to our next presenter. We would like to call upon a candidate from University Technology Mara UITM, Mr. Muhammad Aidil Ali. Muhammad Aidil bin Ali is from Johor and currently doing bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. He is a full-time debater and is really good at cooking, at cooking as well. So that sounds very yummy. So Mr. Aidil, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a plethora of TV series and movies out there which features and talks about the existence of supermaterials. We have the vibranium of Wakanda in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a metal that has the ability to absorb kinetic energy which could also be released at the end. Which is the reason why Wakanda as a civilization is so powerful and why Black Panther as a king and also a superhero so damn strong. In fact, in the much less popular cinematic universe that is DC. I hope I don't hear any DC fans here. Uh, we have Kryptonite, a crystal that has the ability to weaken the inhumanly strong Superman. In fact, even in the X-Men universe, we have Adamantium, a metal that has the ability to cut literally everything because it was so strong and so hard, that includes diamond. But at the end of the day, right, ladies and gentlemen, once we have had that grasp in reality, we will then soon realize that all these supermaterials are too good to be true, they are fictitious, and at the end of the day, they do not even exist to begin with. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, do you guys know that actually in the real world that we are living in right now, no longer talking about fictional world by the way, we do have supermaterials that is currently existing. And that is exactly what I'm going to talk about in my presentation for the next 40 minutes. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good um, afternoon. I bid to the VIPs, to the panel of adjudicators, to my fellow participants and also to the people who are watching in this beautiful hall. My name is Muhammad Aidil bin Ali. I am from University Technology Mara and the title of my presentation is going to be The Synthesis of Hybrid of Algenate slash Beta Cyclodextrin Aerogel by Chemical Cross-Linking. Now I do understand that the title is very long. It is as long as the name of the kids nowadays. But I can assure you guys this, that by the end of my presentation, inshallah, you guys are definitely going to get what I'm talking about. But very quickly, if we look here, this white cylinder is an aerogel. It is so light that literally the stamen of the flower is capable of withholding that aerogel. That is one of the reasons why aerogel is considered a supermaterial. But before we go on any further, or delve in any deeper, there are two fundamental questions that we need to answer in this um, presentation. What are supermaterials to begin with? Supermaterials, ladies and gentlemen, as the, as the name suggests, are materials that are far superior to compare with anything else that is in the world. And this superiority is due to the fact that they have remarkable physical properties. It could be their hardness. It could be their insulating ability. It could be their conductivity, right? Because like in the previous presentation, we have had talks about 
optic fiber, which is also considered a form of supermaterial. But another supermaterial that not a lot of people know are actually called the aerogel, which brings us to the next question. So what is an aerogel, right? So I think like a lot of people when they heard the name, including me by the way, when I first heard the name, I imagined aerogel to be something that is wet, something that is soft, wobbly and jiggly, very much like the lengkong that our mother made for Bobuka Puasa during Ramadan. But it doesn't work that way, right? Because aerogel, contrary to that imagination, is something that is hard, dry, and also very strong at the very same time. Because aerogel is effectively hydrogel, or water gel, whose water is removed and substituted with air. So that is exactly the reason why the name is aerogel. So what is it exactly about aerogel that makes it a super material to begin with? First thing first, it is an excellent insulator. If you look in the picture, that person's hand was not hurt by the fire at all. And mind you, that that fire is a blue fire, meaning to say that the temperature is very high. But because it was so insulating, that person could literally put his hand there without having to worry that probably his flesh is going to be burned into a barbecue of human flesh. Secondly, it is a solid of 99% air. So this is exactly the reason why an author of New York Times once wrote an article about aerogel. She stated that aerogel is a perfect a contradiction as a material could be. So then it sounds confusing, right? Because how can exactly a solid be 99% air? Right? But it does work that way. That is what aerogel is. And because of that, it is almost weightless. Just to give you guys a perspective on just how light um, an aerogel is. If we have a cubic block of aerogel whose dimension is 1 meter to 1 meter to 1 meter, the weight of this big block is only 900 gram. It doesn't even exceed 1 kilogram to begin with. Goes to show that actually it is very, very light. And fourthly and the most importantly, it is so small yet so wide. So what does this mean? When we are talking about the surface area of a material, oftentimes people think of, like for example, if you are talking about supermaterial of a cubic item, we think that the supermaterial is only at the top and the bottom, and the front and the back, and also the two sides. But when it comes to materials that are porous, things that have a lot of pores inside, we have to consider the surface area of these pores as well. So if we can find a theoretical way for us to spread this area, it could literally cover a whole football field. Right? If we have a block of aerogel whose dimension is only one uh, inch cube. Right. So, so the synthesis of aerogel. So this is the um, general process on how exactly we synthesize an aerogel. There are three processes which are in succession with one another. The first process is called gelation. This is the process in which we create the hydrogel. So that is exactly the reason why I stated earlier. Aerogels used to be hydrogel, but we remove the water. Right? Or maybe like in the a language of millennials, glow up is real here, right? And then the next thing that is happening is that once we have gotten that um, water gel or hydrogel, what we do is that we exchange the solvent. We remove the water by adding in ethanol. And then the third thing is that we are going to dry it by supercritical drying. So this is a block of hydrogel. The reason why it is blue is to show you guys that the blue color represents water and the circles represent the pores inside the hydrogel. The next thing, so this is the gelation process by the way, what we have here is hydrogel. The next thing is that, once we do solvent exchange, we remove the water, and then we put in the solvent that we use, which is actually ethanol, and then we have alcohol gel. Alcohol gel is the combination of the word alcohol and also gel, meaning to say that this gel it now contains alcohol. And then the third thing is that we are going to use supercritical drying as a way for us to dry the aerogel. So now what you have here is that the gel that consists of empty pores and within these pores are only air. So that is exactly the reason why it was like that. That is exactly the reason why it is a solid but it is 99% air. Because all these pores are now filled with air. So why exactly do we use supercritical drying? Because now we are going a bit technical into chemistry. When we are talking about liquids, right? Liquid has two things. First, it has surface tension. And secondly, it has this one thing that is called adhesion force. So, if we try to remove water by adhesion force, what is going to happen is that the water will try to pull the material and the wall together with it. And therefore, that thing is going to shrink. 
And it is going to be exactly like what happened to SpongeBob when he entered the tree dome of sandy cheeks without wearing his bowl of water, right? So we do not want that thing to happen. Because if it shrinks, then we're going to lose the paw, then there is no point of us trying to even create this aerogel to begin with. Because the reason why we synthesize aerogel is because we want to have that paw. Because these paws are going to be used later in my speech. So, before I talk about specifically on the beta cyclodextrin and also alginate hydrogel, which is the aerogel that I synthesized specifically for this study, we must first understand that there are two types of aerogel. The first one is hydrophilic aerogel, aerogels that are capable of dissolving in water at, and capable of absorbing water at the same time, depending on the morphology and also the structure of the aerogel. And secondly, we have hydrophobic aerogels. The reason why it is important for us to understand the nature of its interaction with water is because if it is hydrophilic, it could be used for drug carrier and also wound dressing. While meanwhile, if it is hydrophobic, then we can use it for insulator, adsorbent, electronics, and cosmic dust capture. We cannot use hydrophilic aerogel to be insulator because if it is raining, then this insulator is definitely going to blow up and then you're going to get the damaged insulator. We cannot have that, right? So that is exactly the reason why we require to use hydro, we are required to use hydrophobic aerogel for these four um, purposes. But specifically, when it comes to the alginate slash beta cyclodextrin aerogel, it is currently um, looked into its ability to be used in pharmaceutical application, mainly as a drug carrier and also wound dressing. So this is the part where I'm going to show, share with you guys something that happened to me. So as you guys can see, I'm a very skinny guy. So the reason why I'm skinny is because not only because my metabolic rate is very high, it is also because my digestive system is compromised. I cannot really absorb amino acid that well. So the physician that inspected my body told me that I have to take amino acid supplement. But then during the first time I took this supplement, so this is the part where it gets uh, disgusting by the way. A few hours after I took that supplement, I went to the toilet, I pooped, and then when I looked there, the pee was still literally there. The reason why is because the carrier that was used to carry that amino acid was not water soluble. So if it is not water soluble, then that amino acid cannot be distributed to my body. So it was just like there is not even any point for me to take that amino acid to begin with. So that is the reason why I'm still skinny. It's sad, right? So this is exactly, so this is an unloaded aerogel, by the way. It is empty. It is now, um, you know, consists of a lot of empty um, uh, pores. But then the next thing that we do is that we can load it with any drug that we want to administer to the people. So that when the people, when, when someone consumes it, it gets dissolved in water, and then that is the moment in which the drug is going to be able to be administered to the body. So the next question, is it safe? There are three things that we have to take into consideration when we are talking about safety and hazard. Methodically, materially, and environmentally, beta cyclodextrin slash alginate hybrid of aerogel is very safe. The reason why is because alginate is actually uh, derived from seaweed. And currently, it is used by Japanese in their food, which is mochi. So I believe you guys know that it is like the Japanese equivalent of kuehochi. And then like, even like uh, methodically, it is also safe. Because we are using supercritical drying, using carbon dioxide, which is not corrosive and also non-toxic at all. And more importantly, it is very environmentally friendly because it is very water soluble. So if it happens, if, if it goes one time where someone decided to throw away this pill into the water thinking that they no longer need all this kind of stuff, it is not going to cause any harm because it will just, you know, get dissolved in the water and be done with it. Finally, capitalism. What about economic prospect, right? So there are five things that we have to discuss here. It is made of cheap material, right? Because like um, the last I checked in Alibaba, uh, by the way, um, beta cyclodextrin, um, the, the price of beta cyclodextrin is only $20 per pound. And then also like even the alginate, you can get it easily from shops and also like from dealers and it is very cheap as well. It is also cost efficient process. The reason why is because we are using we are using supercritical drying using carbon dioxide, which is in and, in and of itself, and it won't even like get contaminated at all if you do it properly. So we can recycle the use of this carbon dioxide for plenty of times, right? So that at the end of the day, what you are going to get here is a cost efficient process. And more importantly, it is also very time efficient because 
if we dry the gel by using evaporation, not only that shrinkage is going to happen, it will take around 24 to 48 hours for the drying to be finished to begin with. But supercritical drying only requires four hours, right? So if the time of processing is shorter, this means that the production is going to be higher, and therefore a lot of people are going to get more money, and everyone is going to be happy. And then like, so these two things are interrelated with each other when it comes to job prospect and also integration of aquaculture sector and pharmaceutical industry. So the last I checked in 2018, the seaweed production of Malaysia, particularly in Terengganu and also Kelantan, um, well, you know, like picked up to 44.2 million ringgit, right? But where, where did all this seaweed go? It went to the northern Asian country like Korea, like Japan, or probably China. Meaning to say that economically speaking, if we send the things that we have to other country, what we are doing here is that we are as effectively as sending our own money out. But the moment in which we have this kind of process, integrated within our economy, what we're going to have here is that we're going to have a win-win situation where not only we would be able to export our um, you know, seaweed to other country, but also we could use that seaweed for us to create this aerogel and this means that a lot of people are going to look into or probably venture into the business of um, you know, seaweed farming and therefore it's going to create a lot of jobs. And again, people are going to get more money, everyone is going to be happy, happy as well. Okay, so finally, what are the future ventures um, here, right? So like the future ventures that we have is for example, carbon sequestration, right? Because like, so I have had a lot of discussion with a lot of people. So UITM as a university and my faculty in UITM specifically is looking very deep into carbon sequestration. Due to the fact that aerogels are very porous, this means that it has the ability to store carbon as effectively as limestones underneath the earth, right, in the earth's crust. But then what do we do here is that probably if we wanted to increase the ability of these aerogels to sequester carbon, we can probably characterize the surface so that carbon can effectively bind on the surface of these aerogels and therefore we would be able to sequester the carbon effectively and we would, might be able to reverse climate change in the future. Because what we have to understand is that according to IPCC, by 2050, if you don't do anything, we are doomed to the destruction of our Earth, and I think that is the moment in which everyone is going to die. Secondly is that as an absorbent, right? So the ability for something to be absorbent is dependent upon it being um, water insoluble. So this also means that for future prospect, probably what we can do is that we can characterize the surface of these aerogels so that it is not water soluble, but at the same time, it is capable of absorbing things that we want to remove from, let's say, water and things like that, right? And I think that like, the absorption by aerogel is going to be more effective because the fact that we are relying on pores meaning to say that it is a physical absorption process. So if it is a physical absorption process, this means that we can keep on continuing to use this aerogel for many times, for, for, like, for many instances of absorption, right? Because like those things are literally not binding on the material. So it is much better for us to use it as an absorbent. And then in the most importantly, decontaminant, right? So I had an, uh, encounter, I mean, I had an experience where a friend of mine tried to kill himself by eating, by taking, um, by being over, uh, over, overdosed, right? So what the hospital did to decontaminate him from the poisoning was that the hospital literally gave him activated carbon to purge out that poison from his stomach. But the problem with uh, activated carbon is that it is not really that safe and it could be toxic at very high amount. So we think that if we can make it water insoluble, what we can use with this aerogel is that it could become a decontaminant. So if it comes to a point where we use it as a decontaminant and some of it actually, you know, like stay in the human body, it is not going to be a problem because it is as good as you eating the mochi that was made by the Japanese. So the conclusion here is this. Um, according to um, Dr. Strange, we are now in the end game, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. A lot of people do not exactly know how do we improve the drug administration. And how exactly do we ensure that when people take the drug, the drug is not going to be wasted out by expression? We think that this is one of the many ways in which we would be able to improvise the way we can administer the drug to the people so that in the future, I think this is going to be the dawn of a new era. 
and I think it is going to be a kickstart to a better development of the pharmaceutical industry. That is all from me. Thank you. As an engineer, he has been involved in testing, developing and solving issues regarding the process of making new products. He also supervised some interns and worked in a team to manufacture various products. He is very interested in research, particularly in material engineering and has a passion in teaching. So, Mr. Sufyan, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Okay. 
problem so I just continue my presentation it's okay I think I just continue with my presentation I think you have an idea of what will happen <laughs> yes. so uh, it is actually uh, this is the graph uh, for our total export good in 2017 in Malaysia so as you know Malaysia is one of the biggest uh, country that contributed uh, E and E sector which is electrical and electronic products uh, to the Southeast Asians and then, uh, based on this graph, you can see 36% uh, of this uh, uh, export good uh, came from electrical and electronic device products that uh, have been uh, exported uh, to throughout the uh, to the world. And then it costs uh, the the export value it costs to nearly up to 100 million dollar of uh, America. So this step shows that Malaysia is as one of the biggest uh, E and E uh, exporter in the world, and uh, we have a very good driving uh, enough E and E driving uh, E and E sector. So, what is electrical and electronic product? Product. So, electrical and electronic product is actually uh, to uh, convert our electrical energy to uh, motion, heat, or into light, and then it also uh, 
change uh, our, to make our life is more easier by manipulating the electrical energy. So this is some of examples of our daily uh, electro EMP products that we use in our daily life. So we have a computer, laptop, and also uh, your phones. So electrical component. What is electrical component? Electrical component is actually that lead a connection uh, for uh, that lead connection to form an uh, electronic circuit into the uh, into the uh, certain figures, uh, certain certain function. So by using electrical certain electrical component, we can provide a very uh, different depends on a uh, electrical component. So here is sums of electrical component, which is resistor. Uh, uh, transformers and also capacitor. So, uh, back in 15 years uh, uh, back then, our industry are driven by uh, very uh, very easily uh, of electronic manufacturing. But then, as the time goes, the sophistications and diversification increasing over time. This is, has caused our production assembly line. Uh, produce a uh, very tight uh, into a problem. So with that, there is a certain requirement to create a very robust and reliable of solder uh, materials in order to overcome this. So we have uh, jumped into my uh, main focus uh, topic, which is uh, soldering. So soldering is a metallurgical bonding that used to uh, bond uh, to uh, solder for the bond formations and then it uh, so the material is a fusible metal alloy to create a permanent bond between the metal work piece so what is actually a solder material solder material is uh, in our easy way we can put as a glue so it uh, used as a connector between a uh, electrical component print to connect with the to connect electrical component with the printed circuit board in our ENE &E products so with that, it produce uh, it acts as a bridge connector to produce uh, in a electrical connection. So back then, uh, fifty years back then, in our conventional uh, E and E uh, industry, we use lead solder, which is uh, lead solder is very interesting. They have a lot of good characteristics and properties, but because of uh, lead is a very intoxic element, so we have to reduce. Rojas ROHS yes, and also many other legislatives have banned the use of uh, lead in uh, solder materials. And because of that, this is very, uh, <coughs> very uh, harmful to our human body, such as it can cause a high blood pressure and also constipation, nausea, and also poor appetite. And also in our industry. Oh, sorry. In our industry also, most of them are using a solder material, a sort lead free lead solder material. So for the lead solder material, the managing of the waste management is very expensive. So they are taking uh, an easy way by dumping the waste into the the waste of lead solder material into the land into the landfill, which is it cause the uh, pollution or uh, environmental pollution. And then it's also with the lead solder, it can feel, uh, it can cause the lead uh, oxide, and which is it is very dangerous to the solder soldering workers. So the next is the timeline. So how uh, the changing face of uh, the changing face of the lead free sol lead solder to the lead free solder. So as you can see, the situation I divided into two situations, which is first one in Europe, and then the second one in USA and Southeast Asia. So it was back then uh, at 2002, which is they have uh, adoptions of uh, ROHS, which is stand for Restriction of Hazardous Substance. And then they put a limitation and also uh, you have only to use 0, 0 0.1 of usage only uh, of uh, lead, so, so, uh, lead solder in your uh, E and E product, and then it followed constantly uh, by the years until updated uh, the latest one in 2015, which is uh, addition of banned substance is continuously uh, uh, updates. 
and also the situation back in USA started at 1986 which is the issue of the lead band reduction in material only 0.2 lakh in flux or solder is on is allowed in a uh, sector and then also it's followed by Japan Jeta standardized lead free solder and then it continued by other country such as China and also South Korea so the changing from the lead Lead solder to lead free solder is started by this person, Ivor Anderson, in 1990, which is he produced the SAC solder alloy, which is, it is uh, uh, from uh, tin, silver, and copper. So, uh, based, uh, back then, tin lead was uh, come from tin lead, which is uh, tin, and, tin and lead. Uh, but then, uh, this person, Ivor Anderson, one of a uh, from prominent uh, professor in soldering uh, materials, they have suggested try to use uh, SAC, and it was a success, huge success, which it followed by Japan, and then uh, Japan is using tin 0.7 copper with the addition of micro alloying 0.05 nickel, and it also have been uh, a, a huge success with this material, and both of these materials, SAC and tin 100 uh, SN100C, has been used mostly in our reflow soldering methods and then it continued to grow until uh, now which is uh, we are currently finding uh, lead, so lead free solder for high reliability of applications so why i'm using tin copper as a base solder material so first of all is uh, besides uh, tin uh, tin copper tin copper uh, nickel uh, and sac305 this one has a very manufacturing cost, um, has a very uh, manuf low manufacturing cost and is quite cost-wise and it is a uh, near eutectic temperature as approximately at uh, 2 to 7 uh, degree and it also has a lot more room to improve because before this tin uh, SN100C is coming from 0 0.7 copper so right now they have uh, these two most, uh, uh, most used one so it uh, left uh, us with uh, tin copper which is uh, they have still a lot more to improve with these materials so what material that i will use uh, i will use a method of micro alloying instead of micro alloying you also can use tlts and also uh, added with composite uh, material to this uh, tin uh, base alloy and then i will be using a rack of element rack of element as a micro alloying element and then i'll be using sorry i'll be using uh, and then I will produce uh, solder compositions. Uh, I will be produce a solder composition at a certain amount of uh, rate of element. I'm afraid I already done the, the, the research, but then because uh, this research is uh, uh, kind of private and confidential, so I can't I can't reveal to what uh, the, the, the certain uh, percentage uh, of the real percentage that I use. So and then the next one is going for uh, solder alloy characterizations. So. What is micro alloying? It's added, just added uh, a new element into the uh, into the new uh, alloying element. So, it, for in a small amount, which is below than 0 0.05, below than 0 0.5. And then, as example, as I uh, tell you earlier, is uh, the usage of uh, 0 0.05 nickel as a micro alloying addition into the tin 0 0.7 copper. So, I'm what I'm trying to do here is try to mimic. Uh, uh, based on a uh, previous study, but I'm using a uh, array of element and then why uh, and why strengthening of solder alloy is required this because uh, pure metal is inherently due to presence of dislocations and to increase the mechanical properties we have to eliminate these dislocations so by introducing some mechanism uh, that will be used is strengthening mechanism so what strengthening mechanism that I will be used is actually solid solution strengthening and how solid solution strengthening works is like this. Please. <laughs> so as you can see, this is the grain atom of tin, and then with the twin grain of our, we have we will have a, a different atomic size of another element, which is this is a, a carbon, nickel, and also molybdenum, and all of these are attached uh, together from, to form uh, a new uh, distort of uh, atomic structure and then with the distortion of the atomic structure it can make the atom uh, difficult to move and slide and it will increase the mechanical properties of the materials so as you can see here carbon 
it really acts as an interstitial, uh, interstitial uh, solid solution. And then why molybdenum will act as a substitutional. And then the next one is a nickel that, has, uh, that acts as a small substitutional uh, material, which is it collapse the, the structure of the tin and then it make, uh, the, uh, it make the strength of the material uh, more greater. And, say, and then the findings of the uh, what I found in uh, in this uh, preliminary study is actually in solder they have a eutectic region and beta tin region. So in my field I was trying to reduce uh, this beta tin region. So with the, this is the uh, the pure one that I use for uh, a base, and then the next one I added with certain amount of red of element, and then with the additions of the certain element with a certain amount of the red of element, the beta tin size is slightly reduced. So by this method, it is also proved by the, this I'm using OM, which is optical microscope, and the next one is uh, using SCM, it also shows the same results, which is the, the size of the beta tin is slightly reduced. So why this, uh, the, the beta tin size reduce is very important, it is because with the reducing size of beta T region, it actually uh, produce a, a, a beta a, a beta a beta mechanical properties that is stated by the whole patch effects as mentioned by other colleague. Because whole patch whole patch effect stated that uh, when we produce a smaller grain structure, we can get a beta a beta uh, mechanical properties. So microstructure uh, of uh, this uh, improved. Red of element as a micro addition is uh, slightly refined. <clears throat> and then uh, I'm using EBSD method, which is an uh, electronic backscattered uh, diffraction machine to see uh, the crystal graphics of the solder alloy, the characterizations of the crystal graphics. And then this is the schematic uh, of uh, EBSD samples, which is. Uh, <coughs> These are the samples and then the EBSD detector. So EBSD is actually a accessory attachment to the SEM, which is used to uh, to create uh, orientations uh, to, to see uh, orientation angles and crystallography of the uh, base alloy. So what I get is actually, uh, this is uh, the base and then we, this is the addition with the red of element. With the addition of red element, it shows that it's distribute well in the bulk regions of the solder materials. So with this shows that it is uh, not forming into a phase, uh, phase precipitation. So it is uh, shows that this uh, red earth element is going into the grain boundaries of the of the atom and then it strengthens the atom by uh, by staying there. So uh, RE is well in bulk region area and with addition does not change the melting point drastically. So this is uh, another result which is we get uh, with additions of uh, gallium, it uh, also not uh, much change in the uh, melting temperature and it is a good way because we do not change, we do not have to change uh, the, the, uh, the process. And then the next one is the crystallized uh, fractions. So it shows that uh, this, what the, the, the this is the legends. The structure is a yellow, recrystallized is blue, and the deforms is a red one. So as you can see, uh, most of uh, with the addition of a certain percentage of a uh, red of element, it truly deforms the tin uh, tin solder alloy. So the conclusion uh, is actually. An improvement of microstructure from microalloying of tin zero, uh, tin copper uh, at a certain percentage addition of a red of elements, and then uh, the fine and tin uh, IMC in the bulk solder uh, also uh, slightly reduced, and then uh, we also uh, managed to get an in situ real time imaging observation growth rate of uh, interfacial series six and five, which is it is shows that. The, the change we, we can show uh, we, we can uh, know the direction growth of uh, where the IMC grows which whether it's move, move to the bulk or into into this interstitial IMC but too bad I, I, I can't show you uh, the result but I just stating uh, the, what I found and then uh, the rank of element inhibition deform the crystal structure of thin copper so that's all for my presentations
and thanks to Ministry of Education Malaysia, uh, University of Malaysia Police, and also uh, my Center of Excellence. Uh, give a round of applause to CJ Tech for uh, supporting me. And also, that's all from my side. And thank you very much. I look at the yeah, two, two points here uh, where your conclusion of your, your research here did not, did not take into consideration, I think, two main properties here. Yes. Yeah, first of all, is the uh, electrical conductivity upon the uh, inclusion of your okay. rare earth okay. Uh, okay. Uh, alloy yeah. element. Mm -hmm. The other one with, with the alloy itself, uh, have you also considered into the de alloying effect, which is a corrosion effect on? Alloying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting question. Which is uh, this is uh, we have uh, this, is my, this is my PhD study. So I have uh, four objective. So the first objective is to achieve uh, the microstructure alloying first. So I will doing the microstructure analysis first. But then uh, uh, I'm currently right now finishing uh, the, the the second one, which is the solder ability. And then the next phase is actually the resistivity and the corrosion of the. Uh, <coughs> Rate of element and also the conductivity. So yes, I will be look into that. But because they, they have a, a four stage, so the stage uh, of resistivity and also corrosion is in the stage three. Then uh, the, the, the fourth one will be thermocyclic test. Yes, because uh, this target uh, of uh, lead alloy is for using for high power interconnect, maybe in automotive or aerospace. So then that's the answer. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. But I'm very concerned about this mystery rare of okay. your X, X percentage. <laughs> You're adding it to your soldier and it's getting strong. It's not, it's not and so you know why I'm asking this, right? Yes. Uh, you know what happened with, uh, just after PRU, right? Yes. Yeah. So I hope you're not one of the main contributors to <laughs> no, uh, no. the pollution in Kuantan. No. <laughs> That's why we are using a lead free solder instead of black solder because No, not the lead solder. Okay. The, the rare earth. Okay, no, no. Okay, uh, the the rare earth You're element. Putting the rare earth. Yes, the rare mystery uh, rare earth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, okay. The I don't know X could be anything. <laughs> the X is actually uh, the the percentage of the additions. And then uh, <laughs> the R E is a rare of elements. So the rare of element is this. Is a uh, hundred percent safe, and it we it not harm to our human body. That's and what they told uh, YB Fauzi, I think. Okay, I just tell you uh, because it is uh, I'm using gallium as my rare yeah. element, so gallium is practically safe, and then you can touch it by your hand. <laughs> so it is a uh, uh, liquid, uh, it's easy melted liquid, so it is very safe. Right. So you do not do not have to worry about. Uh, the side effects of the pollution or environmental yes, issues. Yes. So that's all. Yes. At first, I was expecting thank you to Linus. So I was quite. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I was not thank you to Linus. Uh, so I know. I don't right. have any yeah, any right. uh, relation with Linus. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sufian. On behalf of the committee, we would like to deeply apologize for any unexpected technical issue that happened just now. So now, without further ado, we'd like to welcome our next presenter from Curtin University, Malaysia, Ms. Yap Yin Wei. Ms. Yap Yin Wei is doing her final year in Curtin University, Malaysia as a mechanical engineer student. She is currently involved in materials research on doping metal alloys in her final year project. So, Ms. Yon, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening to our respected judges, honorable guests, uh, fellow participants, and also audiences. So, my name is Yap Yen Wei, and today I will be presenting to you the topic liquid metals as emerging functional materials towards engineering application. Now, before I move on to my topic, I would like to show you my abstract. First, I'll be discussing about liquid metals that I can find in a periodic table. And the five liquid metals that I'll be discussing today will be rubidium, cesium, francium, mercury, and gallium. 
Now, these are the five liquid metals that we'll be discussing. I'll tell you the properties and the applications of these liquid metals in, in, in engineering, and also uh, give an example of uh, the future of liquid metals in engineering application. Now, the lecture outline today will cover the introduction, liquid metal properties, the applications, and the future of liquid metals in engineering field. And I've also provided references for the illustration that I've uh, included in the slides. So the introduction of liquid metals. Liquid metals, it's solid in its liquid state. Right? Because of its low melting point, that's why it is in a liquid state. And uh, the low melting point generally is around room temperature. And the five liquid metals I'll be discussing will be rubidium, cesium, francium, gallium, and mercury. Now the position of these liquid metals you can find in the periodic table is here. The first three uh, liquid metals are rubidium, cesium, francium. You can find in group 1 elements, they are also alkali metals. And then you can see mercury at the transition metals group and gallium at the post-transition metals group. Now, what is so special about liquid metal? First, we look into rubidium. Rubidium has an atomic number of 37 and a melting point of 39.3 degrees Celsius. A boiling point of 688 degrees Celsius. It is pyrophoric. Because it's an alkaline metal, this is one of its behavior. It's pyrophoric. Pyrophoric means that it ignites spontaneously in the presence of air. And it has a soft and silvery outlook. Now if you look at this picture, this is rubidium. And rubidium uh, normally uh, seal in this ampoule, ampoule and then it has a soft and silvery outlook. Now we look at this video of the reaction of rubidium with water. It's just a small amount of rubidium in water and you can see it ignites at first and then it becomes explosive. Meaning to say rubidium is actually a rare reactive metal. Even so, it's reactive, it has its engineering applications as well. Two examples I provide as uh, Rubidium's uh, engineering application, we have the atomic clock. Now, how the atomic clock works is that uh, it uses hyperfine transition of electrons in Rubidium 87 atoms, and it's used to control the output frequency. Now, this Rubidium atom uh, atomic clock is a very accurate clock and is normally used to control frequency of GPS. We can also use rubidium in a uh, photocell. They use uh, rubidium atoms to, and this photocell acts as a light sensor. So it converts light energy to electrical energy. Now moving on to the next liquid metal that I'll be discussing, which is cesium. Now in the periodic table, uh, cesium is below rubidium. So it has an atomic number of 55 and a melting point of 28.5 degrees Celsius, a boiling point of 670.8 degrees Celsius, and it is also pyrophoric. It has a soft and gold tint outlook, as you can see from this picture. And cesium is known to be a soft metal. Now if you look at this video playing right here, cesium is submerged in kerosene and is easily cut. It's submerged in kerosene just because that they don't want cesium to react with water. Uh, it has a very, it's a very reactive metal. So they just want to show you how easy it is to cut cesium. Next, I'll also show you the reaction of cesium in water. Theoretically, it's supposed to be more reactive than rubidium. And you see the explosive effect of cesium in water. Alright, now what can you do with cesium? Basically, cesium has similar engineering applications to rubidium, but the cesium atomic clock is more accurate than rubidium atomic clock. It uses hyperfine ground state of cesium-133 atoms to control the output frequency, and for now, it's known as the most accurate time and frequency standard. We also can use cesium in photoelectric cells, so cesium atoms are stimulated by direct sunlight, and then it the electron flows to create an uh, electric current. So it generally means it converts light energy to electrical energy. 
Now moving on to friendship. Friendship is a very radioactive element, a very uh, rare liquid metal, and it also is also very unstable. It has an atomic number of 87 and a loading point of 27 degrees Celsius, a boiling point of 676.8 degrees Celsius. Now, in this case, due to its extremely radioactive and uh, unstable behavior, there are no commercial ex uh, applications yet for friendship. However, there are researchers and uh, chem uh, chemistry researchers on friendship on medical applications such as medical imaging for PET scans or x-rays or they are trying to propose friendship to be used for chemotherapy but until now it's not applicable yet because it, they have not found a way a uh, cost-effective way to track friendship atoms now mercury mercury is a very common liquid metal and it is commonly used in many engineering applications. So it has an atomic number of 80 and a melting point of negative 38.83 degrees Celsius, also known as a freezing point for some cases, and a boiling point of 356.73 degrees Celsius. It has a silvery outlook. Now for mercury, we commonly know that uh, it is used for thermometers to measure temperature, and it's also used in compact fluorescence like bulbs. Now, mercury itself has a, tox it's a toxic liquid metal. So, mercury has been used in medical applications also as well. They're used in uh, dental fillings. But then it has been phased out due to its toxic uh, behavior. Besides that, there's, uh, there are some issues and concerns about mercury where I will discuss later with a video. Now, Moving on to gallium. Gallium is also a liquid metal, a very common liquid metal in fact, and the atomic number is 31, a melting point of 29.76 degrees Celsius. It has a boiling point of 2,400 degrees Celsius, the highest boiling point among all the liquid metals that I've discussed today. It's non-toxic and has antimicrobial properties. What do we use the gallium liquid metal for? Now we look at gallium properties, we see that gallium, you can put it on your hand and it's in its liquid state, and you can play around with your hand. The engineering applications of gallium right now has been used in many electronics, and we have used a uh, gallium nitride transistor, and also a uh, gallium indium embedded silicon self-healing circuit. If you watch this video, you see that the clock is ticking. On top is a self healing circuit and at the bottom is a normal circuit. So they start cutting they start cutting the serial bus line. So they damage the bus line and then the clock stops ticking. But for the self healing circuit, it still keeps ticking. After they try to cut the power circuit, the power line is damaged and then the clock has stopped completely. But the self-healing circuit, the more damages it gets, it still, it still keeps sticking. And then uh, they actually fast forward this video. So you see that this helps self-healing circuit, no matter how much damage it gets, it doesn't affect the circuit. Yes. Right. But there are some issues and concerns that we need to look into alloying liquid metals with other metals. So like I've said before, uh, mercury, Mercury is toxic and also alloying mercury with other metals may cause amalgamation. And amalgamation meaning it dissolves other, meta other metals. As in this case, uh, mercury, they put a gold leaf on top of mercury and this is the time lapse video. So you see that mercury is slowly dissolving the gold leaf. And for gallium case, gallium causes aluminium to be very brittle. So you see that they are applying gallium on top of aluminium cans and then wait for the reaction to happen. And after that, when they try to remove the gallium, you see that the surface of the aluminium can starts to uh, be easily destroyed.
So the aluminium is actually become very brittle due to gaming. Right. However, even though gallium uh, may corrode aluminium, but there are other alloying methods you can use for gallium. It doesn't have to be gallium and aluminium. So what are the future applications we can use for liquid metals? Specifically in biomedical application, since mercury has been phased out due to its toxic, uh, toxic behavior, one of the uh, replacement options one of the substitute options we can use, we can propose, would be using gallium due to its non-toxic and antimicrobial behavior. So the future of liquid metal alloy we, uh, that I would like to propose today would be gallium doped with nano silver. Why? Gallium itself is ductile in its solid state. It's a liquid metal and it has antimicrobial and biocompatible properties. So is nano silver. Nano silver is antimicrobial and biocompatible as well, and ductile also. But one other point that we want is highest electrical conductivity. In this case, by doping gallium and nano silver, we can pro we can uh, produce a high conduct, highly electrical conductor, uh, and then it can be implanted in the human body. And so, in this case, by doping them, we can uh, maybe propose a production of implantable medical devices. And today's summary of my lecture, uh, we have discussed five types of liquid metals, rubidium, cesium, gallium, and mercury, and also francium. But we know that only four types of liquid metals are emerging in the engineering application, and that would be rubidium, cesium, gallium, and mercury. As for francium, it has yet to find its purpose in engineering due to uh, people not, be ab uh, not able to find uh, the cost-efficient way to track francium atoms, but there are still a uh, proposed engineering application for francium. And gallium itself, as a non-toxic liquid metal, has a bright future for electronics and biomedical application. Yeah. To end my lecture today, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to IMM Mary Chapter, IMM Student Chapter for giving me this opportunity to compete in this competition. And also, uh, I would like to thank my student advisor and my supervisor, Dr. Sumaya and Dr. Mahmoud, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Good as a conductivity, so is there any effect uh, the gall uh, the gallium to the uh, copper contact of uh, copper joining? Gallium to copper joining. Effect of uh, you, before this you mentioned about gallium is a good conductivity. Is there any uh, study or any? Any study about the contact of the gallium to the copper to the copper uh, media? Yes, there is. Uh, there, there are, there are studies regarding gallium uh, copper alloying, and they study the uh, they study the degradation of uh, gallium, and they study the biocompatibility of gallium doped with copper in uh, bacteria. And so far, they find out that. Uh, due to gallium's presence, they is uh, able to behave antimicrobially, so to uh, destroy the bacteria cells. Okay. Um, I, I just recently uh, used mercury uh -huh. for a, a brush contact to a, a wheel. Uh, which we will, we will we will really worry about the toxicity so toxicity of of mercury. Now gallium is, is interesting. I'm not familiar with gallium, but what do you see the 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 problems in the application of uh, gallium, especially in terms of the probability of it and uh, certainly come with the price of gallium. Uh, 
regarding uh, availability of gallium, gallium is actually quite available right now. It's very, it's a very common liquid metal. As for the price, it's sold about two dollars per uh, per gram. So it's not considered as very expensive material. So it can be uh, easily easily found and easily available material for uh, industry purpose. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Yap, for such an exclusive slide. Okay, now, without further ado, let us move on to our second last presenter of the day. We would like to welcome our presenter from Multimedia University, Ms. Ko Bao Zin. Ms. Bao Zin was born in Johor, Malaysia. Currently, she is an Epsilon student in Multimedia University pursuing bachelor degree in Mechanical Engineering. She is currently working on her final year project with the title on the improvement of the design and fabrication of an ergonomic baby stroller which was accepted for general publication. Ms. Baozin, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Okay, I'm sure it has been a long day but I hope that everyone can bear with me for the next 15 minutes. A very good afternoon to the panel of judges, respected guests, fellow contestants, ladies and gentlemen present in this hall today. My name is Kurosi and I'm from Multimedia UST, currently my final year of mechanical engineering. My topic of research today will be on humanizing the future of baby stroller. What is humanizing? Sounds fancy, right? In simple terms, it means improving. So today's presentation will be a deeper understanding on the applications and designs of a baby stroller from when it was first invented to now and also possible upcoming innovations. Baby strollers are also known as baby transport when they help to navigate your life with your newborn baby. It helps you to ease the burden of having to carry a child for a very long period, especially for long walks or even short walks. My topic, humanizing the baby stroller, will be broken down into six contents, where it starts off with the history of baby strollers, benefits, considerations for designing a baby stroller, fabrications, new innovations, which will be the highlight of my presentation, and followed by conclusion. I'm sure many of you sitting here have used or owned a baby stroller. And if not, well, I think it's a good day for you guys to learn about it because, you not know, just for future reference. Now, people might ask me, why do you choose to research and talk about baby strollers? Well, according to this graph generated from Google search engines, where the number of articles and reports on baby strollers from the year 2008 to just of last year 2018 shows an increasing trend. This means that manufacturers and societies are still showing great interest on baby stroller, especially on its applications and designs. Next, society is obsessed with having things that are multifunctional, where one machine or object serves so more than just one purpose. There's also the concept of growing with the child that parents are fond of. What do I mean by that? Baby strollers are usually used for newborns up to maybe two years old. But when he or she grows older, maybe it can be used for something else. Maybe the chair can be detached, used as a car booster seat or dining table chairs. Now, speaking of baby strollers, aren't you curious to know when was the first baby stroller invented? Let me take you back to the past, to when and how baby strollers were developed. William Ken was an inventor who invented the first baby stroller in the year 1733, which was way many generations ago, with the purpose to transport two heaven shores children and alongside to amuse them. And as we can see in figure one, it was designed to be pulled by an animal. Coming to the mid-1800s, baby stroller handles were reinvented to be pulled by humans instead of animals. Okay, so we all know pushing is easier than pulling. So baby stroller invented by Charles Burton in 1848 with the abilities to push the baby stroller. In 1889, William Richardson was an African-American inventor who invented this baby stroller in figure 4 that can have the seat to be adjusted where parents can have their child facing towards them or away from them. Again, I'm sure everyone here has used an umbrella and understand how it works. In 1965, Owen Lucari invented the first umbrella stroller which has collapsible structures just like how an umbrella works. And as you can see from the previous designs, first umbre this umbrella stroller was the first stroller that is more towards the modern design instead of the hard shell looking ones that we see from the previous ones. Now in 1986, baby stroller known as Baby Jogger was invented by Phil Becker. This baby jogger I'll be explaining more about in the upcoming slides. In figure 7 shows the today's baby show that we can see in the market today, where it has all the basic features like canopy, 
reels and is portable, it also has multi-purpose functions. And one example of multi-purpose functions that we can see in the market today is rocking mechanism. So you know the wheelchairs are just meant for pushing. But this kind of multi-purpose function like rocking mechanism where you can rock the baby stroller is something rather interesting, right? Next, I'll be explaining about the benefits of baby stroller. How sophisticated is a baby stroller to be able to cater your needs? Let me give you a situation. If you're the parent and you have a child in one arm and grocery bags in the other hand and the weather's very hot, you'll be like, I'm doomed. So this is where baby strollers come in handy. They have canopies that can help to protect your child from UV rays and other ecological elements. It also serves as a safety feature. Baby strollers also have ample storage and is foldable. Being foldable means it consumes less space so that you can store anywhere easily, especially in cars. Storage is provided to carry baby accessories and whatnot. Another great thing about baby strollers is that it's a long-term investment. Being said that if you were to have more than multiple, sorry, more than one children, you can just reuse it again instead of having to buy a new one. It is durable because it is made to keep going for long. They are planned with strong, high caliber, solid materials, which makes them enduring just to keep your child shielded from outer impacts. Now, baby strollers can help you keep fit. How, you may ask? Remember about, the, remember about the baby jogger that I was talking about before? Running is a popular form of activity among many. So baby joggers were designed to help users to keep fit by doing their daily hobbies like strolling or jogging and also running errands and still being safe by doing it. Lastly, there are extra beneficial features to a baby stroller that benefits both the parents and the babies. For example, cup holders, fans, lines and hook connectors. Cup holders where you can put your baby beverage or even your coffee that you take every morning. Fan for weathers that are hot, especially in Malaysia. Lights, especially you can use your baby strollers on dark places. Just switch on the lights and hook connectors, you know, to just hang your shopping box bags. Moving on to the next part of my presentation. So manufacturing a baby stroller is not a walk in the park. There are considerations to be taken. This session helps me to understand the potential problems and how am I to face it when I'm to design one. Okay, so we all know that baby strollers are made for babies. No brainer there. But how much of the maximum baby weight and height that is suitable for a secure and comfortable seating? According to this table generated from World Health Organization, where the information shows the average baby weight and height. So manufacturers then take the maximum value, which is for here is 12.3 cm of an average height and 12.3 kg of the maximum of an average weight and 85.6 cm of an average height. Then usually it's up to 2 years old because usually baby strollers are used from newborns and up to 2 years old. So they take this value and they will design the baby stroller so that they will know the range of the most better places for a sitting. Now, parents' high play an important role too. Moms are usually shorter than that and in some cases it's the other way around. So, so adjustable handles containing elevation set that usually uses telescopic mechanism so that the parents can just pull, elongate it, and just make it back shorter, just to suit the parents' height. Again, also, simple math calculations can be done to know the handle's height. Baby stroller is important for a baby stroller to be strong, so that they will not fail under buckling. ASTM F833 is the standard consumer safety performance specification on carriages and stroller. So if your baby stroller fulfills this, then you're good to go. The materials that are usually used to fabricate baby strollers are steels and aluminiums. Good material selection will, to, will lead to good durability. According to this bubble chart of young modulars against strength, where you can see that steels and alloys, uh, sorry, steel and aluminiums have young modulars, which means have high stiffness and also high strength value. High stiffness is good because it will not succumb to um, drastic change of shape under elastic loads. So you know, if you have like a chubby kid baby, you can just put it on the baby stroller without having it to scare that it will buckle and crash. Next, size also plays an important role. Baby seat should not be too big or too high, but just in the right size. Again, with simple math calculations, we can achieve it. Okay, another lastly is a situation where we do not want to have runaway baby strollers. What do I mean by that? If they saw your hands were not on the handles, and someone accidentally bumps into your baby stroller with your baby in it, and it moves. It is kind of dangerous, right? So, safety considerations are important too. 
Manufacturers then introduce brakes and locks and also safety seat harness for your baby's safety. This is how manufacturers are humanizing baby strollers. Now moving on to the next part of my fabrication process. This is the fabrication process that I'll be fabricating my baby stroller. And this firstly, this is the topology structure of a baby stroller. This shows where the seat and the canopy and the wheels go. Now you might think that designing a baby stroller and manufacturing it does not require math and physics. Well, you're wrong. This is the first diagram of a baby stroller to help to calculate for better stability and also to understand the potential impacts. So this is the fabrication process of my baby stroller frame. Sorry for the baby stroller. We start off with the baby stroller frame, moving on to the canopy, handle, wheels, followed by attachments and assembly. For the baby stroller frame, the bending of metal to form the desired shape will be used or I can modify use existing, existing baby stroller frames. For canopy, a swath of material is to be cut and stitched together. Or again, I can simply purchase an existing canopy and work on with that. Handles and wheels will be modified from existing parts. And for attachments, I have several methods in doing so by purchasing new or used existing attachments or have them fabricated through a 3D printer. After everything is done, assembly will be made. For this whole project, I'll be focusing more about the canopy, attachments, and the wheels. We are coming up to my next slides. New innovations on my path to humanizing baby strollers. Now these are the basic attachments that you know of from the previous slides, and I've chosen these attachments to work on with my baby strollers. How about table with cup holders, phone holder, lights, fan, and car booster seat. But for now, I will not focus much on the car booster seat, but the rest of it. So the issue here is, isn't it a hassle to keep bringing, to be reminded of to bring various attachments with you, and have them carry with you all around? But what if I make them roll combined and rotatable? The attachments that I've chosen to work on are cup holders, lights, and phone holders, and fans. So that this, if I have them rotatable, it's much easier for the users, right? They just need to rotate it to the according attachment that they want to use, or if they don't want to just keep rotating it. So it's actually like a rectangle with every four sides have different attachments, where you just need to rotate it so that you can use them. Next, hoverboards are not new news. It's flooding everywhere. And because of the impending society, I have decided to incorporate hoverboards as the back wheels of the baby stroller. And this picture shows where the hoverboard usually um, goes at the back of the baby stroller. It is great because hoverboard, this hoverboard can be plucked out and played, and we place it back if you're using it for strolling. Another great thing about this baby stroller, this baby stroller with hoverboard as the wheels that can be plucked out. Okay, if you have a baby and a kid, so maybe this hoverboard you can just plug it out if you're not using to stroll for your baby. You can plug it out to let your kid play. Or maybe even you can play it. Finally, about the modifications on the canopy. Mosquitoes are dangerous and are really kind of irritating where parents will not want their child to be exposed to. In the market, there are mosquito nets that we can cover the whole baby seat. As you can see again, isn't it a hassle to be reminded, what if you forgot to bring the mosquito net? And also, it kind of looks suffocating, right? So, what if I have it stitched together with the canopy and also using it velcro tape so that parents can just pull it down when they're in need of use and fold it back up so it's simple and neat looking. In conclusion, I'm a future engineer and you know, usually they say engineers are so busybody, always trying to find ways to improve and do things but they do not know that us being busybody helps the world keep more going interesting. For example, like you can give, I can give example like phone models. Every different month, different phone models are there. X8 or whatever, 10 until, maybe you know when you grow up, it's going to be 20X already. So there are tasks, there are always potential ways to modify existing inventions to account for the future. So my conclusion is, baby strollers are still a trending topic where it can be humanized. There are still improvements that can be done, and baby strollers are a great investment of time and money. And why not? Babies are cute. With that, I want to thank my speech. Thank you. Thank you. So we can start with Dr. Kwan, and then me. Thank you very much. Uh
very thoughtful presentation. It's something very simple and innovating. Um, yeah, um, I'm just curious as to if you've thought about the ergonomics of a child's position. Of you know, when a, a newborn child, the, the position of the how you put the child affects the spine growth. Um, have you thought anything about the angle of the um, the the bed? How it can be more comfortable for the baby as it grows and forms its spine. Okay, so thank you for the question. I've actually done a research on how babies are which suitable sitting padding, like you say, to help to support the backbone of the baby. But for this topology structure, because I've been working on the windows and the canopy and the attachment, so the sitting area is just as usual as every baby shows that you see, that you can move it to be sleeping position or sitting position. So mostly now that you can see the market now that baby children seats are usually like have C padding to help to support your babies. So, but for now, I, I, did talk, I did talk about it, just that I've been focusing more on the wheels and kind of pay attachment that it will not have an effect on the baby seat. Thank you. Thank you. I assume, I think your research is more on design. Yeah, it's very different from yeah. everyone else. When I was introduced at the very beginning, where I went to the Kwanin University in Germany, um, <laughs> the subject that I was asked to teach was culture and design. Mm -hmm. So in Europe, they are very concerned about the impact of culture and design. So I think you have made one very big assumption that there is only one predominant culture, is a European culture, because we don't see any baby strollers coming from the rest of the world. So either people from this part of the world of China don't have babies or they keep them at home. <laughs> so how do you answer to that? Um, you mean about the baby strollers? Yeah, the history, history of the baby strollers. I don't see baby strollers coming. Because from I believe that maybe... Like Europe and America. Yeah, because I believe that I've done many research on this. The ones, the countries that have made the first baby strollers are leading more towards the Europe countries. So. Maybe countries that didn't do the take inspiration from it. So, like I said, with the today's babies, I don't like think it. you have done enough research. Ah, okay. You're just making an assumption that only people from Europe and America put their babies in baby strollers. No, 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 I was just saying about the how baby strollers were developed. I didn't say like this. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, um, I think we should be more sensitive to how much culture has impact on design. This is very much what. Dr. Kwan was uh, saying, I know this is not a question, right? For example, <laughs> some cultures will not like to put babies at a certain age looking like this because they have taboos. Yeah, so we have to take into, if you are talking about design, I think the impact of culture and design should be the prime consideration in the presentation. Thank you for your solution. I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bozu. One point that I do agree with you is baby definitely is cute. So now, let us move on to the final presenter of our competition today. I would like to call upon the presenter, the presenter from University of Malaysia, Sabah, Ms. Siti Zubaira Patuan, to the stage. Ms. Siti Zubaira Binti Patuan, a very nice dress girl, has received her Bachelor of Science and a Master in Industrial Chemistry at University of Malaysia Sabah in 2018. She knows what truly drives the research and it's not about mastering the work, it's how well you evolve and how well your understanding is parallel with the concept. Now without further ado, Ms. Siti Zubaida, the floor is yours. Including that they found that a certain areas around the volcanics have peculiarly have a clean air. And through studies, they found out this one rock have Inside it is spongy-like materials that act as a purifier. And these spongy-like materials are known as natural occurring zeolite. And because of these poten high potentials towards these applications, the researchers wanted more. But we cannot wait like every day to have a volcanic eruption, not we. <laughs> so yes, they're synthetically, they're mimicking the characteristic of natural occurring zeolite to become a synthetic zeolite. And for all my extensive Research around the world, we have over 176 synthetic zeolite. With uh, animal joined together, living harmony, which is cat and dog. So, when it comes to zeolite, it 
It's a combination of two natural occurring zeolites in form of one system. And then what is the natural occurring zeolite? Is the ophritite and the uranite. Most of the zeolite, I give you a secret, is actually meropon silica in alumina. Okay? So, meropon silica in alumina, whenever the researchers wanted to synthesize a synthetic ophritite, they never gain it in a pure form. Always they will have the intermediate of uranite. So the researchers so uh, don't know what to put. Either this material is ophritite or uranite. So they came up with the name of a zeolite tea, which is a zeolite tea is a perfect combination, a harmony of combinations of ophritite and uranite. It is none of the researchers can be able to see this ophritite or uranite separately. Okay? So proceed. What is so special about zeolite tea is that the staking fault, because the ophritite uranite layer one to one has given a spe uh, given special characteristic. Different channels, different voids, they have a different cavities. And these different cavities is very uh, useful as an absorbent. They have a different types of channels, uh, channel size and void size, 0 0.67 range to smallest is 0 0.36. And after this, you will know how to synthesize it. It's a very simple. In order for you to synthesize, last time I'm telling you, zeolite must be made from silica and alumina. So you need to have raw ingredients from silica and alumina. But to the respects of all the knowledgeable researchers, as been listed in a table, in a table all of them are using independent chemicals, which is silica and alumina, and which is, is very expensive. Except in 2013, they're actually using an economic raw materials, which is RHA. RHA is a rice husk ash. They reprocess it to become a silica, but still they need an alumina as another source from the outside. So I've been listening to these researchers, and none of the research group has been using one materials as a starting that consists of silica and alumina. Except by our study, we're actually using one of these materials called a clay. When I mentioned this about the clay, never imagining about this modeling clay that we used to play during kids. Okay? Because a clay that I mentioned is a versatile material, has been ages anciently being used as a pottery, which is beautiful merchandise, but it also can be used to develop and an excellent absorbent called zeolite. This is the morphologies of our crystal synthesis from a clay. So, how I've done this? A set of one chemical compositions, which is, consists of silica and alumina, derived from a clay, put inside a Teflon bottle, activated by the sodium and potassium hydroxide, AG, 24 hours, and after that, put inside an oven for hydrothermal conventional method at elevated temperature. And voila, we have the final product. But the things about this uh, method, you're only going to know your research is actually as you like the way you want is after you have the final, pro final dry product, which is using XRD. You see, above all this listed, my materials not only having a zeolite T, but also have a zeolite L. And for synthesizing zeolite T pure, you, we need to remove the coexistence, which is what will I do? I marry the inorganic with the organic. But introductions, the organic structure directing agents, which is the organic SDA, in order to surpass the crystallizations of zeolite T. It's, it's your, sorry, zeolite L. And then we have a fully grown of zeolite L, zeolite T. Okay? <laughs> okay, but before the characterization, we need to remove the SDA by, by calcining our, term, our sample up to 500 degrees Celsius. And when we calcinate our uh, sample to 500 degrees Celsius, do our samples degrade? It's not. Because zeolite is high temperature resistance. Okay, this will be the XRD pattern. All the sem all the systems has been majorized by zeolite T itself. And this is the morphology, the SEM morphology of zeolite T is a uh, rice like a uh, rice like shape. Okay, proceed with the applications of zeolite T. We're talking about how to make it, we need to know how it's work. 
Ziola T, because of her voice and has been proven as a can, uh, promising candidate to be an absorber, it will be able to absorb carbon dioxide and separate it from the environment, either in a sweet gas or in sour gas or even in the ambient temperature. And it also can be used as absorbent to absorb the azeotrope element, which is any two liquid mixture that uh, sharing the same uh, boiling point. And also, because it contains of cation within the cages, it can be used as an ion exchanger to attract heavy metal inside the liquid form. And this is the permeability gas of zeolite tea that's been conducted before. Zeolite has a high permeability of carbon dioxide as compared to other hydrocarbon. This is because, remember about the structure that I'm concerned about the sizing? Okay, the carbon dioxide have 0.33 nanometer in size. For this void, we have the smallest is 0.36. And for the CH4, 0.38. And for propane, we have 0.43. If the CH4 and the propane can penetrate our membrane, it will never go suppressed on the other side because we have the 0.36 voids in only allowing carbon dioxide to penetrate through the medium. Okay, we proceed with the contributions about these materials. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, on the slide is the CO2 stripper. They're using for urea productions. They're using a sweetener called methyl diethylamine amine, which is MDR. We also uh, label this as a lean. They're using this in inside the column to absorb carbon dioxide from the gas as a sweetener. But the thing is, they this stripper or using an MDR is via chemisorption, which is under chemical reaction in order to trap the carbon dioxide. And when we for the urea production, carbon dioxide is very important because they're going to react the carbon dioxide with the nitrogen to have a urea. So we need to have as much as urea from out of from our system. But this a stripper needs keep small amount of CO2. If there's no amount of CO2 inside the lean, it will go undergo reaction of H2S. If this lean undergo a reaction with the sulfur we need to regenerate it again to remove all the sulfur and which is costly. What I can see to contribute about these materials, uh, zeolite has a high carbon dioxide permeability and it's not, if going to absorb carbon dioxide, it's not going to through chemist options, it's through physics options. No chemical, uh, chemical reaction involved, which is easily to absorb carbon dioxide and easily to remove the carbon dioxide. About high temperature resistance, if this boiling point is 247, last time we're going to calcinate our zeolite at 500 degrees Celsius, remember? In order, yes, in order to remove the organic. So compared to 247, mm, zeolite can suppress the temperature. So what about the cost? About the costing of zeolite Yes, zeolite in any zeolite, they need silica in alumina, which is that one is very expensive. But through this research, we can actually synthesize a zeolite from a clay. And do you know, this is a map of Sabah, we have a kaolin mining in every district in Sabah. Name it, in Sepitang, up to Kota Marudu, Kota Kinabalu, in Sandakan. We have kaolin mining. So if we want to open a new plant to support our economy, Yes, we have, because we can have the sustainability of raw material in order to synthesis, synthesis this excellent absorbent. We agree with me? Yeah, yeah. yeah it should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, as a conclusion, we're going to answer a question that I've emphasized uh, on the outline, which is, what is zeolite? Remember, zeolite is a cat and dog cartoon which is combinations of ofritite and uranite, the faulty materials. And how to synthesize the zeolite tea? I've shown you, you can synthesize it from silica in alumina, but also you can synthesize from a, a clay. And each one of you, if you are using a silica in alumina as your research, you can also use a clay. Be my guest, use it. 
Okay? For the applications and the potentials I've shared to you, it can be an exorber for the uh, for the carbon dioxide, it can trap the heavy metal inside the liquid, and it can also be used as a medium to separate a liquid that has a similar boiling point. And then what are the contributions? We just share these contributions. If we want to increase our economy, we need to open up a road for our research. Don't only bring our research only on lab scales. Because all of our research, I believe, have available things it can be bring forward. It's The matter is how much people trust in us and how much we are brave enough to embark the journey to make it much more bigger. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Not miss this chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 How you manage the waste uh, of uh, July? T. July T. Yes. A waste of July T. If we want to uh, use it as a, going to throw it as a waste. Okay. July T is made up from silica and alumina which is of our soil, it's also made uh, also contained, which is a clay, is contained of silica and alumina. In my point my, in my point of view, silica and alumina is not toxic to our environment. So it can from uh, from now it can be directly discharged and also or we can mix it with another soil to discharge it directly to the environment. Okay, you're done? You're happy? Alright. Okay. Okay. I think you're very brave to say that you put up a photo of Sava and all their clay deposits and how you're going to convince, we must go and convince people on the commercialization of zero light tea. Yes. All right. Now, how are you going to convince the Sabah government to commercialize the zero light tea? Because a Sava government is focusing on uh, renewable energy. It's not only using an oil and uh, petroleum, it's also using an ethanol and other stuff. So Sabah itself, nowadays, they wanted to grow, uh, they wanted to build another plant that focused on renewable and it's always including carbon dioxide. When it comes to trapping a carbon dioxide, they're always wa uh, wanting to find a better absorbance. So currently they're using an economic polymer, which is they're still facing your problems. So why don't we just using our lab data and giving them a chance to make it as a medium, as a uh, one filament, and to study the efficiency of the current absorbent versus the zeolite absorbent. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yay, I'm a teacher. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Siti Zubaida, the creative Siti Zubaida, with such an inspiring presentation. Now, please give a big round of applause to all presenters for all their hard work and very inspiring presentation. With the last presenter of the day, we finally conclude the semi-final of MLC competition. So while we await for the judges to deliberate, we cordially invite everyone for some refreshments at the banquet hall and um, the lobby. We would like to remind everyone to gather in this hall before 6.30 p.m. 6.50 p.m. Sorry, 6.15. 6.15. 6.15 p.m. for the announcement of the finalists of the final MLC 2019. So enjoy your meal and thank you very much for your patience and have a very nice evening. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi washabihi ajma'in. Yang berbahagia Profesor Madya Dr. Zambri bin Jamaluddin, Dean of Fakulti Kejuruteraan Pembuatan on behalf of Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and International University Technical Malaysia Melaka, 
yang berusaha Profesor Dr. Esah Bidi Hamza, Chairperson of IMM MLC 2019 yang berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Jariah Binti Muhammad Joy, Chairperson of MLC 2019 Respected Judges, Distinguished Guests, Participants, University Representative, Ladies and Gentlemen We are gathered here this evening for the Certificate Giving Ceremony and also the announcement Five finalists for the MLC 2019. Without further ado, I would like to request yang berbahagia Profesor Madya Dr Zamri bin Jamaluddin uh, to the stage uh, for some. Uh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I would like to request uh, Prof uh, Dr Zamri to the stage first. Surprise. <laughs> I would like to invite all the judges for some momento as a token of appreciation for their service for today's competition. Calling upon Professor Dr. J. Usna Pinti Asari. Professor Dr. Kwan Seng Hao from Utah. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Mr. Kang Kim Ang from a cultural group of companies. Last but not least, thank you very much, Mr. Salihuddin Adenan from Mudahan Berjaya Engineering, Sindian Berhad. with the certificate giving ceremony to all the participants. We start with Miss Nuraisha binti Ahmad Sharim from IIUM. Next, from UTEM, Miss Nurul Amira binti Azmi. of Nottingham, Malaysia, Mr. Chow Yuan Leong. Very high. <laughs> okay. Our next participant is from UPM, Mr. Lam Jia Yong. College, Mr. Leong Kok Lun. Our next contestant from UKM, Ms. Chiranan Kurut Suan Nur Parirod. Okay, sorry. Okay, Mr. Brian Moi Chiho from APU. the way from Penang, University Science Malaysia, Sarah Sijah and our friend Alki Ali Balakan. Next contestant from UMK, Siti Hajar Binti Zaid Amri. Okay. Okay. 
And last uh, is from UNICEL, Ms. Salmila Narayan Saminaidu. When we receive another time. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Zambri. For the next ten, I would like to request Dr. Jaria uh, to the stage. I would like uh, to invite Mr. Tan Yong Chi from UTM. From UNITEM, Ms. Mr. Sha Sashindran Anak Laki Palani Beru. From University of Malaya, Mr. Ang Kok Bin. Okay. From Batu Pahat, University Tun Hussein on Malaysia, Siti Hadijah Bin Kidermawan. UTP, Mr. Shine Ted Lin. Okay. From UITM, uh, let me call Muhammad Ad Aidil bin Ali. Mr. Sufyan Kirdaus Benazi. Thank you. From Katin University, Malaysia, Mr. Yap Yan Wei. I'm sorry, Ms. Yap Yan Wei. Multimedia University, MMU, Ms. Koh Bausi. The one and only from Borneo, University Malaysia Sabah, Ms. Siti Zubaydah Binti Fatwan. Hello, Mr. Juju. Eh? <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Jara. Now, it is time for the long-awaited moment, the announcement of the five finalists for MLC 2019. Uh, with that, I would like to request Yang Berbahagia Professor Madya Dr. Zamuli bin Jamaluddin to be on stage for the certificate giving ceremony. Now, I would like to request Yang... Yeah. 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 Okay, it's okay. Okay, did it. <laughs> Without further ado, I would like to invite Yang Berusaha Professor Dr. Cik Husna Bintia Hazari. and a very good evening to everyone. All right. I must congratulate everyone for being very brave and very courageous, for waiting till the very end with flattering hearts and <laughs> making a lot of dua, right? Yeah. Inshallah, some all the dua will be accepted. It is impossible for everyone to win. But I think the experience of experience of being here is has been a very valuable one. Believe me, it's not possible for all 20 participants to win, 
somebody must uh, be in the final five, all right? But I do want to see all the winners because you'll be very upset and say, oh, it's easy for Prof to say that, but yeah. Winners in a sense that everybody um, obtain experience, valuable experience. And so the very uh, end session, I want to share some valuable advice and tips, if you will, not just from me, but from all the judges on how we think that we should improve uh, your performance. So that, unfortunately, you'll, have, you'll be making our work if should we be the judges again next year, even more difficult. <laughs> it was impossibly difficult for us. And uh, alhamdulillah, all 20 were superb. And uh, But in the final analysis, we have to choose five. All right, we have to choose five. And uh, finally, we agreed on five. Five, uh, these five uh, people in the end. But before that, uh, here are some of the tips. Um, we would like very much to see that um, uh, the participants carry out real research, not just um, something like um, literature survey or from somebody else's research. Do you know why it is important that it is from your own research? so that you can feel the passion. This is my research. I love it. I breathe it every day. I cry with it. I love with it. And you can see that from the five final participants, how the passion shone through their eyes. Well, I don't know whether you saw, but definitely we can see that. And you will agree with me. And when you make the presentations, it is very easy if you carry out your hair research, then you have concrete evidence to show. And when you are fielding questions, and believe me, when you are representing Malaysia, the most important one, of course you have to be articulate and all that, but really one of the outstanding, um, um, I think, points that have contributed to the winners, and we have quite few winners from Malaysia, is the content, the ability to field questions. So if your confidence, it is your research, you are able to field the questions. So that's very important, okay? Um, okay, and um, we would like you to pay real great heed to keeping the time. Unfortunately, um, you will, I think, um, uh, how shall I, be better off if you keep to the time. And when we say um, there is a penalty, there is a penalty. So be very, very diligent, be very, very aware of the penalty, all right? Okay, we won't say more on that because it might be very sensitive. Okay, finally, um, you know, in your excitement to present all your work, sometimes and you say, oh, I must not miss this. I have to put everything that I know on the slides. But when everything is on the slides, it can be very crowded and it can be very distracting. So we know that you have done a lot of work, but put whatever is only pertinent. All right, something that you want to explain. And when you put about 10 uh, micrographs there, then you don't know which one you should be focusing on. So be very brief, all right, be very spare, and only put up materials that you know um, is relevant to what you want to present. Then it is far more effective. So with that, I shall now make the announcement of the um, five uh, contestants that will be uh, joining um, the judges again, if we are the same judges, for the final MLC, which will be um, on the 14th, eh? The 30th. The 30th. Also here, also here. Aha, uh -huh, here again. All right. So, those who will definitely be here, you can make new badges. All right, we have got 15 days, I think. To go to, uh, I don't know, 26, Kampah Baju and all that. I don't know if that's relevant for the guys, but I think for the ladies, it's very relevant. So, and for you too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make the announcement. Top five finalists in no particular order, all right? Uh, the first one is Mr. Lam Jia Yong from UPM. I 
I thought I'll make the announcement and then invite him. But it's okay. It's okay. All right. In the excitement to present the certificates. All right. So, UPM. Dong Jia Chong from UPM. Okay, which faculty are you from? Oh, you must go back and tell your team. Okay. <laughs> the second one is Mr. Ng Kok Bin from UPM. Congratulations. Which faculty are you from? Theory of Science. All right, you must go and tell your dean as well. <laughs> Okay, the next one, Siti Hajar bin Zaid from UMK. You must uh, wear baju Melayu, songket or something since you come from Kelantan, okay? And the next one, Mr. Tang Yong Chi from UPM. So four has come on stage. Who will be the last one? Shall it be a he or a she? <laughs> well, it's a she. Miss City Zubaida has been part one. I think that this is the most excited of the all. Yes. Do you know why he's very excited? Because you are the clone of Dr. Zurina. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that, I say congratulations to everyone. I say congratulations to all my fellow judges. Thank you very much for bearing with me, my corny jokes and my quips. And uh, thank you very much for um, helping us to make a very, um, how shall I say, it? equitable uh, decision. And thank you to Prof. Essa for inviting us. Um, Dr. Jaria for all the hospitality and my best, best thanks to the Dean, of course, Dr. Zamri, always kind and smiling and um, very kind-hearted and last but not least to this handsome, dapper gentleman. <laughs> Thank you and we hope to see everyone. It doesn't matter if you don't win today, come and support those who win. So with that, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa